campaign fundraising. On Thursday, the committee held its second and last day of hearings for this week. The focus was on Indian gaming. Witnesses included George Skabine, director of the Indian Gaming Management staff, and Michael Anderson, deputy assistant secretary for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The proceedings are over five and a half hours. Good morning, a quorum being present. The Committee on Government Reform and Oversight uh, will come to order. Today we will continue the hearing we started yesterday regarding the Department of the Interior's decision to deny an application made by three Indian tribes in Wisconsin to take land in trust for gambling purposes. Our first panel today consists of George Scabine. Mr. Scabine, would you stand to be sworn, please? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth will help you, God? I do. Seated. On behalf of the committee, we welcome you here today, and you're recognized to make an opening statement. We'd like for you, if you can, to confine it to, to five minutes, and if you have more than that, we'll submit it for the record. Mr. Chairman, before they begin, I'd like to uh, say something. We have uh, in the audience Hilda Manuel, who's the Deputy Commissioner of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. She's Mr. Scabine's superior. She's the one who has actually had conversations with Secretary Babbitt, and it seems to me that we ought to have her testify as well. Uh, I, I know yesterday we suggested it, and there were a number of others that we also recommended, Republican office holders who opposed the project. The argument there was they opposed the project. This isn't about the project. This is about whether anything went on improperly in the decision within the Department of Interior. Hilda Manuel's deposition has been taken as part of the record, as has Mr. Scabine's. I think it would be appropriate if we give her an opportunity to uh, give us uh, her testimony and, and subject her to the questioning that all other witnesses have, uh, have encountered uh, as we search for the truth. Uh, Mr. Waxman, we will take that under advisement. However, this particular panel has been scheduled and uh, will proceed as we had planned. Well, yesterday we had a surprise witness uh, with five minutes notice. Uh, we could have this witness uh, testify we, as well. We have ruled on that. Mr. Scavine, you may make an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, distinguished member of the committee, my name is George Talchief Scavine. I was born 45 years ago near Paris, France, where I lived until approximately 1968. Both my parents were American citizens. I was born an American, and my mother is an Osage Indian from Fairfax, Oklahoma. I have a degree in economics from the University uh, of Chicago, a law degree from the University of Minnesota Law School. I am a member of the Bar of the District of Columbia and a member of the Minnesota State Bar. I have been a civil servant for tw some 20 years and served in various positions with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Office of the Solicitor's Division of Indian Affairs. I am neither a, neither a political appointee nor a politically connected lobbyist. I am here today to testify before the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight relating to its investigation into whether political contributions to the, to the Democratic National Committee influenced a decision of the Department of the Interior to refuse to place an off-reservation 55-acre parcel of land located in Hudson, Wisconsin, and known as the St. Croix Meadows Greyhound Track, or the Hudson Dock Track, in trust for gaming purposes. I want to thank you for inviting me to testify this morning and giving me the opportunity to clarify my role in the Dock Track matter. I was involved in reviewing the Hudson Dock Track casino application from the time I joined the Indian Gaming Management staff as its director in February 1995 through the signing of the final decision letter on July 14, 1995. Throughout this period, I participated in numerous discussions on the subject with civil servants in the BIA and the solicitor's office, as well as with secretarial appointees. To the best of my recollection, all of these discussions were entirely on the merits of the application. As I have told those who have deposed me in this matter, I was never contacted by the White House, the Democratic National Committee, or the Clinton-Gore campaign regard, regarding the dog track matter, nor was I aware of anyone else at the Department of the Interior being contacted by the White House 
the DNC or the Clinton-Gore campaign regarding this matter. I knew nothing and heard nothing during this period about any partisan political contributions given in the past or expected in the future having anything to do with this decision. As far as I know, the decision of the department regarding this proposal was made entirely on the merits. I have never had a conversation with Secretary Babbitt about this or any other matter. I strongly support Indian gaming as a legitimate economic development activity for Indian tribes. <clears throat> At off-reservation, Indian gaming proposals, part particularly those that involve partnering with non-Indians, must be more closely scrutinized under applicable legal standards. In the winter and spring of 1995, it was my job to make recommendations to my superiors at the department in such matters as the Hudson Dock Track. On June 29, 1995, I drafted a recommendation in the form of a proposed letter to the three applicant tribes informing them of the decision of the department not to exercise its discretionary authority pursuant to Section 5 of the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934 to take the Hudson Dock Track into trust. I made this recommendation based on the record before me, and that record indicated that this acquisition would be extremely controversial. The application was opposed by, for various reasons by the com Common Council of the City of Tr Hudson, by the Town of Troy, by the State Representative for Wisconsin's 30th Assembly District, by the United States Representative f uh, in whose district the Hudson Dog Track is located, by the Attorney General for the State of Wisconsin, and by numerous Indian tribes in both Wisconsin and Minnesota. Under these circumstances, I could not, in good conscience, recommend it to the decision makers that it was the time and the place to exercise the Secretary's discretionary authority, especially since there is no affirmative trust duty under the IRA to take off-reservation land in trust, and the Secretary has unfettered discretion to say no. I was not pressured in any way by anyone to reach a particular recommendation in this matter. You may choose to question the wisdom of my professional judgment in this matter, and reasonable people may disagree on the merits of my recommendation. However, <clears throat> it was made solely on the merits. Throughout this investigation, I have always tried to tell the truth as I know it. I am a civil servant of two decades standing, who was chosen a career in public service because I believe it is a high calling. My integrity, honesty, and good faith have never before been challenged. While in certain respects I regret being cast in the middle of this controversy, I understand and deeply respect the role of Congress, oversight responsibility in making sure that decisions delegated from the legislative, le legislature to the executive are made according to standards established in legislation and not for improper, improper political motives. In my 20 years of service, I have worked equally well with both Republican and Democratic administrations, and I have taken pride in remaining nonpartisan on the job, that my recommendations could be made with a degree of professionalism expected of a nonpolitical civil servant. This matter has placed incredible demands on me personally and professionally. I am very eager to put it behind me and resume devoting my full attention to my responsibilities in carrying out the important work of the department. Accompanying me today is Mr. Tim Elliott, Deputy Associate Solicitor for the Division of General Law at the Department of the Interior. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scabine. Uh, we will now recognize the Mr. Chief Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I'm, I am uh, Tim Elliott, and I uh, also have a statement I would like to make if it's permissible. And what is your position, Mr. Early? I'm, I'm uh, an attorney with the Department of the Interior and accompanying Mr. Scabine at this hearing. Uh, it's, it's not uh, regular for uh, those other than the witnesses to, uh, to uh, testify. Uh, you weren't called to testify, were you? No, sir. Uh, are you here as his legal counsel? Yes, sir. Well, you can serve in that capacity, but as far as you making an opening statement, it's not necessary. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. Scabine, we appreciate you being here and will now yield to Mr. Bennett there for 30 minutes. Good morning, Mr. Scabine. Good morning. S sir, you have been with the Department of the Interior for 20 years, is that correct? 
Yes. And when did you, actually, I think February the 5th, 1995, was your first day on the job as director of the gaming office. Is that correct? That is correct. And three days after arriving on the job, you attended a meeting at the, at, with the congressional delegation of the Minnesota delegation. Is that correct? That is correct. Had you ever, during your 20-year career with the Department of the Interior, attended a meeting of a congressional delegation? Not that I can recall. Were you aware that Mr. Patrick O'Connor, who will be called to testify before this committee next week, were you aware that Mr. O'Connor had, in fact, uh, organized that meeting? No, I was not. You met Mr. O'Connor at that meeting, didn't you, sir? Could you pull the microphone here, please? You, in fact, met Mr. O'Connor at that meeting, isn't that correct? Um, not to my knowledge. Could, do you recall who was there? Uh, yes, I think in my um, deposition, I um, recalled who was there based on, um, and if I can turn to some... Uh, Go right ahead, sir. Huh? Go right ahead if you'd like, and if, while we're waiting, if I could have exhibit uh, 297B placed on the screen here in the hearing room. While you're looking, Mr. Skabeen, um, this exhibit reflects a meeting having been set up and scheduled by Mr. Patrick O'Connor, an attorney and lobbyist for the Minnesota Indian Tribe, which opposed the casino application of the Chippewa Indians and it's on the screen there before you. Can you see it, sir? I believe there's a TV set right there on the... Uh, I think my eyes are failing here. Uh, we'll try to increase the size of the print. Okay. There's even a reference in that memorandum uh, to who the important Washington players are that need to be contacted. Do you see that on the uh, exhibit? Um, okay, I'm handed a document. That, that is the exhibit that's on the screen and now is in your hands, sir, 297B. Okay. okay, I have it. If you would refer to that exhibit, it references this February 8, 1995 meeting, your third day on the job. And if you'll note there, about four lines from the bottom, there is reference to important Washington players who need to be contacted. Do you see that there, Mr. Scubin? No. Um, okay. Yes. Okay, I do. Yes. And do you recall who some of those important Washington players were? Um, what I do have, uh, it was sent to me from a Waylon Peterson, or Peterson in um, Rep Representative Oberstar's office, is a list of the people who were attending the meeting of February 8th in uh, Congressman Oberstar's office. And how many people were in attendance there, sir? Okay, on this list that was sent to me, uh, First of all, who advised you that there was going to be this meeting, by the way? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm who advised you on your third day in office that there was going to be this meeting with the Minnesota delegation? I was um, called by um, someone in the secretary's office. Mr. John Duffy? No, maybe uh, probably a secretary uh, or his assistant and asked to come up and accompany him uh, to that meeting. Was there any explanation as to why you were meeting with a Minnesota delegation in connection with a Wisconsin casino application? Uh, no, there wasn't. All right. uh, go ahead, if you will, try to re recollect who was at that All meeting. Right. There if you are can. 20 people who are listed here, and if you want, I can read this. Go right ahead, sir, if you All will, right. quickly, please. Now, this recollection is based on a um, memorandum sent by Will and Peterson to me. I understand, sir. Okay, not, understand. not necessarily my own recollection. Okay. I understand. All right, would be Representative Jim Oberstar, Representative Bruce Vento, Representative David Minge, uh, or Minge, Minge, um, Senator Paul Wellstone, Representative Bill Luther, uh, MIGA Chairman Myron Ellis, Frank Ducheneau, Melanie Benjamin, Pat Johnson, John McCarthy, Stan Crooks, Ginny Boylan, Bobby Whitefeather, Louis Taylor, Larry Keto, Waylon. Uh, Peterson, James McKinney, John Schaeffler, Mike Epstein, and Kurt Blue Dog. Were there any um, representatives from Hudson, Wisconsin there, sir? Uh, none, that I, none, none that I can see. Were there any representatives of the Chippewa Indian tribe which had applied for the casino? No. Uh, do you know whether there was any discussion, not about the economic impact upon Minnesota tribes, or the economics of the application, was there any discussion about detriment to the community, detriment to Hudson, Wisconsin? Uh, yes, I think there was. And do you have any notes to reflect that conversation? Uh, no, but I think that um, Lewis Taylor, the um, chairman of the St. Croix Chippewa tribe, was there, 
and I think he was addressing, he was there for the purpose of addressing detriment to the St. Croix tribe, which is a Wisconsin tribe. Detriment to his tribe. That's right. De detriment to his economic interest. Well, detriment to his tribe. Yes, it would cost his tribe money if the other tribe got the casino approved. Isn't that what he was there for, sir? Well, I, th I think he was there to, um, to say that there would be detrimental impacts on his tribe in general. Did you ever notify the, uh, the Chippewa Indians of, uh, who had applied for the casino, did you ever notify them of this meeting? Uh, we did, eventually. Eventually. Yes, Six sir. weeks later, isn't that correct? That is correct. Have you read the opinion of Judge Barbara Crabb of the federal court in Wisconsin with respect to that six weeks delay, sir? Uh, I probably read at some point uh, a few years ago. I don't recall it right now. In fact, uh, there was, I think, if we can have Exhibit 302 from yesterday's hearing placed on the projection screen. That, in fact, was a letter from John J. Duffy on March 27, 1995 reflecting that there was at least a six weeks delay prior to even notifying the Chippewa Indians of this meeting. What was the reason for that delay, Mr. Scavine? Well, <clears throat> from my perspective, when I came to the um, gaming office, uh, I was very new at the job, and um, it took me several weeks in February, practically the whole month probably, to uh, just lo learn the ropes and learn the office and how things were supposed to be done and, and essentially catching up on everything, that, on, on all the matters that were um, pressing at the time. Um, <clears throat> I was also involved in um, another project which took a lot of uh, time away from the office for me, which I was a negotiator in a negotiated rulemaking uh, on the Indian Self-Determination Act, uh, which uh, with um, uh, the department, the department of HHS, and uh, 48 tribal representatives, which took a lot of time from me. And um, I think that essentially, I, when I um, got around to to realizing that we needed to um, to set a deadline and to um, um, to send this out, uh, you know, with the red tape and all, it's it came out in on. Um, what's the date? March? March 27th. In fact, that wasn't even a letter from you. That's from Mr. John Duffy. Uh, highlighting the fact that uh, I think Mr. Ackley, who testified yesterday, had confronted him about this meeting. Uh, do you have any correspondence reflecting that you, sir, ever wrote to the three tribes advising them of this February 8th meeting? Well, I think I wrote the letter for... Uh, you drafted Duffy. it for Mr. Duffy? Right. Uh, it, Mr. Scubin, you're aware, are you not, of the civil litigation, obviously, in the federal court in Wisconsin and the opinions by Judge Barbara Crabb with respect to uh, political influence in the decision-making process in this case? I am. Just a minute. Just a minute, counsel. I'm aware of the litigation, um, but I cannot really talk about the, uh, the opinions. Let me put, if I can, up on the projection screen uh, uh, two quotes from her, one quote, and I'll lead in with another, just to highlight your recollection on this point, sir, if I can. Judge Crabb has said in an earlier portion of the opinion, I believe, and this Judge Crabb uh, is a respected jurist from Wisconsin appointed by President Carter to her position, Mr. Scabine. Uh, she states in the opinion, I believe there is a distinct possibility that improper political influence affected this application. And then the quote that's there on the television screen here in the hearing room, there is considerable evidence that suggests that improper political pressure may have influenced agency decision making. Would you agree with Judge Crabb that improper political influence may have been involved in this matter, Mr. Scubin? Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Would you agree with Judge Crabb that improper political influence may have been involved in this matter? Um, no, I have no knowledge of that. Well, in fact, Mr. Skabeen, uh, according to testimony we've heard here uh, yesterday, as well as some affidavits I'll place on the projection screen, uh, you yourself have previously made comments about the political influence uh, killing this application, haven't you? I don't think so. Directing your attention, sir, to a meeting in Wisconsin uh, with the La Coudre at the La Coudre Indian Reservation on December 3, 1996. Do you recall being asked at that meeting, first of all, did you attend that meeting, Mr. Scabine? Yes, I did. And do you recall being asked at that meeting why the Department of the Interior 
did not approve the application for casino gambling at the Hudson Dog Track facility? No, I do not. And do you know whether or not you were asked why? I, don't, I do not recall being asked that question. Would it surprise you to know that there are people who were present there who have testified? Mr. Havanek testified yesterday. Uh, Mr. Chairman Ar Armin Ackley of the Mole Lake Band testified specifically that you made comments in, uh, about politics in Washington uh, causing the rejection of the Chippewa application? Yes, it would surprise me. Do you I know that those comments were made yesterday, sir? Do I know whether this comment? Yes, I do. Uh, did you watch the proceedings yesterday on C-SPAN? Uh, I watched some of it. Uh, I think we got preempted on television a little bit yesterday on some other matters, but uh, in case you watched on C-SPAN, what is your response to Chairman Ackley and to Mr. Havanek? And in fairness to you, sir, let me place up on the projection screen the three affidavits, and I've recently this morning there are additional affidavits, but, but just initially the affidavits of, first of all, Mr. Fred Havanek, owner of the dog track. These are exhibits council 354-1, 2, and 3. And there are three other affidavits that are being marked and will be placed in the record. So you understand the, the, the framework of the question, Mr. Skabeen. The affidavits of Fred Havanek, the owner of the dog track, uh, Marianne Polar, a treasurer of one unsuccessful tribe, and Mr. Peter Liptak, another tribal official, all of these people have submitted sworn affidavits to this committee, essentially saying that you made comments to the effect that your staff had approved the application of the Chippewa Indians, but that when it got to Washington, I think all three of them refer to, quote, politics took over, end of quote, and the application was rejected. In light of those affidavits, sir, are you prepared to say that you did not make those comments? Yes. Um, let me so those affidavits would be false, is that well, correct, Mr. Skabeen? Let me put this in context. We were contacted by the Lacoudere tribe to come to Wisconsin <clears throat> to um, discuss with them the problems that the Wisconsin tribes had with their up the upcoming renegotiation of their Class three gaming compacts with the state of Wisconsin. And we agreed to come there to make a presentation about compact negotiation. At the same time, the tribes asked us to come and discuss with them, the three tribes, either day before, to discuss with them uh, and give them technical advice on placing land in trust in general. We clarified to them uh, that we could not and would not discuss the, Hudson, the, the litigation involving the Hudson Dock Track at this meeting. Uh, that our attorneys had uh, advised us that we would, we would be unable to go up to Wisconsin to discuss the Hudson Dock Track matter it, since it was in litigation. We made it absolutely clear to, um, to the Lacoudre tribe that this was not going to happen, and they told, uh, told us that they would inform um, the other two tribes there that the litigation and whatever happened during the litigation, the Hudson Dock Track would not be discussed. Uh, now, when we got there, uh, and I, I was there um, uh, with, it was myself, uh, Paula Hart of my staff on the Indian gaming staff, Nancy Perscala, a, uh, another staffer on the, on the gaming staff, um, um, Troy Woodward, an attorney in the solicitor's office who came to handle, ha to ask, uh, to handle legal questions and also to make sure that we did not stray into discussing the uh, Hudson Dock Track litigation as well as uh, Tim LaPointe was there, is the gaming coordinator, coordinator with the um, Minneapolis area office, and Robin Jager, uh, superintendent of the Great Lakes Agency, and I think another BIA employee. Now, Sir, I don't mean to cut you off. I only have so much time to answer questions, and I'm just ask questions. And I'm just trying to ask you, apart from what the meeting was supposed to be about, we have sworn testimony before this committee, in addition to three affidavits, people flat out under oath saying that you made reference the political pressure in Washington. And I'm asking you, sir, if you deny ever saying that. Yes, I tossed and turned most of the night last night trying to think of what I could have said at this meeting to, so that it would be misconstrued. So five different people, four different people? But, yes, uh, as to what I, I may have said that could have led them to um, uh, make that statement. And, and I don't want to accuse here anyone of lying. It's, it's, it's not... I'm not either, sir. Huh? I'm not either. Right. So I'm not going to say that, that these affidavits uh, are, are lies. I'm going to say that they essentially, they, uh, as far as I can see, they, they must have misconstrued or misunderstood 
uh, something that I was saying. And I was trying to see, see if, and recollect uh, in our conversation what it is that we discussed. And I can tell you what we discussed if you want. Well, I don't need to go into all the details. My point was you deny, you, you basically disagree with their contention. That's correct. Okay. Mr. Let me let me show Mr. you an... Mr. Sir. Bennett, let me, let me just say, Mr. Scabine, we want to make be as fair to you as possible. But we want to make sure that you understand the gravity of the questions that are being presented to you. We have six people who are at that meeting, six, who are saying under oath, three of them under oath, the other three in a sworn affidavit, that you said that political pressure from above was brought to bear upon your decision that it had been approved at the lower levels. Now, I want to make sure that you understand the gravity of the question and the gravity of your answer. You're saying you did not say anything like that. That's correct. Thank you. Mr. Scabine. Chairman, Mr. Bennett, yes. we have declarations from the other Interior Department employees who were at that meeting uh, made an under penalty of perjury as we do in the civil, uh, federal rules of civil procedure Certainly. that indeed no statement like that was made at that meeting and as far as i'm concerned counsel you should seek to introduce those into the record mr chairman i recommend that they be admitted into the record without objection mr scabine uh with mr. respect chairman, may we have copies yes uh, if you would sum, uh, submit those we'll give uh, copies to the other members and, and Mr. copies of those uh, we get a staff member down there to do that mr chairman in, in, in light of some of that time if i can have an additional few minutes perhaps in light of some of this delay we'll, we'll make well, sure wait, 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 i reserve uh, an objection to that well, on what basis is he going to get more time no, we're not going to give any more time than the 30 minutes mr waxman we'll be here all day if we have to day. just relax mr scabine sir i place uh, if, if i can I'll put up on the exhibit screen Exhibit 320. No, but let me don't put that up yet. Let me just ask one question, Mr. Scabine. Your, your prepared statement that you read this morning noted that uh, you became the gaming management staff director February of 1995 and were involved throughout the, the signing of the final decision letter on July 14, 1995. Yeah. And then I believe your statement from which I'm reading, and, and I think you read earlier, you say, I knew nothing and heard nothing during this period about any partisan political contributions given in the past or expected in the future. And then you say, as far as I know, the decision of the department regarding this proposal was made entirely on the merits. I gather, sir, then, that from February of 95 up until July 14, 1995, that's the period about which, to which you were referring when you made your opening statement. Is that correct, sir? That is correct. And there was no, as far as you were concerned, during that period, there was no politics involved? Not to my knowledge. Let me show you Exhibit 321. on the screen here in the hearing room. According to these records produced by the Department of the Interior, Mr. Scabine, this is an email communication authored by you to members of your staff dated June 30, 1995. And if you will note there, sir, your email communication from you to members of your staff says, even if the town of Hudson and the town of Troy embrace the proposal, we may still not change our position because, and it says F.O., and I assume it was meant to be of, it's a typographical error, because of, quote, political opposition on the Hill largely generated by the Minnesota and Wisconsin tribes who oppose this acquisition. In light of reviewing your own email in late June of 1995, Mr. Scabine, is it still your position before this committee today that political opposition and political pressure had no place in the decision-making process with respect to this application? Um, pull the microphone a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. I think that the opposition of um, the um, uh, congressman uh, and um, uh, and congressional delegations uh, was a factor that can be considered in denying an application under Section 465. Uh, it's certainly something that um, that uh, we can um, we can rely on in making that this determination. That doesn't mean, in my, that it, there was political pressure exerted as long as they have a reasonable basis for their, uh, recommend, for their recommendation. 
And the political opposition of the Minnesota tribes, sir, would be based on what other than their own economic self-interest? Mr. Bennett, you're going to have to define politics for this witness. I'm not sure if I can, Mr. Elliott. Well, you That's a very big question. question. Yeah, well, I, I think I'll ask the questions, and I don't intend to respond to you, sir, with all due respect, trying to define politics. This, Mr. Scabine, so you understand the setting here, sir. I'm, I'm, we're not here accusing you of any impropriety. The, the question here is a matter of whether politics came to bear in this decision. We, we have noted affidavits from people that say you talked about it openly, were very candid about it in December of 1996. You're now submitting affidavits from people who say they were at the meeting and you didn't make that comment. There's now an electronic mail communication from you, sir, to your staff during the time period about what you just spoke a few minutes ago in your opening statement where you're clearly talking about politics and political opposition. And I'm trying to clarify, it's still your position that politics didn't come to play with respect to the rejection of this casino. No, I, I think that maybe I'm, I uh, misspoke on the, on the email. What I meant is the opposition of the Minnesota and Wisconsin tribes uh, based on their opposition to the uh, Hudson Casino. Mr. Scabine, let's move on to another point if we can. With respect to the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act and its application, there essentially are two standards that were discussed and can be discussed in more detail, I imagine, later. Uh, two standards that have to be addressed. Isn't that correct? Whether it's in the best interest of the tribe applying for the casino and whether there is detriment to the surrounding community. Isn't that correct? Under Section 20 of the Indian Gaming, Gaming Regulatory Act, if uh, the uh, off-reservation acquisition is subject to the two-part determination of Section 20, yeah, then yes, this is a, there's a two-pronged test re uh, regarding this. And looking at Exhibit 328, which in fact is the rejection letter signed by Michael Anderson of your staff on July 14, 1995, uh, that makes reference not only to the discretion of the Secretary of the Interior, Mr. Bruce Babbitt, uh, but also makes reference to that particular act. Doesn't, sir, if you want to take a yes, second to look at that? Yeah. Can I correct something? Mr. Yes. Anderson, Mr. Anderson is not on my staff. I'm sorry, sir. What Mr. is Mr. Anderson's position? I think he, he's the Deputy Assistant Secretary right. for Indian Affairs. I didn't mean to give you a promotion. Go, go right ahead. Uh, in, in light of, uh, in, in light of that, reviewing that letter, essentially it makes reference to applying that act and those standards to the denial and the rejection of the casino application, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And in fact, uh, uh, with respect to uh, that application, uh, Mr. Scabine, I think Secretary Babbitt in his opening statement uh, before the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee uh, has made the following comment, if this can be up on the uh, projection screen. The I don't think it's on the screen, but let me just quote it for you. It's the department based this decision solely on the criteria. I think B B Secretary Babbitt's exact comment is the department based its decision solely on the criteria set forth in Section 20 of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. In fact, that is not really accurate, is it, sir? And in light of the deposition you gave, that's not a correct statement, was it, Mr. Scabine? Mm -hmm. um, that is, that's, that's true, that's inaccurate. And, and why was that statement by Secretary Babbitt, which he made before the Senate, inaccurate? Uh, it is inaccurate because uh, the ground for refusing to take the land into trust is a dis decision not to exercise the discretionary authority of the Secretary to take land into trust pursuant to Section 5 of the Indian Reorganization Act, 25 U.S.C. 465. In, in fact, Mr. Scabine, with respect to the chronology of these events, you are aware, are you not, that the offices in Ashland, Wisconsin, as well as the Minneapolis, Minnesota office had approved this application. Isn't that correct? No. They had uh, made recommendations. They made recommendations. They hadn't, excuse me, sir, they had not rejected the application. Isn't that correct? That's correct. They had not found any detriment to the surrounding community. That is correct. If I can uh, ask, if you, you said that you had no knowledge of any involvement uh, of the White House with respect to uh, the rejection of this application. Was that your testimony, sir? Yes, it is. Uh, if I can have Exhibit 317 placed on the screen, please. And it, the, the exhibit's there before you, Mr. Elliott. Looking at Exhibit 317, uh, Mr. Scabine, that is, in fact, 
a memorandum to Ms. Jennifer O'Connor for Mr. David Myers. Do you know Mr. Myers, Mr. Scabine? No, I do not. Have you ever met him? No, I have not. Uh, it re this is from the, the White House, and it reflects that m Mr. Myers spoke with Heather Sibiston regarding the status of the dog track application. And this uh, memorandum is dated June 6, 1995. Who is Heather Sibison? Heather Sibison is a special assistant in the office of the secretary. And works for the Department of the Interior? Yes, she does. Do you know why Ms. Sibison would be talking to people at the White House about this application? No, I do not. Uh, can you imagine any circumstances under which she would want to be talking to the the uh, White House and advising them of the status of a matter such as this? You would have to ask her. You yourself could not provide any justification for that, could you, sir? Excuse me? Yeah, I say you yourself could not provide any justification for that. You weren't on the phone talking to the White House, were you? I was not. Let me show you, if I can, sir, in terms of uh, the chronology here, to move through with my time, Exhibit 317A. which was the, this is in fact a draft memorandum prepared by Tom Hartman. Mr. Hartman is on your staff, correct? And Mr. Hartman was on my staff. And where is Mr. Hartman now assigned? He's assigned in the Indian Gaming Management staff, but I no longer work there. And basically in that draft memorandum, uh, June 8, 1995, Mr. Hartman notes uh, that uh, he recommends, and, and look at the language if you want, sir, it's on the screen and it's before you, that the secretary, Secretary Babbitt, based on the following, determined that the proposed acquisition would not be detrimental to the surrounding community. Do you see that language there, sir? Yes, can I make one comment? Go right ahead, sir. For, uh, for future reference, uh, those TVs on the, on the table are, either my eyesight is absolutely horrendous or they're totally unacceptable in terms of being able to see what's there. <laughs> so noted, Mr. Yeah, Scamine. I apologize to you, sir. Um, Mr. Elliott has given me the documents. Do, do you okay. not have the documents before you? Yes, I do. Okay, well, yes, refer to them then if you can't read yes. it on the screen. And in, in fact, uh, it's quite clear, is it not, uh, that in that draft there is a direct recommendation by a member of the staff that uh, the secretary must determine that the proposed acquisition would not be detrimental to the surrounding community. Isn't that correct? That's, That's the language there, isn't it? That's correct. And are you aware of the facts, sir? And I understand that you haven't read all the legal documents in the court challenge in Wisconsin, but Judge Crabb, uh, the judge in the civil case, has even commented upon the complete turnaround in the position of the Department of the Interior from the date of that memorandum, uh, June 8, 1995, to the ultimate rejection. Uh, are you aware she's talked about that turnaround, sir? Uh, no, I have no recollection of, of that. Let me show you, if I can, a series of uh, email communications uh, from your office. Uh, let's look first at Exhibit 322. Which is, I think, an email communication, sir, to you uh, from Heather Sibison. Uh, the, the same individual who had been in contact with the White House. Has Mr. L.A. been able to find that exhibit yet to put it before you? Yes, I have it before me now. And it, with respect to exhibit 322 uh, placed before you, do you see, I note that she makes reference to not including in the rationale the opposition of the opposing tribes, noting that regardless of what happens, the Minnesota tribes will still be against it. She also makes reference to the uneasiness of Mr. Collier. Who is Mr. Collier, sir? Uh, Mr. Collier was uh, Secretary Babbitt's chief of staff. And she makes reference to some tribes getting all the goodies at the expense of the other tribes. Do you see that language there? Yes. Uh, I also note that she made a comment. I'd like to get your reaction to this, sir, as a career uh, Department of Interior employee. Uh, theoretically, she says in her email, theoretically, they should all have equal opportunities. Do you believe that the matter of the tribes having equal opportunities is just theoretical, Mr. Scabine? I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, I'm not sure if I understand what she meant by theoretical. That's why I'm asking you. 
she's talking about the raw opposition of the Minnesota tribes, and she says, theoretically, they should all be treated equally. And I'm asking what your reaction is to that email from a member of your staff to you about whether it's theoretical that they should all be given e equal opportunity. Um, first, Ms. Sibison is not on my staff. All right, sir, I'm, I'm sorry. Ms. Sibison from the Department of the Interior, do right. you believe the question, sir, is not where she is on right, your no, staff? I just want to make sure that... Okay, fine. My question to you, sir, is okay. noting that language, do you believe it's theoretical that the Indian tribes should all be treated equally? Um, you know, I don't know what she meant by that or what Mr. Collier meant by that, and I, I don't really want to speculate on that. Um, and referring back to your uh, email uh, in June also, the matter of political opposition on the Hill, uh, I gather that you don't deem that it's theoretical with respect to that type of opposition. With respect to I mean, my point is, was that your comment back to her, that your email communication with respect to political opposition, opposition didn't address the matter of whether it's theoretical that they should be given equal opportunity. No, I think what I said in my email is that for purposes of the dra my draft letter, I wanted to keep in there uh, in refusing to take the land into trust under, to exercise the discretion under 465, to keep in there the uh, political, the opposition of the Minnesota tribes and uh, and, and well, we're not, we're not, we don't have listed the Minnesota delegation and their reasons, but that that is a factor that was that I certainly considered. Uh, what is she? What she's saying here is that she disagrees with me, and uh, she says that in fact, um, uh, if it is, um, if the uh, three tribes came back with stellar support from their local towns and congressmen, uh, the secretary's office would look at, uh, may look at, might look at the proposition in new light. Mr. Skibin, let me show you. I'm running out of time here, sir. I'm not trying to cut your answer short, but if I can have Exhibit 323 up on the screen, please. That's an email communication to you from Mr. Kevin Meisner. Again, I don't know if he's on your staff, but he's with the Department of the Interior. That email notes to you, sir, that bald objections of surrounding communities, including Indian tribes, are not enough evidence of detriment to the surrounding community. You see that there, sir? Yes, I do. Let me ask you this in, in concluding, because my time is up, uh, Mr. Skabeen. At any point in time, does your file reflect you contacting, you as the director of this office, contacting these Indian tribes which had applied for the casino and advising them of any problems, giving them an opportunity to cure any defects? Is there any letter from you, anything that would have given the Chippewa Indians an opportunity to cure any defects in their application? Um, I think that we, um, we uh, on March 27th, we um, sent um, the tribes a letter advising them of the extension of the comment period. Uh, we had um, several meetings uh, with the tribes and uh, uh, with uh, Mr. Havnick and uh, Mr. Moody and Mr. Eckstein uh, <clears throat> and uh, numerous uh, telephonic conversations with tribal staff where the uh, problems that we had with uh, the applications were communicated to them. The uh, file uh, that was uh, generated, or the record that was generated on the um, extended comment period was submitted to the three tribes, and I believe in the record they submitted uh, comment, their comments uh, following review of the documentation. Mr. Chairman, I believe I'm out of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Waxman, you're recognized for 30 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I want to yield to Mr. Cummings uh, three minutes of my time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Waxman. Um, thank you, Mr. Skabeen, for appearing before this committee uh, this morning. Good morning. I represent an area of Maryland that is close to where you live. And I'm also the ranking member of the Civil Service Subcommittee and a member that represents thousands of federal employees like yourself that have dedicated their lives to serving the American public. I read your deposition and there are parts of it that trouble me deeply. I am not troubled by your answers because I truly believe that you answered truthfully. I am troubled by the way you were interrogated, interrogated for more than seven hours. That's a long time. It should be noted that your deposition before the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee took slightly less than two hours. In this committee's deposition, you were questioned for nearly seven hours without regular breaks. That's like a full-time job. And the deposition was continued to the following day. The American public should know and my colleagues should know that this man is a diabetic, a condition that requires that Mr. Cabine eat 
at regular intervals. I've often said we have one life to live and this is no dress rehearsal and this is the life. He was not able to do that to, to address his medical needs during that seven hour deposition. During Mr. Skabeen's deposition, he was accused of taking orders on how to rule on this application by one of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle and, of, and, of being, and was accused of being undemocratic. Undemocratic. For that, Mr. Skabeen, I am truly sorry. I think it is admirable that you joined the Department of Interior more than 20 years ago because you were interested in Indian affairs and because of your Indian heritage and you thought you could serve your country, serve your people, and do it with integrity and dignity. Throughout your 20-year career, this is the first and only time, either publicly or privately, that your integrity in applying the law and in performing your duties as a career servant has been challenged. I believe that you made your decision because you felt under the law and under the facts presented that it was right. I thank you again and I yield back my time to back the time to Mr. Waxman. Thank you very much, Mr. Cummings. Um, Mr. Uh, Skabeen, I'm going to play. Good morning. The Good morning. Thank you for being here. I'm going to play the role that the Mr. Bennett, the council, uh, played on the other side just to get some of the facts on the record. But I'm also an elected member of Congress and a member of this committee, and I want to get to the, to the truth of the matter. That's seems to me that our only objective, it shouldn't be to badger you, it shouldn't be to try to pressure you to say something that uh, is not accurate. Uh, you've been with the Department of Interior since what year? Um, 1977. And uh, you've been involved in Indian issues for much of that time, is that correct? Yeah, for all of it. Uh, and uh, you've been with the Department for a little uh, more than uh, 20 years total, when we look at uh, coming in 1977. You've served, therefore, under both Democrats and Republicans. You're a career uh, civil servant. You weren't appointed by any uh, political uh, appointee, were you? No, I was not. Okay. Uh, is it correct to say that during your career you've attempted to improve the condition of the American Indian people? Yes, that's part of the mission of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. You were at the center of the uh, Interior Department's consideration of the uh, application uh, by these uh, three tribes with, with Mr. Havenick for the uh, Department of the Interior to take them on as a federal, uh, uh, under federal aegis so that they could open up a, a Las Vegas casino. That's correct. Okay. In fact, you were the career civil servant at the Bureau of Indian Affairs responsible for making the final staff recommendation on this matter. That is correct. Um, yes, in the Indian Gaming Office. Okay. You, were, uh, you also supervised the career staff at the central office who reviewed the application. That's correct. So if anyone is in a position to know of improper political influence, it's you. If there was imp improper political influence born to bear on the Indian Gaming Office, yes. Okay, and your judgment was this decision made on the merits and only on the merits? The, my judgment is that my recommendation was made on the merits. Okay. Um, was the decision to deny the application based on the recommendations of career staff, including yourself? The, I uh, wrote uh, the, um, my recommendation on June 29, 1995, and it was the uh, blueprint or the basis that was used uh, for the final decision issued July 14, 1995. Now, I asked the chairman of this committee to allow Hilda Manuel, sitting behind you, to testify. Is she your superior? She was my supervisor uh, when I was in the, the director of the Indian Gaming Office, yes. Now, her deposition was taken, and it's now part of the record so people can read it. But had she been allowed to testify, she would have said that she had been in the department since uh, 1991 when Secretary Lujan was the... Uh, uh, head of the Department of Interior, and she was not aware of any political contributions by the tribes opposed to the casino, and that she talked to Secretary Babbitt, and Secretary Babbitt did not take a position on the issue and did not want to be briefed on it. He said it was my responsibility, is the quote from um, Hilda Manuel, and the recommendation to reject the application was made by career civil servants 
the decision was based on the record and she agreed with it i think it would have been helpful for us to have that testimony she's the only one you've never talked to secretary babbitt i assume i have not but she had and according to her testimony under oath she said secretary babbitt said you take care of it you're the ones in charge now that story contradicts with the message the republicans who run this committee want to get out it may be the truth but it's not the message they want out now we had fred havenick uh, here yesterday and he's been attacking the department of the interior for more than two years in an effort to overturn the hudson decision and develop his casino in all that time he never at least to my knowledge made any accusations about you but yesterday at our hearing he described a december 3 1995 meeting that he and several tribal officials had with you and other Interior Department officials at the uh, Lacoudere Reservation in Wisconsin. And according to Mr. Havenick, you said at that meeting that politics killed the application. I also understand that four tribal participants gave affidavits that say essentially the same thing. Now, Mr. Bennett asked you about it. I'd like to give you a chance to respond. Did you ever say at that meeting that politics kills the Politics killed the application? No, I don't recall saying that. Did you say in any other way that politics was responsible for the Interior Department's rejection of the Hudson application? No, I, what, and I'm, I'm not accusing uh, Mr. Havnick uh, of, of lying. The only thing, as I said to the chairman, is that he may have misconstrued something I said, and if that happened, then it, that's very sorry. Well, you're being very kind, but let's face something, and I'm not asking you to a question, but let's face the fact that Mr. Havenick and all the people that submitted affidavits that are contrary to your statement all had a financial interest in overturning this decision by the Department of Interior. Now, at the meeting with you uh, was uh, Troy Woodward, is that correct? That is correct. And was Tim LaPointe there? That's correct. And Paula Hart? That is correct. Robert Jager? Right. Nancy Perscala? Correct. Now, I have affidavits from these people. Robert Jager said, I, Robert Jager, under penalty of perjury, hereby declare the following to be true, the best of my knowledge and belief. I have read the affidavits dated January 16, 1998, executed by Arlen Ackley Sr., Dwayne Derrickson, Mary Ann Polar, and Peter Eric Liptock, collectively called the affidavits. The affidavits relate to this meeting on December 3. I attended the meeting with Diane Rosen until approximately 3 p.m. I do not recall a statement by George Scabine or any other attendee from the Department of the Interior to that effect that politics was responsible for rejection by the Department of the application of the three Chippewa tribes in Wisconsin to take land in Hudson, Wisconsin into trust for gaming purposes. Same statement by Paula Hart. I attended the meeting and uh, there was no statement by George Scabine or any other attendee from the Department of the Interior to the effect that politics was in any way responsible for rejection uh, by the Department of the Application. Same thing with Tim LaPointe. He said uh, there was no statement by George Cabine or any other attendee to the effect that the politics was in any way responsible for rejection of this application. And uh, Troy Woodward says the same thing. Uh, and Nancy Perscala says the same thing. Uh, we've made these already part of the record. Uh, this is what the chairman uh, put in to us a few minutes ago for unanimous consent request. These are people who are career civil servants. They were at that meeting, and they've all said, even though you've racked your brain trying to think, did you say something that was misconstrued, they were at that meeting, and they never heard you say what's now later being alleged that you said, as those people who are claiming it are trying to get the, de the decision overturned on the basis that there was some kind of political interference. Mr. Havenick made another allegation yesterday, never be heard before heard. And apparently he and his publicist or attorney or wh whoever handles his strategies kept quiet about it for two years during litigation on the Hudson Casino matter and during the entire course of the Senate's investigation. He said he talked with Terry McAuliffe after the decision had been made and Terry McAuliffe, not knowing that Mr. Havenick was behind the casino project, took credit for killing it. Did you ever discuss the Hudson application with Terry McAuliffe? I do not know Terry McAuliffe, sir. 
Did you ever discuss it with anyone acting on Mr. Mr. McAuliffe's behalf? Not that I know. Don Fowler, do you know him? Did you ever talk to him? No, I do not know him, nor have I talked to him. And uh, uh, did you talk to anybody from the Democratic National Committee or the Clinton-Gore 96 campaign on this issue? No, I have not. Do you have any reason to believe that Terry McAuliffe or any outside... Now, there's, there's political interference, and sometimes it's appropriate and sometimes not. I gather the delegation from Minnesota in the House of Representatives didn't like this uh, uh, request to have a casino a few 30 miles away, was it 30 miles, 50 miles away from uh, St. Paul uh, because they just thought it would interfere with their, uh, the, 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 the concerns of the local people. Uh, did they raise an issue with you? They'd raise this issue, yes. Now these are elected officials who are raising concerns about their constituents. That's correct. Is that unusual? That's not unusual at all, no. Do you consider that political interference? No, I think that, um, uh, in fact, since I've been in the gaming office after Hudson, uh, I think that when an issue, an Indian gaming issue ar uh, arises, and a, um, especially relating to plans by an Indian tribe to, get, to build a um, casino on uh, close to non-Indian communities uh, in general, the, uh, the local represent the U.S. representative in that district uh, will contact us to discuss this issue. Now, when you I think when, they, when we make judgments as to what's appropriate political interference and what's not, there's a line to be drawn because we represent our constituents. We represent the points of view that we want uh, people in the uh, government bureaucracy to to know about. But I have a a report from the Roll Call magazine, and the chairman of this committee was accused after having gotten the contribution from a medical school called Ross Medical School, and after having gotten his daughter into the school, uh, of uh, calling in the uh, head of the Department of, uh, I may be wrong about whether his daughter got into the school well, or the not. Well, the gentleman, Neil, uh, on it, since you referred to my daughter, my daughter is married. She's a pharmaceutical representative. She did not go to that medical school. Period. Yeah, then I'm mistaken. And no, and but I, 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 is totally on, my, on my time, Mr. Chairman, David Longenecker, the Clinton administration's assistant secretary for post-secondary education, said in an interview with Roll Call that he was summoned to a meeting with Burton and six other members of Congress last July 18. The meeting was called to discuss all medical schools in Dominica, but Longenecker said Ross University was the prime topic of conversation. Burton confirmed the six other members attended, but he didn't reveal their names. The meeting occurred six days after Ross's wife, Ann, contributed $1,000 to Burton's campaign, mm -hmm. according to the Federal Election Commission records. Ross had already contributed $1,000 to Burton's campaign in July 1995. <laughs> My point is this. If you want to make things look ugly, if you want to say things are wrong, that there's improper political uh, interference, you can say it. Now, the chairman disagrees, but uh, if, if he had been a member of the Clinton administration, using his influence in this kind of circumstances, we'd probably have a whole hearing on the matter, uh, even though Mr. Burton would argue that it was appropriate for him, and it may well be, to interfere in the decision that was being made by the Department of Education, not on anything that had to do with his constituents, but on some campaign contributors concerned about an application before the Department of Education. Mr. Scabine, your attorney made a statement about the poor treatment you received by this committee, and I, and I think we ought to give him an opportunity to make his uh, comments, and I want to uh, call on, uh, on your attorney who's sitting at the table uh, if, he, if he wishes to make a statement to this regard. Thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Waxman. I'll be brief. The attorney is not a witness, and the attorney will not make a comment. It's up to Mr. Scabine. You have not been sworn. You're not a witness before this committee. Mr. Chairman, yesterday Mr. Havenick's uh, lawyer was permitted to give testimony before the committee, and he was not sworn. Parliamentary inquiry. Parliamentary inquiry. Who's making the inquiry? Uh, a gentleman from Indiana is recognized. <laughs> I was in the chair when you left, and my understanding was is that 
uh, our precedent is, is that consuls can make supplementary statements, but to ask them direct questions and give them statements is going beyond where I think we were yesterday. One second. We'll check with our parliament. Well, perhaps I can resolve it by simply asking questions rather than having them give statements. Just one second. We'll check with our parliamentarian. We will not take away from your time, so relax. The, the rules of the House, according to our parliamentarian, do not allow direct questioning of uh, legal counsel. He's here to advise his client, and his client is to respond. Uh, when we had uh, David Wang before this committee, uh, the chairman allowed Mr. Wang's attorney to make a lengthy statement uh, about his uh, client's rights. What Mr. Uh, and we can look at the. You can. I refer you to the record on that uh, issue. And what if did I the did, lawyer if here? The gentleman making. If I did, I was in error. The rules of the House will be followed by this committee, forthwith. Well, it appears, Mr. Chairman, the rules are invoked when it's to our detriment, but they're uh, uh, ignored when they're to your advantage. Mr. Scabine, your attorney... Well, I'd like to make a parliamentary point and not take it from Mr. Waxman's time. Yesterday... The gentleman will state his parliamentary... It was not the Republicans who were asking the questions of the consul. It was Mr. Waxman, and I, if I was lenient, it was to his benefit. The rules of the House will be followed. <coughs> uh, as I uh, understand, uh, Mr. Elliott uh, wanted us to know that uh, he's practiced law since 1964. He's been a career civil servant with the Department of the Interior since 1974. Over the past two months, he accompanied current and former employees of the department to depositions in this and the Senate's investigation. And the Mr. Scabine testified voluntarily at his depositions, and he was fully prepared to do so here without a subpoena, despite the fact uh, that um, uh, uh, your resolution for this investigation states that the investigation is being conducted to look into political fundraising and possible violations of law. There's been a decided lack of interest in getting at the truth of finding whether there have, may have been violations of law, rather from the manner of examination of the witnesses, the majority staff, and at least one member of Congress questioned opponents as if their conclusions were predetermined. For example, Mr. Scabine testified for some four hours at his Senate deposition on these matters. Then he testified again for over seven hours before the staff of this committee. Time and again, his judgment and the recommendation he made was questioned. Once he stated the facts leading up to and involved in his recommendation, he was repeatedly asked why he did not do things differently. He was, in my view, according to his lawyer, badgered. But he continued to state he had exercised his best judgment. Despite representations, to uh, his lawyer that there was no intent to cover ground already covered in the Senate deposition. Staff repeatedly questioned him on matters covered before the Senate. Congressman Horn attended his deposition for the first seven hours. Regrettably, Mr. Horn impugned Mr. Scabine's integrity and made assertions about his testimony with no basis, in fact, for them. Mr. Scabine and I both resent the Congressman's statements. It's been my experience and the research I have done bears out that in the courts of this country, witnesses are provided copies of their prior testimony or depositions to use to prepare themselves for further testimony, yet we have had to beg and argue to the point of invoking principles of fundamental fairness to citizens of this country in our attempts to assure that the witnesses uh, were afforded this right in this investigation. It should boggle the mind of every member of this committee that individuals are treated this way. And finally, I attempted to have another member of the solicitor's office more knowledgeable than I about our litigation accompany uh, me to at least one deposition so as better to protect the position of the United States in our ongoing litigation. I intended to do so for witnesses who have filed affidavits in the litigation and will likely testify in the case. This was denied. I believe such added representation was appropriate, especially in light of representations by the staff that they had no intent to inquire about issues in litigation. I find it difficult to believe 
that the committee countenances a refusal to allow this added protection of a witness from potential uh, perjury. I trust it is the committee's intent to get at the truth rather than a predetermined result in this case. All of our witnesses today and next week are devoted to reiterating the truth as they have already related to the staff in their prior testimony. This according to Mr. Timothy Elliott. Uh, Mr. Skabeen, you're a career civil servant. You've given us your testimony that you use your best judgment. I apologize to you if you're telling the truth that you're going to be, have been badgered, and I expect you're going to have to prepare yourself to be badgered for quite a while today. Because as this committee has operated in the past, Republican members have badgered witnesses unless they say exactly what they want them to say. That's to me inappropriate. It's unfair. It's, it's, uh, it's not the way things should be done. I want uh, you to know that uh, if, uh, if, uh, your, um, if your integrity is being called into question, uh, you, you uh, appropriately should feel concerned about it. But you should accept that what goes on in this committee is politics. Maybe not in the decisions that you made, but in this committee, it's politics. Uh, your testimony, just so we understand it, it's very clear. You've said that as a public servant, you, uh, your integrity has never been called into question. Is that accurate? That is true. And um, your testimony further is that your decision was made on the merits without any political interference. Is that accurate? That's correct. Well, um, that's the point of this hearing. That's what we're all here to discuss. Yesterday, all the members on the other side, and some maybe on our side, said, whoa, I'm against gambling. This decision was absolutely right. But we think the decision was made for the wrong reasons. Yet they haven't been able to show it's for the wrong reasons, except for those who didn't like the decision. And that's what we're faced with. People who didn't like the decision now filing affidavits and making claims, sometimes quite late, because they didn't raise it earlier, about uh, uh, an alleged political interference uh, in this uh, decision making. Now I want to, um, in, the, in the time I have, yield to some of my colleagues, and I don't know how much I do have. May I inquire how much time I do have, Mr. Chairman? Eight minutes. Well, I have eight uh, minutes, and I do want to, uh, okay. I want to put something on the screen. This is an excerpt from your deposition, January 13, 1998. Representative Horn, isn't it a fact that no matter what question we raise, we're wasting our time because you were given an order as to how to come out on this? And your answer, that is not true, that is not true, that is simply not true. I came up with my, my recommendation on June 29th. Those were my views at the time based on my examination of the record. No one told me you're going to go and write this letter that way. That just didn't happen. Now, I, I must say, for a member of Congress to badger a, a witness because he's not getting the answer he wants is very, very disturbing to me. Maybe we can just say, like a lot of people say, when they don't get the answer they want, it's politics. But I don't think that that's the way members of Congress ought to be conducting an examination or an investigation where they're presumably trying to get to the truth. Uh, I, I have uh, time to yield, and Mr. Lantos, I want to yield to you uh, now and uh, let you pursue questions for five minutes, although it may well be then appropriate to let other members. Would you yield uh, uh, for a moment, Mr. Waxman? Who's asking me to yield? I am, Mr. Yes. Uh, just because of the testimony you've put on the screen, I think it's timely. I would just take a moment to call your attention to another part of the uh, exhibit record, which is 324, a memo dated July 6th, the fourth paragraph of which states clearly, the upshot of the meeting attended by Mr. Anderson. Wh whose affidavit is this? This is not an affidavit. It's part of the record exhibit 324. And can you identify that exhibit, what it is? It is a memo describing a meeting on the issue 
of the Hudson Dog Track, attended by Mr. Duffy, uh, someone named Heather, I guess that's Skivenson, Bob Anderson, and Troy, as we discuss George's letter, the fourth paragraph, the upshot of the meeting was that Duffy wants the letter rewritten to include further reason for denying, et cetera, et cetera. I would only present that as an indication that possibly there was a request uh, uh, to change the finding either on or after uh, the June 29th. I, I just okay, think well, it's I, I appreciate what the gentleman's raising, and let's put that Thank to you. the uh, witness, because you're the one who was in charge of this whole decision. Was this possibility accurate? Was there uh, an interference by Mr. Duffy or somebody in politics to, uh, uh, as, as uh, the gentleman uh, from New Hampshire suggests might be possible? There was no interference with my June 29th recommendation. Uh, and the, there were changes made after my June 29th recommendation before the final decision was signed by Mr. Anderson. Uh, did those changes go to the decision, or they go to the, how the uh, uh, the decision would be uh, articulated? It cha it goes to the to the reasons for the decisions. Uh, it doesn't change the ultimate result not to take the land into trust. It really goes to whether um, uh, the department should rely on section 20 of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, uh, as well as with refusing to take the land into trust under the IRA. Well, I thank my colleague for raising this point so we can have it clarified, and I, I hope the members on the other side will see that we're willing to yield to them if they have a, a pertinent point. And I found that so far, my experience is that the Republican members have never been willing to yield to me. Can, so I can, hope we'll see that change. Can I make a, a, a comment before I forget? I, some, on something, um, Mr. Waxman, that you've said before, uh, I want to point out that um, I do not feel that I was badgered by the chairman or by the council, and uh, I uh, certainly hope that uh, the rest of these proceedings will not uh, uh, change in that sense, um, and uh, that we're not going to go as long as uh, we did in my deposition. Well, you are a diabetic, and if you have special needs, you ought to let uh, the chairman know, because I'm sure he'll be considerate of it. But let me ask you one other question, because you are under oath, and let's get this pinned down. Do you have any knowledge of any cover-up in the Department of Interior uh, uh, about the political interference that uh, might have been brought to bear in this uh, decision that was made? No, I do not. Okay. Uh, if I, the gentleman requires a break after this uh, series of questions, we'll be happy to give him one. I'm, I'm doing fine right now, thanks. I want to yield to uh, Mr. Lantos if he wants to take time, otherwise I'll yield to other members. I would suggest uh, in deference to Mr. Skibine that we take a break and I'd like well, to take my five minutes after. That's fine. Um, break. And let me yield to other members that may want to, Mr. Konjorski, Ms. Maloney. You'll wait your five-minute time. Mr. Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Skabin, how do you feel about being here? Uh, well, as I stated in my opening statement, um, I think it's my duty as an American and as a civil servant to appear before this committee in its investigation of this matter. And um, I am uh, uh, here and uh, to clear the record of my involvement, and uh, I hope it will be helpful. You said you had trouble sleeping last night. You were tossing and turning because of your attempt to try to figure out how five, four or five people could, could file an affidavit saying something that you have testified today you didn't say. Um, you haven't said whether you've sort of come up with a theory as to what what they heard or what they thought they heard, because you seem to be very gracious to them um, in thinking that may have, there may have been a mistake. Could you, could you tell us maybe what your thoughts are? Well, uh, as, I, as I started uh, to explain um, uh, with the majority council, um, what we were there for is to essentially give them technical advice on uh, putting land into trust. Uh, but when we got there, it became quite clear that they did not want to talk about that. They wanted to talk about Hudson. And we told them that we could not talk about Hudson because uh, it was under litigation. And in fact, we said that we, we specifically had told the Lakota tribe that, that uh, we were not going to discuss Hudson. So we proceeded to discuss uh, the issue of putting land into trust. We were, we were, we were talking in terms of a hypothetical 
uh, placement of land in trust, and I think they were essentially talking about Hudson uh, without, without saying so, and, and, and of course they wouldn't be, uh, Mr. Havnik was there not for the purpose of, of hearing about the tribe putting land into trust elsewhere. Um, so what, what I think um, one of the issues we told them is that, look, you know, if um, you want to take land into trust off reservation, I think that it's very important that you obtain the support of the local community. And um, without having local political support, uh, you will, you know, the application will be in trouble. And um, um, uh, Mr. Havnik didn't, um, was there very distraught by that because he said, well, we have, uh, um, we know what the town of Troy um, uh, no, uh, thinks and they haven't changed their mind. We know what the city council of Hudson thinks and they haven't, they haven't changed their mind. So essentially that we're not going to go anywhere. And, and my comment was, you know, that, that, that without uh, local political support, uh, there's going to be problem. Do you think that that's an accurate assessment of, of, this, of this type of proceeding? Do you think you were giving them good advice? Was I giving them good advice? Uh, I hope so. I was doing the best I can. Yeah. I, and I would, I would share your feeling that I think that you, the political input is always going to be part of this. Have you or your department, do you know of any opposition that you have received on, on other um, attempts to put land into trust by other members of Congress, other than those in this, in this Excuse case? Me, can you repeat the question? In, in this case, we've had opposition, I think, perhaps from the entire Minnesota delegation, at least those who have, who have gone on the record, from all of those in the Wisconsin delegation who have gone on record has been in opposition to this. Is that unusual? Or in other states, do you see opposition or support, for that matter, from members well, of Congress? We see both, yes. And what is Gentlemen, the Gentlemen, just because the time's out, I only want to say one thing to add to the record. Sure, let, let me yield back to Mr. Yeah. Waxman. Because uh, if we also had uh, Hilda Manuel testify, she would have said the Washington office rejects the area office's recommendations quite frequently. There's no different than the decisions under Secretary Lujan. That issue came up yesterday. People said this is extraordinary that the local office's decision was overturned. It's evidently uh, not so uh, remarkable. Uh, Mr. Scabine, you are here as a career public employee. You've said to us you've made your decision on the merits without political interference. Is that your clear, unequivocal testimony? Yes, it is. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Barrett. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Scabine, would you like to take a break right now? Um, we're going to have questioning for some time. If you'd like to take a break, we'll break right now is okay. Okay, we'll take five minutes okay. or ten minutes. Okay. Stand and race us to the fall of the gavel. Committee will come to order. We uh, will break at 12.15, Mr. Scabine, because of his health concerns, uh, would like to have lunch at that time. So we will break at 12.15 uh, and we'll be back promptly at 1 o'clock. I'd like to start at 1 o'clock because we have a lot uh, left on the agenda. Uh, I think I'll, well, I'm going to, I've talked to Denny about that. I'm going to take the first five minutes, if I might. Mr. Scabine, uh, I want to direct your attention to a couple of uh, memos. Number 324, Exhibit 324, and Exhibit 326A1.
My colleague uh, brought to your attention a while ago this uh, memo which said in a July, 19, nine, July 5th, 1995 meeting that was attended by Duffy, Heather, Bob Anderson, and Troy Woodward, I believe, uh, the upshot of the meeting was that Duffy wants the letter rewritten to include a further reason for denying to take the land into trust under Section 20 because the consultation process resulted in vehement and widespread local government and nearby Indian tribes' oppositions to locating a casino at this site. Now, Mr. Duffy, excuse me, just one second. Mr. Duffy uh, was the counsel to uh, Mr. Babbitt, correct? That's right. And Mr. Duffy left the Interior Department and went to work for the Shakopee tribes uh, as a representative for them in a law firm, correct? Uh, my understanding is that he went uh, to work with a law firm in Washington, Steptoe & Johnson. That's right, but he represents the Shakopee tribes, as does uh, Mr. Collier, who was the chief of staff. They both left after all this took place and went to work for this law firm, and they now represent the Shakopees. Is that correct? Uh, I'm well, not it, sure it, ab about Mr. Collier. I think that um, Mr. Duffy represents the Shakopee tribes on some matters. Okay. Well, this meeting, Duffy, who went to work for the Shakopees, uh, wanted the letter rewritten. And at that meeting was Duffy, Heather, Bob Anderson, and Troy Woodward. Did you ever talk to any of those people about the letter? About the rewriting of the letter? About the rewriting? No. You didn't talk to any of those people? No. Um, let me, let me um, tell you for the record, I, I drafted my recommendation on June 29, 1995, uh, and that's in the record. Okay. Uh, I subsequently went on vacation, uh -huh. and then I came back uh, over the weekend. I came in the office. I did ministerially incorporate some changes from the, my draft that were left, okay. and I subsequently immediately left to go to Denver uh, on another matter, and um, I, the only one I've talked to during that time in Denver was Mike Anderson. Okay. Okay. Now, I'd like to direct your attention to 326A1. This is a memo from you, <coughs> George Scabine, dated 7-8, and uh, I'm not sure to whom it was uh, sent, but it says, to Mr. Wisner, it said, you should get a redrafted version of the Hudson letter first thing Monday morning. I hope it meets Duffy's directions. Now, what does that mean? What it means, I think, is that when I did come back from vacation, I found in my box, in my inbox, a, a correct draft uh, with a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, requirements, whatever, you know, changes. From who? From who? Um, who put in my in my box? Well, you said there was requirements or changes. Who who put that? Who, well, I think that it was um, from an email that's in the record. I think it. I, I think those were Heather Sibison's and John Duffy's uh, suggestion. Okay, change. John Duffy's suggestion. Now, Mr. Duffy, who now works for the Shakopees, who's making a lot of money at that law firm from the Shakopees, and I believe he's helped facilitate campaign contributions to the DNC from the Shakopees, which you may not be aware of, but you say in your memo. You should get a redrafted version of the Hudson letter uh, first thing Monday morning. I hope it meets Duffy's direction. Now, Mr. Duffy was a political appointee who now works for the Shakopees. He gave you direction. You say, I hope it meets Duffy's directions. So the letter, the rewritten, now wait a minute. That's what your memo says. Uh, the, I, I, I don't understand how, how this squares with no political influence was, was, was in, uh, utilized because Mr. Duffy goes to work for the Shakopees, major help to the DNC in contributions. Mr. Duffy gives you direction, and you say so in your memo, and you change the letter because of what Mr. Duffy said. Now, uh, then there's a letter from Kevin. It says, this letter did not come up Monday morning. It was sent directly to Heather, and changes were made. The letter we're talking about is the letter that you changed. Uh, this letter did not come up Monday morning. It was sent directly to Heather, and changes were made. Uh, who's Heather, and did she help rewrite the letter that you put your signature on? This is Heather Sibison you're referring to. Yes. Uh, and you, what's the rest of the question? Did she help rewrite? It says, this letter did not come up Monday morning. It was sent directly to Heather, and changes were made. They're right. referring, I presume, to the same letter that you, you were rewriting because Mr. Duffy wanted you to rewrite it, including things he wanted in there. Right. Right. I, 
that's, that's a, that email is not from me, it's from someone else. I understand. But is that the same letter? I, I'm talking about I, your... I don't know. I, I, you know, I can't, well, I can't speculate uh, I, I about that. My time but has expired, but the point I, 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 I'm trying to make is that there was not supposedly any political interference. Mr. Duffy was a political appointee. Mr. Yes. Duffy went to work for the law firm. Mr. Duffy instructed you because you said you hope it met with Duffy's directions. Mr. Duffy instructed you directly or indirectly to rewrite the letter and you did it according to his directions and you said, I hope this meets with Mr. Duffy's requirements. And if that, suggestions, if that doesn't smack of political influence, uh, then I don't know what does. Uh, your, Can I respond? Mr. Lantos, uh, you have the time. Let me clarify for the chairman his apparent confusion. The changes Mr. Duffy proposed related to legal reasons for the decision, not the substance of the decision. And your repeated emphasis of Mr. Duffy working for a law firm and having a lucrative position with a law firm conveniently forgets the chronology. Uh, Senator Dole is working for a law firm at a lucrative rate. And what his decisions were as a United States Senator preceded his work with the law firm. I have grave reservations about the revolving door, but I think it's absurd to criticize an individual who is working for the United States government for participating in the work of his department while being on the government payroll. Subsequently, he went into the private sector. Many members of this body and the Senate and many presidential candidates do that. And I think it is an attempt to obfuscate the issue. Uh, I uh, would like to first, Ms. Skabine, identify myself with the statement of my good friend and distinguished colleague from Illinois, uh, Ms. Cummins, when he, when he uh, indicated his uh, respect both for you and for the civil service. Uh, <clears throat> Maryland, I also want to, I also want to um, express my regret uh, that your counsel was not given an opportunity to make his statement. You are a quarter century civil servant. I would like to use my time because I think the facts have been clearly established that you reached your decision on the merits of the case without any political interference. I would like to re, uh, focus my remarks on the Republican Council's uh, a feeble attempt to confuse the notion of what represents political interference. He referred to the meeting of uh, the Minnesota congressional delegation, which you attended, presumably Correct. three days after you took this job. Well, the meeting took place three days after you took this job, so that's why you attended it three days after you took that job. Apparently, counsel does not understand that much of the work of members of the Congress of the United States consists of representing their constituents and their communities. And it is preposterous, in my view, to deliberately attempt to confuse the work of representatives on behalf of their constituents, which is clearly what uh, Mr. Gunderson and Mr. Oberstar and other colleagues, both Republicans and Democrats, did in this instance, with what is the alleged purpose of these hearings, namely the attempt to find out if improper campaign uh, contributions influence political decisions. And since you were pressed on the notion as to whether your meeting with the Minnesota congressional delegation does not contradict your sworn statement that you did not reach your conclusion as a result of political pressure, I think it's important to delineate these two entirely different types of activities. Every single member of this committee and every single member of Congress represents 
and attempts to put pressure on the appropriate department of the administration with respect to his constituents and his district problems. We do that when we go before the Appropriations Committee looking for funds to um, rebuild a washed out highway in our district. Uh, this, uh, this is represented by our attempt to obtain grants for our universities. This is not political pressure. This is the job of representative government. And what uh, presumably the other side seems unable to, to prove, therefore they're shifting the ground, is that your decision was made without any interference whatsoever by the Democratic National Committee, by the White House, by any political arm of the Democratic Party. Is that correct, Ms. Kubani? That's correct, yes. So the political pressures that you were subjected to were the proper political pressures, i.e. statements by the Republican governor of the state, uh, the Republican congressman of the district, the Republican state assembly person of the district. And these are the proper expressions of representative government in our society. Would you agree with that? I agree with that. Thank you very much. Skibin, I appreciate uh, your being here today. I would like to uh, just clarify a, a couple things. I, I certainly hope that you don't feel that you've been badgered, uh, either no, here or any previous time. Uh, you know, you have to go to defining what badgering is, and I'm not sure that any, everybody have a different defining. I happen to sit in this uh, Congress uh, eight years in minority and enjoyed sitting under uh, my friend right here, Mr. Waxman, and sat under Mr. English, and sat under Mr. Sinar, and sat under Mr. Dingle. And I can tell you, I don't think they ever badgered anybody, but they certainly they went to some extraordinary energy to make their point. And that happens in this business. So however we want to define that. But I would like to get <coughs> back just to, to the sequence that we talked about today. First of all, <laughs> the major test that the applications for off-reservation gambling sites must meet is that there is no detriment to the surrounding community. Is that correct? Um, that's partly correct, partially correct. The um, when an application is submitted to uh, an area office uh, and eventually to our office if it's for gaming, uh, there has the, the following determinations have to happen. First, the, the secretary has to make a decision on whether he wants to exercise his discretionary authority to take the land into trust, because the Indian Gaming Act is not a land acquisition authority. The land acquisition authority must be a congressional statute that authorizes the secretary to take that land in trust for the Indians. In this particular case, the statutory authority to take the land into trust was Section 5 of the 1934 Indian Railroad. So that would be one of the issues. Right. I have that's only one. five minutes here trying okay. to establish a All right. line. So that's the first one. Then, then, assuming that the Secretary determines that he does want to um, take the land into trust to exercise that discretionary authority, uh, he will then if it's for gaming, have to comply with the requirements of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. In this case, Section 20, which requires, uh, if it's off reservation and none of the specific exceptions apply, it requires that gaming can only occur on the land if, uh, on, if the uh, secretary determines after consultation with uh, nearby tribes and appropriate state and local officials that the gaming establishment will be in the best interest of the tribe and not detrimental to the surrounding community. And only if the governor concurs in that determination. And so there has to be a concrete showing of detriment, actually, that uh, either there's increased crime or increased traffic that the infrastructure for that area won't support. Is that correct? Well, what this, there has to be some generally reasons. Correct, uh, that generally correct? There has to be some reasons for the secretary to make that finding. All right. You know, I come from an area in northern Illinois, and, and there's gambling. It's not Indian gambling, but there's gambling. And I, my good friends from Indiana, uh, will tell you that Indiana, northern Indiana, opened up gambling. And boy, it really took the business away from Illinois and they went to Indiana. I guess Indiana is a better place to go. But basically, the population that was served is the greater Chicago area. Now, 
that was made on a free market decision. People get the licenses from the states and they go in and they apply and the process goes forward. It doesn't, it's not a federal agency to decide who gets this favor, who gets that favor. But when you apply this thing between Wisconsin and Minnesota, there was already Indian gaming or gaming sponsored by Indians controlled by the federal government in Minnesota. Is that correct? That's correct. And when this uh, thing in western uh, Wisconsin, which is very close to Minnesota, it's a border with Minnesota, uh, there was fear by one Indian tribe that their business would be taken away. Is that, is that correct? They were feared by many Indian tribes. Right. Uh, so yes. in that fact, then, that, that there was a fear. The federal government determines who gets these licenses and who doesn't. Is that correct? No, there's no licensing involved. Well, there. who gets the trust to do this? Well, you, you were part whether that that site was going to become a site for gambling or not, right? That's right. Okay, uh, however you want to call it. So the issue here is that there was extraordinary influence. We could call it political influence. You could call it economic influence upon certain members of government to decide whether this. Uh, entity was going to take place as a gambling entity. And in fact, uh, the Ashland, Wisconsin office of the Bureau of Indian Affairs said that there was no detriment. And the Minneapolis Bureau of Indi uh, Indian Affairs office said that there was no detriment. And in fact, this even went to Washington. Uh, and the uh, area office recommendation was approved. Or it said that there was no detriment. At least it was moving forward. But when the uh, Exhibit 317A that says the staff recommends that the secretary, based on the following, de determine that the proposed acquisition would not be detrimental to the surrounding community. Uh, can we have that? I mean, that, that was basically saying that there was no detriment. Then all of a sudden, uh, this comes to Washington, and there are issues that, are, that happen, and you know, one of the facts that we had testimony yesterday that there was a third of a million dollars as a contribution. Whether that's a political influence or not, I don't know. But it certainly lays that predicate that there could be. And I know that you're just a person who has to make his decisions. But when somebody gives you a memo that says you have to change your report, that certainly leaves suspicion. I know you're innocent of that. I mean, you, did, you made your best judgment, but when a superior or your attorney tells you to do something, certainly that gives us uh, an opening to ask questions. And my time's up, and I would uh, yield back. Yield back. Can I respond? Can I respond? Certainly. Oh, well, um, what I want to um, with your permission say is that I respond. My time's up. Go ahead. That's up to up to you, but sure. Um, yes. I made my recommendation on June 29th. Uh, that, that recommendation is a draft, it's my, it's my recommendation, and it goes up the chain of command uh, and ultimately finds its way to the Assistant Secretary, or in that case, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for his signature. Any of the people who are reviewing the draft can make changes to it. If they don't like what I'm saying, they can make changes to it. It's, it's not my decision, it's sure. my recommendation. I understand. And that, that obviously happened in this case, in the normal course of, of doing business, uh, uh, that will happen. So uh, this attorney did ask to change and make I'm, it. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Councilor was speaking, and I didn't hear what you uh, said. See, the, this attorney did ask to make a change, and it was made in your recommendation. Gentlemen, you. Uh, I, my time's up. Yeah, so. uh, you're not saying the decision was changed. You're saying the draft of the decision was changed, but the, the decision was the same. My, the, the, what, what happened, essentially, is that the ultimate outcome, which is not to take the land into trust, that, that was not changed. But the basis for coming to that conclusion were changed. Thank you. I yield uh, <clears throat> whoever, Mr. Ken Choice, for five minutes. I'm going to give you one more opportunity because I know you've been a public servant for 20 years. You came into the office just shortly before this application landed on your desk. You prepared and went through the process, made the recommendation, and the, re the final decision of the department followed your recommendation or your position or your analysis of the problem. Now, do you want to satisfy the majority and tell them that it was political influence so we can give them one last time to be happy? Or are you satisfied 
that no political influence in any way was exercised to uh, encourage you to arrive at a decision one way or another? There was no political pressure or uh, improper influence born on me, put on me to come up with my June 29th recommendation. Okay. Now, in all these instances, Mr. Skibarn, there's winners and losers. Is that correct? If you issue a license to one group, somebody else will have an impact in a negative group. Uh, that's correct. But I want to. I want to. One thing that in the press, there was all this, all this report that the BI issues gaming licenses. That is simply not the case, and I hate to see it professionally uh, this perpetuated in this hearing. The BI does not issue licenses. We, we, one of their responsibilities is to take land in trust. To clarify right. that, okay. In other words, you, uh, the license couldn't be granted unless the trust property was taken into trust. Other than that, there couldn't be a license offered on that property. Th there could be right. no uh, gaming class three gaming on that property unless it was in trust. In, in your analysis, did you review the contractual arrangement, the uh, fin finances of the non-Indian group and the three tribes and who would derive what or did that not come to bear? Um, <clears throat> in our uh, review of the section 20 determination, we have to review the best, whether the, the um, gaming establishment is in the best interest of the tribe. And to do that, we would go into an in-depth review of the financial arrangements for this deal to make sure that it is in the best interest of the tribes. Yes. Somewhere along the line, I read a document that's indicated that the National Indian Gaming Commission was not satisfied with the terms and conditions. Am I relatively correct in uh, that interpretation? Yes, I, I, I think you are. The um, parallel to our examination of whether the um, uh, it was in the best interest of the tribe. The, um, uh, if the um, gaming in, in, in involves a management contractor, the uh, Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, IGRA, requires management contracts to be submitted to the National Indian Gaming Commission, the NIGC, for their review and approval. So that's what the, the, the three tribes did because they had a management contract in this case. They submitted the management contract to the NIGC for their review at the same time as the application was pending for the land transfer. And in that review, the National Indian Gaming Commission was not satisfied with the terms and conditions. Is that correct? Um, I recall that they did send the three tribes a letter uh, inform them, informing them of, um, or the contractor, I don't, I don't know who received the letter, actually uh, informing them of deficiencies in the uh, submission. Right. Uh, off the purposes of this hearing, because quite frankly, I'm more interested, uh, uh, are, are there a lot of these processes going on across the country now where uh, people who have disappointed investments in dog tracks or other potential gaming properties are seeking out Indian tribes to justify putting their property in trust so they can build casinos? Is that a, is that a wide experience that's occurring across the country? I think it is occurring. Uh, what what happens in a lot of cases where, um, a, um, a, in cases of gaming, a lot of the Indian tribes do not have the capital to essentially finance these acquisitions so that they are approached or approach or however that happened, uh, non-Indian companies, uh, gaming concerns, financing corporations, the dog track owners, uh, to enter into a partnership uh, that will essentially be beneficial to both. In, in, in a case where there is a, a dog track, let's say, oh. in, in Kansas, they will, they're uh, I understand. If you're a poor Indian tribe and you're getting nothing, when a gaming group comes by and offers you something, there's a gain to you and a benefit. What I'm interested right. in, uh, is the law sufficiently examined now that there isn't advantage being taken of some of these Indian groups, that we couldn't do something better to see that the proceeds from gaming goes to the Indian tribes more so than the private speculating market? Uh, the, the law provides, and that's not my area, but the law provides that the, uh, in the management contract, the, uh, um, the, ma the contractor cannot get more than 30 percent of net revenues, and the tribe then gets 70 percent. In extreme cases, I think it allows up to 40 percent of net revenues. Uh, so the, uh, the IGRA, IGRA, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, addresses this issue uh, to make sure that the tribes are the major uh, benefactors of the venture. Do you think we should spend some time on this committee oversight uh, looking into some of these contracts and some of these propositions across the country? Um, I've I don't want to speculate on that. <laughs> Thank you. Are you back to balance my time, sir?
Gentleman yields back the balance of his time, Mr. Cox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Skabeen, you're trained as a lawyer, is that right? I am, yes. And you spent over 20 years with the Department of the Interior? That's correct. And you're the head of the gaming office? I was the head of the gaming office. Right. You at all the times in question. Right. On your, uh, in your May 17, 1995 meeting that we've discussed here, did you raise any concerns, that is to say, the meeting that took place? Uh, I don't think we the discussed the May 17. We discussed the February 8, 1995 meeting with Congressman Oberstars and others. Okay. Uh, do you know the meeting to which I refer? No. Not specifically, if you can be more... Uh, All right. There was a meeting that took place, uh, and I believe the date is, in fact, May 17, 1995. Uh, at which um, you discussed the status of the application along with the uh, tribes, the, the members uh, who were advancing the casino application in Hudson. Does that ring a bell? Um, we've had several meetings with, with the tribes. I'm, if, um, if, you can refer, if you can refer to me to who was at the meeting, then... Um, Perhaps I can uh, be more specific. <clears throat> May 17, 1995, morning meeting. The Chippewa seeking casino approval met with interior officials, including John Duffy, the interior counselor, and George Skabeen, head of the department's gaming office. Does that okay. now ring a bell? Yes, it does, yes. All right. At that meeting, to the best of your recollection, did you raise any concerns with the application or give any indication to the Chippewa present that uh, their application would be rejected? Um, I don't have, you know, I don't really have any recollection of what transpired at the meeting except for uh, I think uh, Chairman Nuwago was there, and I, recoll I recollect uh, that he made an impassioned plea on behalf of his tribe for taking the land into trust. I cannot recall in any particularity what uh, Mr. Duffy uh, may have said uh, to them at that meeting. How about you? No, I don't recall that I said much at the meeting except that I was just there to well, say If you didn't say much, we can infer you didn't tell them about any problems with their application at that meeting. At the particular meeting, I, don't, I just don't recall. But you do recall you didn't say much? Uh, I don't think I said that much because the meeting was principally with, uh, with the counselor. And therefore, if you didn't say much, you probably didn't say much about any particular subject. I, but I don't remember that. Okay. Uh, did you talk to Heather Sibison after that meeting? I don't recall um, whether I talked to Heather Sibison. We now know that Heather, Heather Sibison, uh, rather rapidly after that meeting, reported back to uh, uh, Harold Ickes through his assistant at the White House. And you are now aware of that, is that right? I'm aware of that because it's, um, it's been in a lot of the documents that were submitted. And when and I, did I think you, it was uh, shown to me in my depositions. When did you first learn about that? That, that the, what went on in that meeting was communicated to Ickes and the White House? Um, I don't know. I certainly didn't know anything about it by July 4th. I didn't know anything about that by July 14th. Are you in the habit of discussing Meetings such as that with Heather Sibison? Or meetings with the White House? No, no, no. Meetings such as the one that you had on May 17th. Um, sometimes, sometimes not. Okay, so you may have been the source of her information? Her information for what? That she communicated then to the White House? I don't... Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know that she communicated anything to the White House. Well, you just told me you did. No, I didn't know at the time. No, no, but you told me you now know. But I, I, you're referring to, 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 this, to this right now. You now are aware that she communicated the next day with the White House, right? Well, uh, if you can show me the email or the document you're referring to. But I'd just as soon stand on your earlier testimony of about three sentences ago under oath. Uh, yes, I've, I think I heard. Uh, I have. Um, I think that, that somehow in the record they sh that was shown to me so that I would know about it. 
now. And now you wrote a memo. And I would much prefer having the, the, the memo or whatever you're referring to uh, before right. me. Uh, I'm going to begin something now okay. that I've got to finish on the next round because, right. uh, as you know, we have a limited amount of time here. But I want to bring to your attention Exhibit 321 and alert you to the fact that I'm going to be asking you further questions about Exhibit 321. It's a memo that you wrote to Heather Sibison. And in that memo, uh, dated June 30, which is then after the May 17 meeting and after uh, her communication to Ickes through his assistant, uh, you tell her that uh, under Section 20, your tentative conclusion is that uh, the gambling establishment in Hudson is not going to be de detrimental to the surrounding community. So instead, you're going to go on a different legal ground, Section 465. I want to ask you this question. As the head of the office, the gaming office, which you then were, and with your 20 years at Interior, can you give me today any examples in which uh, an application was rejected not under Section 20 but under Section 465? Um, I cannot. Um, uh, I would. I, I cannot really talk uh, about matters that occurred before I became the gaming off the gaming director. So I can't. I can't answer that question. There, it may, there may be some. There may many may not be. Do you know of any? Uh, specifically, I can't recall of any. In connection with preparing this, did you find any precedent? No. No. Thank this you. this My time this has decision was made on the on the merits of this application. <laughs> The committee will uh, stand in recess till 1 o'clock. Please be back promptly at 1. We have a lot of work to do. Come to order. Uh, are you? I'm next. Uh -huh. next? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mrs. I'm sorry, Mrs. <laughs> Maloney, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Scabine, as a 20-year civil servant, have you had the occasion to serve under both Democratic and Republican administrations? That is correct. During uh, Secretary Babbitt's tenure, what was the Interior Department's policy? with respect to off-reservation off off gaming establishments? What was their policy? Did they look at community support? Was community support important? Uh, yes. The, was um, it more important than on-reservation uh, applications? I think that the, um, the um, uh, determinations are made on a case-by-case -case basis, and we have to look at the requirements of uh, uh, the uh, Indian uh, the Land Acquisition Authority and the requirements of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. For off-reservation acquisitions, uh, Section 20 requires that um, uh, the opposition and detri the detriment to the surrounding community be, con be considered. Have you looked at many applications since in your tenure in your position? About how many applications have you had the occasion to review? Um, on Section 20? Yes, uh-huh. Um, not many, maybe three or four, mm -hmm. um, those don't, there, there are applications for, to take land into trust, mm -hmm. uh, but um, for gaming, but uh, um, 
if the uh, acquisition is on the reservation or contiguous to the reservation, then the two-party termination does not get mm -hmm. triggered. Mm -hmm. If there is another exception that applies under Section 20, then it doesn't get triggered. It's only if nothing applies that Section mm -hmm. 20 applies. Have, have you ever seen in the applications you have reviewed opposition to the extreme that you saw in this particular case? Uh, no, in the applications that I have reviewed uh, under the two-part determination, essentially the, um, essentially the um, uh, surrounding community was in support of the uh, uh, gaming establishment. Well, I must say that the amount of op opposition is, is, is almost staggering. Uh, the mayor was recalled by the voters after he supported the casino. The city council people who favored the casino chose not to run again because of the feelings in the town against it were so high. Isn't it true that the city council uh, voted against it by four to two? That's correct. The city council. Yeah. And, and isn't it true that 71% uh, of the people in the neighboring town of Troy voted against it? Seventy-one percent of the people. Seventy-one percent. In, in, uh, in a town vote in, this, in the city of Troy voted against it. On this establishment? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't recall that. You don't recall that. And isn't it true that the representative, the Republican uh, elected congressman, was opposed to it? Uh, yes, Congressman uh, Gunderson, uh, whose uh, district this is, uh, was opposed to this uh, yeah. Acquisition. And the state uh, representative, the state senator, the entire Minnesota delegation, uh, those members of Congress in Wisconsin who came out, came out in opposition. The governor came out in, in, in opposition. Uh, quite frankly, Mr. Chairman, I would have been surprised if there was a, a decision in the opposite direction given the large amount of uh, community opposition. I'd like to ask you also about uh, the National Scenic Riverway. Isn't it true that the Hudson Greyhound racing track on which the casino was to be built was located one half mile from the National Scenic Riverway and the department had received many complaints about the environmental impact on the riverway? That is correct. And isn't it true that the local business people, many who had no financial interest, were also opposed to the we application? Have, uh, we have a, uh, on the record, um, there was a opposition, substantial opposition, from a number of businesses in the area, yes. And in, isn't it true that the St. Croix tribe, which had an, an on-reservation gaming establishment within 50 miles of Hudson, opposed the application? The St. Croix tribe uh, did oppose the application, yes. Yet the uh, tribe that was applying all, they lived either 85 miles away or 188 miles away. That's uh, as, as far as from D.C. to Pittsburgh. You know, what I find troubling with this, uh, Mr. Chairman, is yesterday we, we heard from the tribes and the uh, developer from Florida uh, that they uh, had their lobbyists meet with Secretary Babbitt. Now, if Secretary Babbitt or Mr. Scabine had decided in favor of the tribes 85 miles away, we would be having a hearing on that terrible decision. And here, uh, most of us believe that localities should have input, input into what happens <laughs> in their localities. The decision that was sent up by Mr. Anderson, and I'd like to put it in the record, says to, to substitute our judgment, and our quote, for that of local communities directly impacted by this proposed off-reservation gaming acquisition, we do not intend to go against the local government. I thought that's what the Republican Party was about, that they didn't want bureaucrats like Mr. Scabine, uh, career bureaucrats making decisions that overruled localities. And uh, I, I just uh, feel that uh, uh, I guess what we should have uh, really are, are hearings on banning soft money. Uh, there would be no ap appearance of any impropriety if there had not been con contributions as there were on both sides, both the Indians 85 miles and 188 miles away, and, uh, and, uh, and the other side, uh, we would not be having hearings. We would not be uh, looking at this now. Uh, we should be having hearings on banning soft money and uh, focusing on that.
Ms. Maloney, did you uh, want that submitted for the record? Absolutely. I mean, uh, without objection. Absolutely. Well, just, quite, quite frankly, Mr. Chairman. Time's expired. Without Mr. Objection, Chairman, without objection, if it had Ms. been my district, ma'am, and time everyone in my delegation, regular order, Mr. Chairman, and every elected official was regular opposed order, to it, Mr. I would have gone to the floor of Congress to reverse the decision. Regular order. Mr. Your Chairman, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is, what is the fuss about? We are supporting a, a local order, Mr. community's Maloney, position. Your time has expired. Your time has expired. Now, Ms. Maloney, if you want to submit that for the record, it will be accepted. I would like uh, very much to submit Mr. it to the record. Mr. Sununu, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to reemphasize that we are not here because of a decision that was made. We're here because the reasons that were provided for that decision or weren't provided, as is the case, uh, are, are very troubling, that there was no notification, no communication throughout this whole process. With regard to the community concern, let me begin by uh, focusing on Exhibit 324, uh, Paragraph 2. Uh, it states, in this description of a meeting that took place, the opinion advocated by George, you, and which we have used to evaluate objections in the past, that the consulta consultation process does not provide for an absolute veto by mere objection. In other words, mere opposition isn't enough. It requires the objection be accompanied by evidence with the gaming establishment that it would have detrimental impact. Uh, has that been the position, uh, typically, of the gaming staff at Interior, that nope. it requires to be shown detrimental impact as well? I, I'm, I'm sort of trying to read, sir. I'm sorry. Uh, what you're quoting from. Is mere political objection enough to find that there was detrimental impact or would be detrimental impact? Under Section 20? Yes. I think that wasn't the case here. I think that um, okay, there was... Okay, that wasn't the case here. Yes. Uh, in Exhibit 321, your own memo, you point out that even if the town of Hudson and the town of Troy were to embrace this proposal, we may still not change our position because of political opposition on the Hill. So even if this had been unanimous in the towns, unanimous support, you're saying that you still may have found against. Is that correct? Um, what I wrote in this email is that for purposes of um, um, the IRA and the, and the unfettered discretion of the secretary, I think that the opposition of the Minnesota tribes and the opposition of the and, and for the reasons stated in the uh, by the Minnesota delegation may still be a factor in deciding not to take the land into trust. That's with respect to my recommendation. But would it June support 29. a finding of no detriment to the community in and of itself? No, under Section 20, I wasn't not talking here about Section 20. 20. Thank right. You. Okay. In fact, there was no notification. Uh, let me let me back up. There was constant feeling within the career staff that there was no detriment to the surrounding community. Exhibit 303A-9. I just want to, this is written by career staff. Uh, this was drafted in April uh, 20th, 1995. Bold type, middle of the page, finding by your staff not detrimental to the surrounding community. Are you familiar with this document that came from the local area staff? Um, are you referring to the June 8, 1995 no, memo from Tom I'm Hartman? I'm referring to Exhibit 303A. Eight. It is written by uh, Office of the Area Director, April 20th, 1995. No, I'm sorry, I, my counsel gave me the wrong document. Mr. Chairman, I hope that the delay in, in consultation with the council won't be taken from my time. Mr. Sununu, wh which the number of that? Exhibit 303A. Just A. Dash one through, it's a multiple page document, specifically page nine, bold type from the local uh, office, not detrimental to the surrounding community. I just want to verify that you're familiar with the document, that it did indeed come from the local office of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And but this is April this. 20th, 1995. From the Mr. Sununu, we have 303A, which goes through a dash 7. We've got a dash 8, which is the Hartman Memorandum, not from the area director. 
What's the number that they are missing? You're, you're correct on the date. That is June 8th. That's 303A-8, not detrimental to the surrounding community. You're familiar with that memo? Yes, I am. Thank you. Now, it was typical in this process that the uh, office would communicate with the local tribes that if there were problems with the application, you would notify them, give them an opportunity to cure defects, correct? Um, there was some, there was a meetings and there were telephone calls that I testified before uh, to the, with the three applicant tribes, yes. Uh, not communication, but communication specifically to identify defects and give them an opportunity to cure defects. Are you suggesting that there was communication from your office about specific problems with their application? In writing, I don't think there were. There was not. Thank you. Is that unusual? It, well, that is that unusual. Let me back up. March 27th, was there not a memo to Chairman Ackley, Exhibit 302, stating, last sentence, should areas of concerns with the application be identified, you will be so notified. Are you familiar with that memorandum? Um, let um, Council is looking for it. That's Exhibit 302. I simply want to bring it to your attention that not only uh, it was that normal policy, there was in writing a commitment to provide them with notification of defects and problems with the application. This is a letter uh, to Arlen Ackley from John Duffy. Uh, what we meant by this is that if we found some problems with the best interest part of the Section 20 determination, we would bring it to their attention. Well, I, I, I don't think it's fair to embellish uh, to any great extent here. I think what you meant is, should areas of concern with the application be identified, that they will be so notified. I don't have much time, so let me just <coughs> conclude here with emphasizing that throughout this process of communication, that there would be no detriment to the community within the internal staff. There was no de notification of specific defects in their application. And I think on that basis, there was a great reluctance to focus on Section 20 and the detriment to the community uh, operative part of the decision in rendering the final decision. Uh, would you disagree with that? Uh, let me just say that um, it is true that my June 29th recommendation relied solely on uh, a refusal to exercise discretionary authority and that I was familiar with Mr. Hartman's June 8th memo and that I think that he raised some concerns uh, with relying on the Section 20 and that that was one of the reasons that I uh, chose to confine uh, my decision uh, to uh, a reliance on the Indian Reorganization Act's uh, authority. Let me bring to the committee's attention Exhibit 316, and maybe you can elaborate in looking at that. It's your email of June 6th, the last sentence of which uh, you state, as you are aware, as you are, uh, are you aware of any cases addressing the Secretary's authority to refuse to take land into trust? The acquisition is for gaming purposes, but we want to avoid making a determination under Section 20 of IGRA. Why did you want to avoid invoking Section 20? I wanted to avoid invoking Section 20 because of, as I just stated, um, the concerns that Mr. Hartman brought to my attention. And in addition, I thought that the standard under Section 20 uh, for detriment uh, is higher. And I was concerned about setting a precedent uh, but despite your concerns, despite the concerns of the staff, despite the constant communication that there was no detriment to the community, in the final rejection letter, you did cite Section 20. The final rejection letter did cite Section 20, yes. Exhibit 328, page 2. Thus, we believe the proposed acquisition would be detrimental within the meaning of Section 20. Why, after all the better judgment of you and your staff, over a four-week period, did you change your mind and suddenly decide to invoke Section 20? Um, as I've testified before, I was not involved in the um, um, conversations that took place uh, between staff uh, after June 29th on this issue. 
I think that uh, uh, clearly there were some in the department that thought that the record justified a decision uh, under Section 20. And, and who, who, the would they are, be? Huh? who would they be? Oh, there would be the, um, uh, what? No. Well, I can only you, speculate. You stated clearly that there were others that thought it was the right decision. Regular right. Who would they be? They would be the one, the ones who are in, were up from me in the chain of command, but I cannot. I was not in those discussions. So essentially, on the road here, I'm not going to tell you who they are because I do not know. I wasn't there. Regular order. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, we'll get to them some more time later. Uh, Mr. Barrett, Mr. Scabina, I'd like to continue along that very same line of questioning. As you stated, you you were pushing for a review under 465. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. What was the standard of review at that time for a 465 decision? At that time, it was my understanding that the secretary had the unfettered discretion not to take land into trust, that um, the factors that are listed in 151 were essentially factors and that the secretary could rely on any additional information for his decision, that there was essentially uh, unfettered discretion. So that if, if one were to challenge a 465 decision, it would be difficult to do? I think if, if uh, let, let me just say that, that if one were to challenge a decision in 1995, a decision to take land into trust uh, under 465, it would have been impossible, impossible to, do to do. Because at the time, the uh, United States position, which was uh, uh, also the court's position, was that the Quiet Title Act uh, did not provide for a waiver of the United States sovereign immunity to challenge these decisions, these so, determinations. So those, those arguing, um, which included Michael Anderson, who will be here later this afternoon, the Solicitor General's office, and Mr. Duffy, I understand those were among those arguing for a concurrent Section 20 decision as well. Um, that was really the, the crack in the door that allowed a legal challenge to this case, wasn't it? I don't really want to speculate on that. Well, they, they, there certainly is a, a challenge available, is there not, under Section 20? Uh, uh, that's, that's right, there is, yes. Okay, so, so clearly, if there was no challenge under 465 and there was a challenge under Section 20, the department was opening itself up for a lawsuit by including Section 20. One can argue that. Okay, I just I wanted to make sure because I think my point is it seems that by including the Section 20, if, if one wanted to have a, uh, uh, a denial of, of the aggrieved party's ability to bring an action that you would have stayed under Section 465 as you were advocating. I'd also like to, to talk a little bit about Heather Sibison because her name has been brought in here. Um, and frankly, if I were handing out um, roses for, for actions that were um, definitely consistent with the public interest, I would give her one. And I've never met this woman, but I'm looking at, I'm looking at, at her memo, and this is among the emails going back and forth uh, on June 30th. And you've been asked a lot of questions about, about your 704 in the evening response, but let's go to the initial email that she started with, which was at 1050 in the morning. And she stated, we may, not, we may not want to include in our rationale the opposition of the other tribes, because I think it is possible that if the three tribes, here I think she's referring to the three Wisconsin tribes, came back with stellar support from their local towns and congressmen, we might look at this proposition in a new light. But in, even in, this, in that case, the Minnesota tribes will still be against it. And also, I agree with Collier's uneasiness about some tribes getting all the goodies at the expense of the other tribes. Theoretically, they should all have equal opportunities. So she seems to me more than anyone to be the, the, local, the local support person in this. Is that, is that accurate? That's accurate. Um, but you know, I think that Ms. Sibison is sitting behind here, and if you want to ask her I would to love explain to ask her, her uh, I don't emails, I, I certainly don't feel comfortable talking about what she might or might not think um, and but, um, <coughs> but would you ag agree with me that, that she is she is certainly implying if not stating directly um, that, that this group if they came back with the support from from Hudson and St. Croix County and, and the township of, of Troy that that the department might look at it a different way now you seem to disagree with that a little bit but that seems to be her position that is her position that is her position yes 
in, the, in this email. Okay. Under, under the statutes now, could this group come back in today with another application for the same site? Of course, yes. If they did so with the support of the community, do you think that, that your office may look at it differently? Of course, yes. Has there been any indication to you that the local support has changed on this issue at all? I don't know that. Okay. I mean, do you know that it has? You don't no, know I do not know that it has. Okay. I, I guess my, my point is that we, we're spending a lot of time here today. Um, there's a lot of money being spent on, on legal challenges. Um, but if this decision was wrong, is, is there a mechanism for a, a motion to reconsider in your office? Maybe there isn't. I don't know. Yes, there is. The, uh, in fact, the three tribes did file a motion for reconsideration. Uh, after the decision was handed down. And um, uh, we did never got to respond to that because they also filed a loss the lawsuit in Sakagan uh, Indian Tribe versus Babbitt. And our attorneys advised us not to, uh, uh, at that point, respond. In their motion to, to reconsider, did they include um, any sign of, of local support? I, I don't recall. Okay. And were there any members of Congress coming out in favor of this? Well, I think there was a lot of opposition from members of Congress. I, 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 I'm well, I was one of those. I was one uh, it, of those. It is possible, uh, however, that in the record there, there may be a letter from a, the local congressman from where the three tribes are located. No, that would have been Congressman Obi who came out against it. Yeah, Congressman Obi was against it. But, right. I mean, representative in the, in, of the districts where the three tribes are located. I think that would be Congressman Obi's All right, district. I'm not yeah. aware I mean, of it. From northern Wisconsin, at that time it was Congressman Gunnarsson, the western edge of the state, Congressman Obi, Congressman Roth. That covers the northern half of the state okay. where, where these tribes are located. Right. All three of those congressmen came out against it. So as it, did. you don't know of any support from any, any members of Congress? N no, I don't. Thank you very much. I have no further comments. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, gentleman from Indiana. Of course, the state legislator from Wisconsin who represents the tribes is on record, and we have that in the uh, record. Uh, and given the money that was flowing around in the case of Minnesota and other places, that's not necessarily a badge of honor. It's not necessarily a badge of dishonor. Point of personal honor. privilege, Mr. Chairman. I think that you that's an implication clearly. that members who came out against this were doing it for money. I have not received any Mr. money Mr. from Mr. any Indian tribes, and I'm offended Mr. Mr. by the gentleman's insinuation. Regular, regular, order. Order. Right. regular order has been called for. The gentleman will proceed. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Mr. Sauter, I do not impugn your regular integrity, order. and I would appreciate it if you don't impugn mine. Mr. Barrett, I was going to say on the record that you clearly explained a logical reason for your position the other day. We do not have that information, all the others, and Mr. Burton, the chairman of our committee, has been impugned by your side. And, and I they are not here to defend themselves. Mr. I, Gunderson is not here to I defend themselves. I did not themselves. accuse them of Regular anything, order. and you cannot defend them because you don't know whether no, that's a fact. No, but I don't. Parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Either. Chairman. I have been very disturbed by the, uh, the information we've heard today, but I want to yield to Mr. Cox to uh, proceed with his line of questioning. Uh, I thank the gentleman. And uh, Mr. Scabine, I'd like to return to the document that you and I were discussing before the break. It's Exhibit 321. <coughs> The date of that memo that you wrote is June 30, and it says, our tentative conclusion is that the record permits us to make a finding that a gaming establishment at that location will not be detrimental to the surrounding community. So at June 30, your tentative conclusion was that the record permits a finding that a gaming establishment, the dog track at Hudson, the casino, would not be detrimental to the surrounding community. As a result, you stated in the same memo, uh, you're going to be using a different legal ground to deny the application, and that is Section 465, not Section 20. Section 465, because it, uh, as you've just testified, uh, gives the Secretary of the Interior unfettered discretion, uh, doesn't really require much explanation, uh, and it specifically does not require that uh, you find one way or the other on the issue of uh, 
any detriment to the community. Uh, are you aware, as we sit here today, that um, that sort of state of play of things uh, was communicated uh, to the White House? No. Even as we sit here today, you have no way of knowing, you've not heard it said that uh, there was a report back, for example, by Heather Sibison uh, to the White House? No. Are you aware of any contacts between Heather Sibison and the White House involving this matter? Uh, I was not aware of any such contacts. Are you now? Uh, well, I think that there were some emails or whatever that were uh, and those would be contacts, me, uh, but, right? I'm, uh, and, but I'm, you know, unless you can show me the document. No, I, I, I'm asking you whether you're aware that Heather Sibison was contacting the White House on this matter, specifically uh, an assistant to Harold Ickes. I was not aware of it at the time. No, no, no. Are you aware now? Not necessarily, unless I see the documents. That I know that some are you documents. Are any were contacts? But I think there are some documents that were shown to me during my depositions, and there were many documents shown to me. Uh, that would have indicated such. But again, Mr. Cox, I think that Ms. Sibison is sitting back here. If you have any question no, I have about questions about what you know. Well, I, I certainly did not know of any such contact at the time. No, you're asking, yeah, I'm asking a different question than you're answering. I'm asking what you know as you sit here as a witness testifying I think that if you want to show me a document to, 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 uh, of w and to ask me whether I've seen this document during my deposition and it was presented to me by counsel. But it's your I'm testimony today under oath that you do not know as we sit here today, that Heather, Heather Sibison was at any time in the course Mr. of this Cox, matter. Mr. Cox, he has testified. Counsel, I'm in the process of putting a question. Mr. Cox, you, you have May put, I the, put question the question before you state your objection. The, the counsel uh, will let the gentleman answer the question. You can confer with your client any time you want to, but he's the one that's uh, testifying here today, not you. I, You're I, not under oath, sir. I understand that, Mr. Chairman, but he has some so, rights not, sir, to, not to have these well, questions you, continually you put to him. He has testified in the past on this. You can, you can, you can confer this. with your client, but your client is the one that's testifying, and I'll be the judge of whether or not the, uh, the uh, gentleman's being badgered. Now, it appears to the chair that he's not trying to answer the question. And what Mr. Cox is trying to do is get him to give a direct answer. That's all he's asking. P point of order, the Mr. Gen Chairman. The gentleman will state his point of order. This time will not be taken away from Mr. Cox's time. The gentleman will state his point of order. As I recall, the president of the Ollie North hearing, the attorney uh, was uh, not uh, required to be a potted plant when his uh, client's interests were at stake. And I think that if the attorney has something to say that, res that with re respect to his client's rights, he has a, he, uh, he's here for that purpose, and we ought to... I respect that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I... Just, just one second. According to House, according to our counsel, House Rule 2K3 of the House Rules sta states clearly that he can confer with his counsel, but he's the one that should, uh, should answer. And I don't know what they did in the Alley North's case, and I'm not sure the rules of the Senate or the rules of the independent counsel at that time were the same as what we have in the House, but we're going to adhere to the House rules, Mr. Waxman. The House rules were in effect when you allowed David Wang's attorney to testify on behalf of his client's interests. The chair has ruled, Mr. Cox. You may Thank continue. You. And, and with respect to counsel, uh, if you have an objection to a question I put, uh, I, I'm certain the chair is willing to entertain it, and I personally am willing to withdraw or restate the question. I only ask of you that you permit me to finish asking the question before you interpose an objection. Is that fair? Uh, thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Scabine, I'm just trying to, having had this conversation with you, understand what is your testimony today as you appear before us under oath. Is it your testimony today that you are unaware uh, of any contacts between <coughs> Heather Sibison and uh, the White House, uh, in particular an assistant to Harold Dickey's in, in the course of this matter? As I've stated before, I recall uh, seeing during my, depo my two depositions, which went together for close to 13 hours, uh, numerous documents that were uh, submitted to Congress. Some of them uh, may have been documentation between the uh, White House and the Secretary's office, uh, because, but because I'm under oath, I would like to be able to 
to, to be presented with the document to see if I have seen, and I've seen thousands of documents here, uh, uh, if I've seen that at some point. Uh, well, the only thing I can testify today is that I did not see any such documents at the time of the Hudson Duck Track application. Yes, I'm trying to get at what you know today. Uh, and let's, uh, in the brief time we have, and I can come back in a subsequent round and pick up with uh, Exhibit 317. 317? Mm -hmm. Exhibit 317 is a White House memorandum, and it recounts uh, what Heather Sibison told the White House. Heather Sibison, this is, I spoke with Heather, Heather Sibison regarding the status of the Wisconsin dog track announcement. Interior will make an announcement in the next two weeks. At that time, they are 95% certain that the application will be turned down. Uh, the memo also says she stated that they will probably decline without offering much explanation because of their discretion in this matter. And I want to get your uh, uh, understanding of the way that uh, the law works, Section 465. Is it true that if you use Section 465 and not Section 20, you don't have to explain as much about what you're doing? I think that's correct. Okay, my time has expired. I thank you. Time has expired. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you, you need Mr. a break right now? Mr. Scabine needs Maybe a short, short. break. Uh, okay, five minutes, all right? Plenty. The we'll, committee will break for five minutes. Stand in recess for five minutes. Committee will come to order. Ms. Norton, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there are um, two kinds of, of contacts that have been discussed here, and the mixture could prove very con confusing. One is, of course, congressional contacts. You could call them political. And then their White House contacts, you could call them political. I want to associate my myself with the remarks of, of Mr. Lantos that the congressional contacts and political contacts ought to be understood uh, as the usual way in which members of Congress do business. If they hadn't given the community uproar, in this case, uh, they would, I, it seems to me, have been guilty either of ignorance or of representational malpractice. No one has alleged that those contacts were improper. They certainly didn't involve campaign contributions, and that, of course, is what the subject matter of this hearing is. Now, I have the deposition from Ms. Sibison, who I believe is here. And since, um, on the other side, you have been repeatedly questioned about White House uh, 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 inquiries, uh, I, I note that <coughs> uh, in Ms. Sibison's uh, deposition, she was specifically asked about this. Is it your recollection that Jennifer O'Connor uh, was merely making a status inquiry into the application? That was my understanding, yes. And it wasn't that the White House was giving its opinion on the application, correct. Or dictating the outcome, she expressed no opinion as to the outcome and made no requests regarding the outcome. Mr. Chairman, I, I would ask unanimous consent that Ms. Sibison be invited to testify so that we can really explore what the White House contacts were at this time or at a later time, since that has tended to be of special interest uh, to uh, the members who are here today. Ms. Norton, were you making an inquiry of the chair? Yes, I'm making an inquiry. We have the deposition of the lady in question, and uh, uh, we already have our schedule set for the day, so we, we won't be able to do that, but we do have her deposition, <laughs> which will be entered in the record, or has been entered in the record. Yeah. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I raise it only because this witness who, uh, who has testified that no contacts were made to him has been repeatedly asked about such contacts, so I'm trying to break through that. Uh, I want, my line of question really goes to how these decisions are made and whether they are made on the basis of precedent. Because while the concern here has been about uh, uh, off reservations and how it affects the particular state involved, as a member of Congress, I'm, I'm interested in how the president here would apply to the rest of the country. First of all, are you required to follow precedents, or can you make these decisions as you see fit on, on the basis of whatever information you have before you? Does the, what the information, does the, the decision you make with respect to a particular state uh, have any relevance if a similar issue comes up with respect to another jurisdiction? The um, um, determinations on land acquisition in trust are made on a case-by-case -case basis. Sorry? The, 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 the determinations on land acquisition in trust for gaming are made on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, I'm, I'm sure if, in fact, um, well, let, let me ask you this. Have off-reservation, um, has off-reservation gaming generally been approved? There has been, um, to my knowledge, only one uh, off-reservation uh, gaming acquisition that has gone through the whole process, including the governor's concurrence, and that is the acquisition of a site in, um, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, for the Forest County Potawatomi Indian tribe in 1990. So it would be very unusual uh, for a reservation to be able to find some place somewhere and say, I want to go there, even though it's many miles from my reservation. That would be very unusual in your experience and in the experience of the Interior Department. It, it's, uh, that's right. It's not, I think we have had overall with Hudson a total of nine other uh, proposals that have come to Washington. And there's a reason why it would be very unusual. Uh, because essentially what you're doing is not, not operating on your reservation, but if I may use the metaphor on the reservation of some other community that is not even close to your community in this case. And so since this, since this territory goes into trust, it would be taken off of the tax rolls, except insofar as you were able to negotiate taxes. It would be taken off of the, uh, it, it, it could not be used for residential purposes, for industrial purposes, for community development purposes. You can go someplace hop many miles away and say to this community, hey, I choose you. You know, we're near where my reservation is, where I have a, have a, have a, have a right to be, and I want to be where you are because you got some folks who would come uh, in order to enrich my community. Is, that, is, 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 is the result there that this community would lose access to this land for its own uses and its own purposes? That's correct. Uh, as somebody who has had to live with a, a payment in lieu of taxes, uh, uh, I'm interested in the, fa in, in the notion that at one point, this negotiated pilot payment in lieu of taxes was negotiated at $5 million and thereafter was negotiated at $1 million. Uh, does that mean that a community has to simply take whatever it can get in the negotiating process and is not entitled to be fully embursed for whatever land is taken off the tax rolls? The, um, um, the tribes negotiate with uh, their communities on these matters, and we're, we're not involved in those negotiations. And so that's a matter of negotiation only? Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Generally, this time has uh, expired. Mr. Snowbarger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in regard to my colleagues' questions about precedence, obviously it must have been important to you in, in uh, Exhibit 316, you were asking, um, I believe you were asking uh, David Etheridge, Kevin Meisner, and Troy Woodward, uh, are you aware of any cases addressing the Secretary's authority to refuse to take land into trust? Uh, we want to avoid making the, the determination under Section 20. You, 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 that's been called to your attention before, and I don't want to focus on that, but obviously you were, you were concerned about precedence as well, or you wouldn't have asked that question, I presume. Now, my understanding from your testimony that uh, you are a supponent. Uh, you are a supporter of uh, Indian gaming for economic development. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And um, 
you think that'll give uh, Indian tribes an opportunity to, to better their economic circumstances, right? That's correct. Um, we've seen through a number of different uh, exhibits today that uh, Mr. Hartman and other members of the uh, IGMS, uh, as, as well as members of the solicitor's office, had made a determination that there was not a detriment uh, and that there was a best interest. In other words, under Section 20, that uh, case could be made that the secretary should take this land into trust. Is that? No, that's incorrect. I think that the uh, uh, the best interest determination was not made, and you can um, question Mr. Hartman in the next panel. Can about I ask that. you a question? Sure. Who made the final decision? The final decision was made with Mike, by Michael Anderson, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs. He signed the letter, so he's the one that made the final decision. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. Let me get into a little different uh, angle on this. Um, when did you decide to use uh, Section 151, uh, Section 465, depending on which one we're referring to, uh, the Secretary's discretion? When did you decide to use that, uh, that argument? Um, I cannot re recall precisely when I formulated my final views on it. It was sometimes in, um, in um, late May, early June, uh, sometimes in June, so that by June 29th, my recommendation was, uh, was made. Okay. Now, it's my understanding of the procedure that the, that the uh, department used before is that you would first go through a Section 20 analysis and determine whether the two-prong test was met. Wasn't it then the department's uh, standard procedure once those, that two-prong test was met to ask for the governor's concurrence and then go through the Section 151? No, I, I don't think so. I, I think that when I came to the gaming office, that's one of the questions that I asked, and I asked uh, Larry Scrivener on my staff at the time uh, about, well, do you do the 151 before or the Section 20 before? And my understanding was that they are done concurrently. Uh, but to the extent there was some, um, uh, some confusion about that in the field, I think that my view that was formulated is that, is that it would be nonsensical to do a Section 20 before you do the Section 151. Okay. Then, then I would like to, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to have this uh, introduced into the record. It's a letter to... Uh, the Honorable Steve uh, Gunderson, one of our former colleagues, um, and it's a letter from uh, Hilda Manuel. It's dated uh, March 2nd of 1995. Without uh, objection. I believe you're having a copy handed to you. And I, I'd call your attention to the second page of that document. Uh, well, first of all, on the third page, it shows that uh, a blind carbon copy went to you. Is that correct? That's my name on there, yes. Okay, so you, you've seen this letter before. If you go back to page two, I want to start with the second full paragraph on that page and just read through this. It says the review is conducted by the IGMS office and the office of the solicitor. The purpose of the review is to determine whether the requirements of section 20 of IGRA have been adequately addressed. If the application is found to be factually documented to support a favorable determination by the secretary, Positive findings of fact on the two-part determination are prepared along with a uh, letter to the governor of the state seeking concurrence with the secretary's determination. The secretary's determination does not constitute a final decision to acquire the land and trust under 25 CFR Part 151. The decision is made after the application is found to be in compliance with 25 CFR Part 151. If gubernatorial concurrence is provided, the land may be taken into trust for gaming purposes at this point, the tribe's application is then reviewed to determine whether the criteria of 25 CFR Part 151 have been adequately addressed. To me, that letter, signed again by Hilda Manuel, indicates that the regular procedure is to go through Section 20 analysis, governor's concurrence, then Section 151. In this case, you jump from Section 20 immediately to 151 without getting the governor's concurrence or not. And uh, it seems to me that we have another uh, irregularity in the procedure here. And I'd like for you to explain to me why you didn't follow departmental procedure that had been set out, set out in a letter um, March of 1995 um, in, in response to a congressional inquiry. I think that the, um, the, uh, my views when I came to, as I said before, when I came to the gaming office is that it, was, it would, not be make, would not make much sense 
to go through the Section 20 process before you do the 151. So I don't really know what happened before I was the director of the gaming office. And frankly, if it was done that way, then it was wrong. When I came in there, to me, it seemed to, that we would not want that Indian tribes go through the Section 20 process, which essentially includes a lot of consultation, a lot of studies, and, and uh, is very lengthy, and have, get, get a government conference, and then having the secretary decide first, what he should have done first of all, is to decide whether he actually wants to take the land into trust to exercise his discretion. If you're going to do that, then, and if the secretary says no, then it, it makes well, a mockery. I, I, I don't want to be argumentative. All right. That, well, but, I, I, but, but that you, is the point, though. But you became, uh, you, you took that position in February of 1995. This is a letter which you received a copy of in March of 1995. And you say the reason you don't want to go through the Section 20 analysis is all the time and effort that would be involved in doing that. That time and effort had been put in and determinations had been made by local offices. In fact, you have a draft of an opinion, and again, it's at your request, a draft of an opinion that would allow the Secretary to determine that under Section 20 it was in the best interest of the tribe and that it was not detrimental to the communities. And my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Yeah. We'll let the witness answer, and then we'll, try. we'll move on. Well, uh, first of all, as I said before, the, the March 8th Hartman memo does not say that the, uh, the June 8th does not say that the application is in the best interest of the tribe. Um, uh, and then the uh, Gunderson letter is dated March 2nd, 1995. Uh, my determination uh, was made in June 29th, 1995. Now, how I this March 2nd was approximately a month uh, after I had uh, uh, been in the gaming office. I'm not sure that I saw this letter uh, or surname at the time it was, um, it was uh, being prepared for um, uh, Hilda Manuel's signature. Uh, but definitely by the time I uh, formulated my views in, in June, uh, uh, it is my, my position and it, it is my position now that that the Section 151 analysis has to be done before. And subsequently, we have a ch we, uh, designed a checklist uh, to guide uh, and inform uh, uh, the field on how to process land acquisitions uh, and Section 20. And it is clear from that that the Section 151 process has to be done before. Last uh, February, uh, I had a conference of all gaming coordinators uh, throughout the country in uh, uh, in the middle of February, and I think I, my direction to them was that you, if, when you process Section 20 and 151 land acquisition applications, you have to do the 151 first. Now, there is a part of 151 that you have to do at the end, and that is uh, technical items relating with uh, uh, the solicitor's office work on titles. And so there are technical features of 151 that cannot be processed before the application is actually ready to be taken into trust. Uh, but as far as the, exerts, uh, as the determining this, uh, that the secretary, well, sec the secretary determining whether he wants to take the land into trust, I think that that, that decision is fundamentally has to be made at the beginning. Mr. <laughs> Chairman, I'm just trying to suggest that yeah. one month after taking this position, uh, Mr. Uh, Scabine violated basically the policies uh, set out by Hilda Manuel in a letter to one of our colleagues, Honorable Stephen Gunderson. Uh, in, in March of 1995. Uh, whether that was his understanding or not, he was copied with that letter. He did not follow that procedure. Uh, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And um, to, to the witness, uh, how, do you, how do you pronounce your name? Skibin. Skibin, okay. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to take the questioning back to what I think is one of the central points of this whole uh, discussion we've been having in the last couple of days. And Mr. Skibin, uh, you've we've heard some testimony from you uh, today about Mr. Havanek's statement yesterday that you said that political people were the ones that turned down the application. I believe you testified that you did not say that. Is that correct? That's correct. Let me read to you Mr. Havanek's full statement which I believe goes even further than that. As quoted in the Washington Post article today, Mr. Havanick said that you told him, and I quote, look, don't blame me, we, and, and that's the career employees, uh, would have given it to you. 
It was the political people that turned you down. End of quote. Now, Mr. Havanick said that you told him not only that the political people made the decision, but that you yourself would have approved the application if it weren't for the involvement of the so-called political people. Now, his assertion that you would have approved the application or that you wanted to approve the application, uh, did you say that to Mr. Havanick? No, that would have been incorrect. So the sworn testimony we received yesterday from Mr. Havanick, who said that you would have approved the application, is simply incorrect. That's correct. I think the record stands for itself on this issue. So uh, let me make, I want to make sure I'm clear on this now, Mr. Skibin. Uh, Mr. Havanick's testimony yesterday on this issue wasn't true. Was it true or not? Well, as I've said this morning, I think that um, uh, Mr. Havanick um, may have misconstrued something I said. Okay, uh, now, I, I don't want to accuse anyone. I, I understand here, that. Uh, I understand. I just, I'm just trying to get okay. to a point here. Now, Mr. Havanick also told us yesterday uh, that you said it wasn't uh, just you who would have approved the application if it hadn't been for the so-called political people, but that you were speaking in effect, for all career employees present at the meeting. Now, let me repeat again what he told us with an emphasis on this new point. He told us that you said, quote, look, don't blame me. We would have given it to you. It was the political people that turned you down, end of quote. We've already discussed now that Mr. Havnick's testimony as uh, to your feelings uh, was not true. Now let me ask you about his assertion that you were speaking for other career employees at the department. Did you tell Mr. Havnick that other career employees would have approved the application if it hadn't been for political interference? No, that, that, that's not true. So on this point, Mr. Havnick was incorrect. That's correct. So to sum all this up, uh, Mr. Havanick was incorrect about three things. First, he was incorrect when you said that the final decision was made because of politics. Second, he was incorrect uh, when you, that you said that you yourself would have recommended approval of the application. And third, he was incorrect that you said that other career people on the staff would have recommended approval of the application. Is that right? That's right. And with regard to all these points, uh, it's remarkable, but you haven't said that uh, Mr. Havanick was lying uh, or whether he was just mistaken, but you know he was incorrect. Is that? Yes. Thank you. I, Thank you. Maybe, no, further, um, no further questions. I'll yield back the balance of my time. Or I'll, I'll, excuse me, I'll yield to Mr. Barrett. I'm, can I make one point? I maybe he didn't understand what I was saying, maybe by Take uh, Osage, Oklahoma accent was more than you could get to it. I don't know. I don't know. I, there's got to be a reason. Well, you're being very generous. Uh, I, I, you know, it's, it's also on the apathic Very, very quickly, if I could. Uh, it's unfortunate that Hilda Manuel is not here to, to talk about her letter. We should note for the record that we did request that you be able to testify here. That request was denied. Um, I would also note, however, that the January 23, 1992 denial of the Santee Sioux Tribal Council's application um, appears to me at least to be a denial based on Section 465 and Section 20. Um, both and, and I would infer, and maybe would, would I'm incorrect. Would the gentleman yield? Um, the gentleman I don't yield? have the time right now, but if, if, if the gentleman, if the chair would give me more time, I'd be happy to. Uh, but well, if, if I'm recalling correctly, the, the governor did give a non-concurrence in that situation uh, that you're talking about. But what I'm saying is that the letter, I'm looking at the letter here, and the language appears to me to be both 465 language and And, and, and the language of the letter 20. also indicates the governor's non-concurrence with taking the land into trust. The governor of Iowa. I understand. That's yeah. the state in which the land was located. Yeah. Um, the, the other point, very quickly, is uh, as we look at, at 
Hilda Manuel's letter, she's talking about the decision to acquire a land in trust. She doesn't talk about it being a three-step process if it's a denial. I mean, I certainly understand if it's an approval, you may want to have the, the first decision, um, then the governor's decision, then the taking into trust decision. So, of course, we'll never know the answer to that because she's unable to testify. Thank you. Thank you. I want to make one point. I want to make one point that the, uh, with respect to the 151 process, that the uh, uh, area director's transmittal of the 151 part on April 20th, 1995, uh, to, uh, to us indicates that the uh, uh, tribes, the three tribes specifically requested that the 151 process be completed at that point. So we. Uh, could, you, could you repeat that, please? I missed that. If you could just repeat it, I, please. I think that, that the, the uh, area offices. 151 determination was transmitted to our office on April 20th, 1995, and I think it was at the, the tribe's request. The tribes requested both decisions be made simultaneously. Right. Oh, okay. Mr. Micah. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield to Mr. Shattuck. I thank my colleague and thank the chairman. Uh, Mr. Cabine, uh, your t prepared statement here before the committee today indicates that you did discuss this decision uh, this subject with civil servants in the BIA uh, and the solicitor's office as well as with secretarial appointees. Those secretarial appointees would include both John Duffy and Heather Sibison. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Now, your statement goes on to say that you didn't have any contact with various people, including the White House, and you didn't. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. But you don't know what contact they had with the White House, do you? No, I don't. You, for example, don't know that the White House appeared to know of your decision and of the basis of your decision the exact same day that you made it? Yeah. Right. But at the time of the Hudson Duck Rec application, I was not aware of, of uh, White House contact. So you didn't know that the White House knew of that decision the same day you made it? You referred to June 29th as being the date on which you made your decision. But in I fact, made my recommendation. Your recommendation, okay. But in fact, you had already made a decision as of June 6th, hadn't you? I refer you to Exhibit 316, which is an email from you uh, to Dave Etheridge, Kevin Meisner, and Troy Woodward, in which you say the letter will decline to take the land into trust, and then you say pursuant to Part 50, 151, which is the discretionary authority. So. In that sense, you'd already said the letter will decline. The decision in your mind had been made, right? Yes, I, as I testified earlier today, I think it was either in late May, early June at some point. And you go on in that, that you go on in that email to say, we want to avoid making a determination <laughs> under Section 20 of IGRA. You wanted to avoid making a determination under Section 20 of IGRA because you and the other professionals at BIA had already decided that you couldn't sustain a decision turning down this application under IGRA, hadn't you? Not necessarily. It's pretty evident through all of these email that every single professional staffer at the Department of the Interior said, we can't turn this down under Section 20 of IGRA, and I can walk you through that and show it to you if we need to, and that every single political appointee said, no, we've got to turn it down on that basis. Uh, I think that the Hartman memo was uh, uh, signed on June 8, 1995. Two days later, the Hartman memo comes out and says, we can't turn this down. Indeed, we can't find there is a detriment to the community under IGRA in this particular instance, and therefore we ought to approve it. That's two days later. So that's one memo that says, um, we can't turn this down under Section 20 of IGRA, at least not on detriment to the community, right? Uh, the Hartman memo, I think, and he can testify to that, essentially concluded that there was uh, not enough, in his opinion, evidence of detriment to justify a finding of detriment under Section 20. Therefore, you couldn't turn it down. Excuse me? Therefore, you couldn't turn it down under Section 20. But we, couldn't, we wouldn't be able to make that uh, determination. Well, why did you write, we want to avoid making a determination under Section 20? Well, I did not want to um, uh, use Section 20 because I did not want to um, 
set a precedent, I guess, uh, at the time. I didn't think that, that uh, we should use Section 20. And I think that the, um, the um, um, Hartman memo uh, gave me uh, concerns about reliance on Section 20, as I've testified before. Well, on June 30, um, you had sent your first draft to Heather Sibbinson, and she sent you an email, and it looks to me like 11.50 in the morning, it's Exhibit 322, in which she says, we may, want, may not want to include in our rationale the opposition of other tribes. If you look then at Exhibit 321, you respond by email saying that you can defend the reference to other tribes in the context of a discretionary decision. At that point in time, you still wanted to base it on the director's discretion and not on uh, Section 20 of IGRA. The last year in the sequence of these emails, I'm sorry. Well, I've just given you the number of them. Yeah. June 30th, Exhibit two, 322. They do go backwards. 322 was sent earlier than 321. I think that that might be helpful. They're both sent the same day, one sent earlier in the day, one sent later in the day. I can't even read this. But yeah, but on what? 6:30. Okay. That's 7:04 p.m. Okay. I'm going to run out of time. All right. Um, you clearly at that point still want to defend it based on the, the director's discretion. There are two more exhibits: Exhibit 326, 327.1, and 327.2. In every single one of those, and unfortunately I'm not going to get the time, every single professional within the Department of Interior says we cannot sustain this decision based on Section 20 of IGRA. We don't have the basis to do it. And in the final one, it says that, number one, you rewrite the memo based on instructions from Heather Sivison and John Deppey, the two political ones, and then you write a separate email that says you hope that when you rewrote it, you met their desire. The rewriting uh, added back into the decision, uh, IGRA. And then, I believe Kevin Meisner writes you and says, there's no way in Exhibit 327-2 that we can sustain this decision based on IGRA. Um, and therefore, we have to base it on this, the discretion of the, the Secretary. If you can find in there a single shred of evidence that shows to me that any um, line level um, officer in the Department of Interior said we could sustain it under Section 20. I wish you would do that. And alternatively, uh, if you can point out I mean, the pressure that was being brought to bear on you to change the decision and to base it in part uh, on IGRA rather than solely on the director's discretion, I don't think you can find a shred of documentation in that anywhere in, in what you found. Uh, anywhere in these emails, it's very clear that everyone down the line said, we can't sustain this decision under IGRA, and everyone up the line said, we can't base it solely on the director's discretion. Why is that? You, uh, gentleman from uh, California? Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, please, can I please. respond? Yeah, let, uh, I, sure, you're welcome. I'm going to ask unanimous consent that Mr. Shattuck, uh, who would otherwise get five more minutes, but he's run a little bit over, that he have uh, three more minutes, and then we conclude the, so we can not have another if, you, if the gentleman would like to well, have I, some more time. Uh, I'm on Mr. Micah's time. I, I know, you're entitled to have five more minutes. Do you want five more minutes? Sure. Well, I'm suggesting that rather than have inter interruption, that you'd be given three more minutes now and not take your five minutes after we go. Well, let's I don't mind the interruption. I'll take let's the preside, five Let's preside, proceed into the order. You have the time, Mr. Waxman, five minutes. Well, I, I pass right now and reserve my time. Mr. Shadding. <laughs> Here we are. Now I've got five minutes. Thank you. And Mr. Skabeen, <laughs> we left it where Mr. Skabeen wanted to respond, so I will give him a chance. Uh, this will not come let, out of, I think Mr. Skabeen never had a chance this, to respond to my last this question. This will not come out of Mr. Shaddix's time. Mr. Skabeen, you may respond, then we'll start Mr. Shaddix's time. Because we said he'd let, we'd let him respond at the end. Fine. I, I think that to um, decide why the, uh, those above me uh, changed the decision in the way they did, change the recommendation and in the way they did, um, you would have to ask them um, the reasons for the change. The, uh, I want to point out that the, the ultimate conclusion, the ultimate outcome, not to take the land into trust, was not changed. But the reasons for the decision as the rationale w were changed, and uh, I'm not prepared to discuss uh, 
the reasons that others uh, thought should go in there. Well, you've called this Michelle. clearly your decision. Uh, and in point of fact, you've just pretty well acknowledged that they changed the basis of the decision. And if you have trouble with that, let's look at Exhibit 326. Mr. Shattuck, I'm, I, if your question is premised on his having said it was his decision, I'm going to object to the question. He has not testified it was his decision. It was a recommendation. Okay, it was his recommendation. I think, quite frankly, he has been quoted in the common press as saying that he was the bureaucrat that made this decision. But we'll, well leave that, that that, if that's the case, I want to clarify the record. Uh, I, as a GS-15 uh, civil servant, did not have the authority to make the final decision. Okay. And what I did is, is simply make a recommendation to Let's my superior. Let's look at Exhibit 326, if we could. It's an email from you um, to a series of people, uh, but it says, I have left on Tona's desk the redrafted version of the Hudson letter per Duffy and Heather's instructions. So you redrafted the decision on or about July 8th per instructions from John Duffy and Heather Sibison. Is that right? That's correct. I think that I came back from uh, vacation and I uh, went to gather my uh, documents for my Denver trip and I found in my box a marked up um, uh, an edited um, uh, version of my draft and I ministerially incorporated those changes in there and then left them for Tona, my secretary. Okay, and then if you would refer to Exhibit 327-1. On that date, in that particular document, you're sending an email to Kevin Meisner with a carbon copy to Tracy, I'm sorry, to Troy Woodward. And in it you say, I hope it, meaning the redrafted decision letter, meets Duffy's directions. Is that right? That's correct. That's what okay. it says and here. And then on the bottom half of that same exhibit, there's an email uh, from Kevin Meisner, uh, I believe back to you in which this whole discussion of the basis of the decision goes on. And reading the bottom half of that, he says, why are we changing our analysis to deny gaming under Section 20? I thought after the Friday meeting that everyone, except Duffy, who was not yet consulted, agreed that there was not enough evidence supporting a finding of, quote, detriment to the surrounding communities under Section 20 and therefore, we would decline to acquire the land under Section 151. Once again, we have another leveled person in your office, a lawyer, I guess, at uh, the solicitor's office, saying, we can't do this under Section 20. We've got to do it just under the Secretary's discretion. Is that right? Um, I, I think that the um, email is not directed to me. It's directed to Troy Woodward. OK. But you read it. Um, Thank you. You read what it says? <laughs> Now let's talk about Troy Woodward. We go to the next exhibit, which is Exhibit 327-2. And in that, Troy Woodward expresses his shock and disappointment um, in, a, in an email, I guess, that was back to, uh, by Troy Woodward or back to Troy Woodward. Uh, apparently, Bob has, uh, Anderson did review the letter late Monday. I checked with him Tuesday, and he thought that since Duffy wanted Section 20 wanted the Section 20 finding so badly that we would the letter, let the letter go through. I still think that we're, there was not enough evidence for a Section 20 finding of detriment. It seems to me that every single person who touched this, other than John Duffy and Heather Sibison, said, we cannot sustain this decision under IGRA, so we better do it based on the Secretary's discretion. And here they respond that John Duffy desperately wanted to have IGRA back in there and not base it solely on the Secretary's discretion. That's pretty evident, isn't it? Um, I mean, you, you know, you're, you make whatever inferences you want from this email. That it's, this is not my email. Uh, I want to point out, though, that well, Bob Anderson... I asked Anderson, you at the outset if, in fact, you believe the decision could be sustained based on IGRA and, and asked you if it isn't true that the emails document that all of the department people, other than the political appointees, said, we cannot sustain this decision based on IGRA, and, it wa and it therefore we should do it based on the Secretary's discretion. And it was John Duffy and Heather Sibison, but principally John Duffy, who said, we cannot base this solely on the Secretary's discretion. We have to base it on IGRA. And a compromise was struck, and both were put into the letter, weren't they? Um, I think that Bob Anderson, who was the um, 
associate solicitor uh, for Indian Affairs uh, uh, should also be uh, asked about his uh, legal opinion. The issue here is whether legally uh, there was enough evidence of detriment under Section 20. And uh, obviously, um, uh, Mr. Duffy and uh, Mr. Anderson thought that there was. I want to guess, I'll ask you one last question. I find it fascinating that on the day that you wrote um, to your lawyers saying, we do not want to base it on IGRA, you asked them if there was any basis for basing it on or any case law that would support basing it on the Secretary's discretion. That was June 6, 1995. I find it fascinating that on that same day, David Myers, uh, an employee of Mr. Ickes, writes a memo, memo to Jennifer O'Connor, also a, an, a, an employee of Mr. Ickes, or, or who worked for Mr. Ickes, and says that you would, in fact, turn it down, um, and you would turn it down based on the, on the Secretary's discretion, the exact same reason found in your email to your two lawyers. Do you have any comment on that? No, I have no comment on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time has expired. Mr. Gentlemen, Chairman. My time has expired. Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Scabine, all the people here are members of Congress. We are, ask our staffs to do drafts for us. Perhaps it's to respond to a constituent letter. And the recommendation could be to take a position with the following arguments. It could, could then often the draft would come to me or my administrative assistant, and he might say, well, change the, the backup arguments for the conclusion, but keep the conclusion. Uh, all, all you've been asked about is the same circumstance. You came up with a recommendation. You would have based it on different arguments. It was a recommendation that went on up the command, chain of command, and they came back and suggested a different argument that you thought was too confining, but nevertheless, that that was what they were suggesting. Is this the situation that we're talking about here? Yes, that's correct. I, I, I don't, and I find, I, I find it sort of amazing that we're going over and over and over on this issue um, since, as the chairman pointed out, the reason we're holding these hearings is to see whether there was any kind of political corruption in the decision. The decision you recommended was a decision that was uh, 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 the final result. There was no change. All we had were some arguments as, as for different, argu uh, different basis for the very same decision. Yesterday, they spent a lot of time with members arguing this was the right decision, but uh, th th there's something wrong with Interior's um, reaching that decision. Today, no one's arguing with your decision. They seem to be arguing with the basis for your decision. The fact of the matter is a decision was made it appears to most of us that it was made conscientiously by you as a civil servant on the merits. And they keep on asking questions about emails and documents by uh, Heather Sibison or Hilda Manuel. When they, you keep on saying they ought to ask them. Well, the fact of the matter is both of those individuals gave a deposition and the committee didn't like the deposition because it didn't corroborate their point of view. So even though we thought they ought to testify directly on what they meant when they wrote these different email or memos, we're being denied the opportunity to ask them those questions. But I gather, when all is said and done, what they were su suggesting to you, or others were suggesting to you, was a different way to frame the same decision, a different basis for it, but the same decision nevertheless. Is that where we are? Um, yes, I think that, uh, first of all, that my, my, my June 29th, um, Memorandum was a recommendation letter. My right. Recommendation. What, what I do find amazing is 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 that I'm asked to comment about others' emails and views, and and I certainly would prefer sitting over here and having these people who wrote these these emails and and made those changes be here answering your questions. Well, uh, we thought that would have made a lot more sense, and we requested that they be permitted to testify, but we were turned down, even though uh, Hilda Manuel is is uh, the one who could answer not only the question on the merits, but the very question about whether the secretary had, had exerted any political influence. In fact, she could clarify the fact from her deposition that there was no political influence by the secretary. The secretary said, let the career people decide it. Now, I guess when the decision's finally made, it's under the aegis of the secretary. 
It's the, the decision was made by Deputy Assistant Secretary Michael Anderson. Yeah, but when it's to signed off on, it's the Secretary's decision, just like it's the President's administration, even though he didn't cite everything within his administration. Oh, yes, that's right, yes. I, I, I want to yield to uh, Mr. Barrett. Yeah, if you would yield, please. Uh, just, in, in, we're getting near the end. I want to make sure I understand this. And you, fortunately for you, we're getting near the end. You mentioned earlier, I thought, that that the department, the secretary, had approved an off-reservation gaming site um, for the Potawatomi in Milwaukee, in my district. Is that is that correct? That is correct. Aside from that one, where else has the secretary approved an off-site, off-reservation gaming facility in the United States? Um, aside from that. The, uh, and that also would be better answered by uh, Ms. Manuel, uh, who was my predecessor in the Indian Gaming, as the Indian Gaming Director. But before my watch, I think the Secretary had approved an acquisition for the Sault Ste. Marie tribe in downtown Detroit, Michigan. Uh, but the governor uh, of the state of Michigan did not concur in that determination. Uh, in my watch, we um, forwarded a, sanction, a positive Section 20 determination uh, to the governor of the state of Washington uh, on a, uh, a piece of land owned by the Kalispell tribe of Indians in Hairway Heights, Washington. Uh, and that um, um, determination is still pending with the governor. Um, there may be others um, where the uh, secretary made a positive determination. Uh, I can't recall it offhand. Uh, but in any case, there, the Forest County Potawatomi one was the only one where the, the governor actually concurred. Okay, thank you very much. Start the clock on me, William. Secretary Babbitt indicated that uh, the decision was made by an 18-year career veteran. And uh, Michael Anderson, I believe, is a political appointee. And uh, the only other one that fits is, is you. And you're saying you're not the one who made the final decision. Well, uh, the final decision was signed by Michael Anderson. But Secretary Babbitt said it was an 18-year career employee that made the final decision. I made the recommendation, the okay. initial recommendation. Right. Under Section 151, Secretary Babbitt or his designee is the one that has to make the final decision. Is that correct? Under Section 151? Uh, the, the, uh, that's right. Okay. Now, uh, the thing that, when, from my perspective, and I'm trying to clarify this in my mind, when you cut through all of this, Mr. Duffy, Ms. Cabine, and others were uh, involved in the, uh, in the process. Mr. Duffy was the chief counsel to the secretary. He was the counselor to the secretary. Counsel to the secretary. And therefore, he had some influence in the decision-making process with the secretary because he advised him on legal matters. Mr. Collier was the chief of staff. Now, through all this, everyone's been saying there was no political influence, no chicanery. But shortly after this, both Mr. Duffy and Mr. Collier, I want to go back to this, left and went to work for a law firm, and they represent the tribe that benefited from the decision. That same tribe and the other tribes that were interested have contributed somewhere between, between three and $350,000. And Mr. Collier, who was the chief of staff, personally delivered a check from the Shakopee's to the Democrat National Committee for somewhere between fifty dollars and $100,000. Now, you know, maybe there was no political influence, but it sure stinks. It sure smells like it. I don't understand it. No political influence. The process is all the emails and everything goes out the window and, and uh, the, you make all kinds of excuses and reasons why this was uh, disapproved, even though those people who had, who were making $6,000 a year for the women and children and the men in that tribe are still suffering while the tribe that's making $400,000 a year for every man, woman, and child who makes big contributions continue to benefit. And uh, there was no political influence. But we do know this. There was between 300 and 350,000, maybe even a half a million dollars given from the tribes that benefited to the DNC. We do know that Mr. Duffy and Mr. Collier, both leaders in the Department of the Interior, 
have real nice cushy jobs with the law firm and that they both represent the Shackleby Indian tribes and maybe those other tribes. We also know that Mr. Collier, the Chief of Staff for the Secretary of Interior, personally delivered a check from the Shackleby's for fifty dollars to $100,000. Now maybe, maybe there wasn't any political influence. Maybe they just gave that money out of the goodness of their heart. Maybe they just gave those jobs to those people because they liked them, not because they had influence at the Department of Interior when the decision was made. But you know, it sure does smell. I yield back the balance of my time. Do you have any more time you'd like to have? If I could just take a few moments, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman's recognized. Just to follow up on what the Chairman has just said, it's interesting because we're concentrating on the people that were involved that eventually went out to law firms and got jobs. But uh, I think the public should know and the record should know that uh, Mr. Havernick uh, contributed sizable amounts of money to candidates, both the governor. Uh, he retained uh, one of the uh, most prestigious lobbyists who was a law school classmate of the secretary and had three occasions to meet with the secretary, Mr. Eckstein, who obviously didn't come cheaply. He uh, 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 partook with uh, individuals in Florida, Mr. Berlin, who was one of the most sizable uh, campaign uh, raisers for the Democratic Party in Florida. Uh, so that uh, I see the read this, that yes, there were campaign funds made on both sides. There were jobs obtained uh, by people uh, who were connected uh, either through school ties to the secretary or eventually went off to law firms that represented uh, well-to-do clients. But the, the best way I read it is uh, Mr. Burton would like us to assume the post hoax fallacy after this, therefore, because of this. And I don't think uh, the facts presented in this case do support that. I think the facts support that a 18-year professional was charged with making the final recommendation and conclusion. And as you testified, you wrote that up. The only uh, uh, input was, of Mr. Duffy was to clean up some legal questions in your recommendation, not changing the substance of it. And then as a matter of process in form, a deputy secretary put his signature to the decision, but basically the decision was prepared on your analysis, your recommendation, and that's the major part of the decision. And your testimony that uh, you having prepared that several weeks before any of these contributions occurred or any activities occurred, you went on vacation, came back, polished the final decision, sent it up, and that was the decision. And that if they wanted to exclude for total purposes, they would have used section 465, which would have denied the right of appeal, a court case, or any other methodology, just the full discretion of the secretary to say no, but in fact you relied on a different section, section 20, and uh, the aggrieved parties have uh, exercised their right for reappeal and a court matter to have the issue tried, and that's where the process is. And for all intents and purposes, uh, the department acted as it should have acted, came up with a decision, but they're always winners and losers, and the losers aren't very happy with the decision. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, yield to me. Yes. You know, the chairman may say this all stinks because he wants it to stink, but it's hard to understand why we have hearings when you've sat here patiently answering the questions over and over and over again that your recommendation was based on the merits without political interference. Uh, and uh, those who could give further information that, that would confirm that same point of view weren't permitted to testify. You know, it, I, I know I know the chairman wants a scandal because that's the purpose of this committee at this point. It's not to get truth. It's to scandalize people in the Democratic administration. But when you have witnesses, the chairman calls, and the witness don't could corroborate what he wants, uh, his pre-confirmed uh, conclusion, I don't see why we spend all this time uh, in these hearings and um, why your time has been taken up from other uh, responsibilities. But I, I very much thank you for your participation. Uh, I, I do want to ask you one question. I guess because we talked about, your attorney raised the issue as well about your being badgered in the deposition. Was today's hearing uh, much uh, better for you than the deposition that you faced uh, by our uh, committee in uh, uh, prior to this meeting today? 
I have no complaints with today's hearing. Uh, and if, if I want to, can I make a statement? I, I think that what I testified to is that as far as my recommendation and the work of the Indian Gaming Management staff is concerned, uh, those recommendations were made on the record and there was no undue uh, influence or political shenanigans that we knew about. Uh, as far as the motives or the beliefs of others above me, I cannot really address that. Uh, the only thing I can say is that to my knowledge, uh, it seemed that uh, the, the opinions of uh, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Duffy, and Ms. Sibison and others were essentially stemming from their analysis of the merits. All you can tell us is what you know from your own experience. That's why we have you as a witness. It strikes me also how, it's, how important it is to have public hearings so that the questions are asked in public rather than these backroom private depositions where uh, witnesses can be hounded and harassed and badgered uh, and told by members of Congress, we can't get an honest answer from you when the answer isn't what they want, even though it may be the truth. Better to let the world see a hearing and a witness answer the questions as honestly and as truthfully as you did. And you were very convincing. You said what you had to say from your knowledge. You don't know about what other people might have done or thought. And no one else has uh, given us any evidence uh, uh, that uh, the decision was other than as you say it was. Thank you. Mr. Micah. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to comment sort of in closing here. I don't know if this is really a question, but uh, haven't had a chance to participate today. I just heard one of my colleagues from the other side say, say though, that uh, uh, this was an example, there were examples here of a contribution of funds uh, by Mr. Havnick uh, uh, in the governor's race and cited that, I guess, to blur the uh, issue at hand. And I recall quite vividly yesterday, Mr. Havnick, uh, outlining for the committee that his contributions uh, were actually uh, the, the, the uh, bulk of his contributions to uh, Mr. Thompson, Governor Thompson, uh, were long before any of this was uh, uh, even came to, to light. Uh, we're not talking about uh, the, the, the period in which uh, any of these funds, in, in fact, uh, uh, changed hands uh, at the time the decision was being made. It was even, it was long before uh, any of this was even conceived as a project. Uh, and it was based on his support of uh, Mr. Thompson as a candidate. Uh, then we heard the ranking member uh, try to close and say, well, what's the need for this uh, hearing? The need uh, for this hearing is the continual stonewalling by the administration and just about every department, including this agency, uh, of this committee. And this is a committee of investigation and oversight. And I have a list uh, I'd like to make a part of the record, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, of uh, uh, document production requests to the department. And in fact, uh, uh, documents were received, almost all of them, after the Senate concluded its uh, business uh, and uh, uh, only after uh, we subpoenaed uh, documents uh, uh, in December uh, that we found lacking, December 12, 1997, and the compliance uh, due date was January 2nd, uh, 1998, and many of those documents did not come to us until the, just prior to this uh, hearing. And here is a list of uh, the documents that were uh, not uh, uh, provided to this committee and the subsequent uh, stonewalling of this uh, investigations and oversight committee uh, by another agency of uh, federal government. So uh, these aren't accusations that uh, we raise. These are ac accusations that uh, have come about as a result of a discrepancy between the Secretary of uh, Interior and uh, another uh, witness. And uh, we need to get to the bottom of uh, uh, what took place uh, and we also have uh, public statements of the secretary uh, saying that uh, the decision to reject the permit, he said, and uh, was made by a bureaucrat who'd worked in Indian affairs for 18 years and was based on the department's policy 
the casino should not be allowed in communities in, that did not want them. And we've identified only one person that fits that uh, uh, description, and that's our witness here today. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. 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 Chairman, this, does Mr. My, is Mr. Micah's list a list of documents that we at the Department of the Interior have not yet provided? I think that's a list of the documents we requested, and uh, those documents uh, were not received until just recently. I believe that's oh, I, I, yes. I, and I, I, I misunderstood him. I thought department. he said he had a list of documents we had not yet. No, no, I believe, I believe the documents were received, but we didn't receive them until just recently, and that's one of the reasons why uh, we've had We're holding this hearing. Holding this and hearing. I ask that this list be made a part Without of objection. Record. Does anyone else seek recognition for this panel? Now, Mr. Scabine, we thank you for being here, and uh, we appreciate your cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. The, Chairman. The next panel uh, is uh, I invite to come to the uh, to the table: uh, Robin Yeager, Michael Anderson, and Tom Hartman. Have you stand and be sworn? <clears throat> Raise your right hand. You swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so I'll be God. I do. I see. On behalf of the committee, I welcome you here today. Uh, you're recognized, each and every one of you, to uh, make an opening statement. We'd like for you, if you could, to uh, uh, limit it to five minutes, and if it's longer than that, we'll take your uh, your the remainder for the record. We'll submit it to the, for the record. Uh, who would like to start, Mr. Anderson? Mr. Anderson, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee. My name is Michael Anderson, and I serve as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs at the U.S. Department of the Interior. I was born in Old Mulgee, Oklahoma in 1958, was a resident of Oklahoma City and Norman, Oklahoma until 1980. I am a tribal member of the Muscogee Nation. I received a degree in political science from the University of Oklahoma in 1980 and a law degree from Georgetown University Law Center in 1984. I'm a member of the District of Columbia Bar. From 1984 to 1992, I practiced law in Colorado and the District of Columbia. In 1989, I took a one-year leave of absence from the law firm McKenna and Cuneo to serve as associate counsel and later general counsel of the U.S. Senate Special Committee on Investigations, Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, which at that time was examining allegations of waste, fraud, and abuse in the Bush Interior Department. I left McKenna and Cuneo in 1992 to become executive director of the National Congress of American Indians. I left NCAI in 1993 when I was appointed by the Clinton administration to serve as associate solicitor for Indian Affairs. I served in this position until April 1995 when I became deputy assistant secretary for Indian Affairs. I am here to present testimony on the department's decision to deny the application of three Indian tribes in Wisconsin to take land into trust for gaming purposes off of their reservations. Accompanying me is Timothy Elliott, Deputy Associate Solicitor for General Law at the Department of Interior. I'm pleased to print, uh, present facts on this matter, particularly in light of the widely misreported information on the Department's processes in reaching its decision, which in my view was correct and appropriate and without any improper political influence. As an attorney and as a former General Counsel of a Special Investigations Committee, I am acutely aware of the need to protect government decisions from improper activities. I respect and honor the role of Congress in investigating allegations of improper activities 
and only ask in turn that congressional committees accord fairness in the, in those, to those from whom they seek information. The subject of this hearing is a letter I signed as Deputy Assistant Secretary on July 14, 1995 to the Tribal Chairs of the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewas, the Couturier Band of Lake Superior Chippewas, and the Skokagan Chippewa community, respectively. That letter contained the statutory and policy bases for denying the joint application of these three Chippewa tribes to take land into trust for gaming off their reservations. I have already testified in deposition before the Senate Government Affairs Committee and this committee, and wish to reemphasize here that I have no knowledge of any improper political influence or knowledge of even rumors or suggestions that campaign contributions played any role in this decision. I never had a conversation with Secretary Babbitt about the Hudson matter, nor did anyone present to me his views on, on how the Hudson matter should be decided. The then director of the Indian Gaming Management staff, George Cabine, who has just testified, supported denial of the application. I know of no staff in Washington, D.C. who believe the application should be granted outright. The application, if granted, would have caused detriment to the surrounding community, including the city of Hudson, Wisconsin, the town of Troy, Wisconsin, and the St. Croix Indian tribe. Moreover, it did not adequately address environmental impacts to the St. Croix Scenic Riverway. In closing, I want to add that I am greatly concerned that these hearings, without being kept in proper context, may lead to the perception that American Indian and Alaska Native governments and individuals should not participate in the political process because their support for federal and congressional candidates may somehow taint executive branch decisions affecting them. <clears throat> Members of the committee, that would be a tragedy. As a member of the Muscogee Creek Nation, I know American Indian and Alaska Native veterans have honorably served American combat as well as peacetime. Their efforts to defend the American way of life include the right of American Indians to vote and, like all other citizens, to make financial contributions to those candidates they support. No one doubts that this must be done in a legal and ethical way, but neither should a double standard be applied that would prevent American Indians from participating in the political process. I look forward to answering any questions you have on this matter. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee. <clears throat> My name is Tom Hartman, and I'm a financial analyst on the Indian Gaming Management Staff of the Bureau of Indian Affairs of the Department of the Interior. I am currently the acting director of the office pending the selection of a new director. I am a career civil servant and have worked at the department since September 1994, over three years. Accompanying me is Mr. Tim Elliott, Deputy Associate Solicitor for General Law at the Department of the Interior. I am here to provide testimony on my role in reviewing the application of three Chippewa tribes to acquire the St. Croix Meadows Greyhound Racing Track in trust for use in gaming. As an opening statement, I would like to correct a persistent misstatement about my analysis of the record of the application that has bothered me a great deal. I have been widely quoted in the press as recommending the approval of the application. As a professional, I think it is important to remain impartial about the final outcome of any review I perform, even as I make critical observations, some favorable, some unfavorable, on the facts under review. My recommendation to the office director in a June 8, 1995 draft memorandum was to complete the other half of a two-part determination, the consideration of whether the application was in the best interest of the tribe and its members. I did not recommend approval of the application and would not have done so until the entire review had been completed. After a complete review, I would have recommended approval only if I believe the facts supported such a recommendation. The implication that I would make a recommendation before a complete and thorough review of all the factors in a determination impugns my professionalism and impartiality. As a member of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, I am keenly aware of the important role the Bureau of Indian Affairs plays in tribal governments and in individual Indian lives. I believe that I can best support strong tribal governments by professionally performing my job in a manner that conforms to federal law and preserves the integrity of the process at the Bureau. I believe I have done so in the matter now before this committee and will continue to do so in the future. I hope my answers during this hearing will add to your understanding of the review of the application of the three affiliated tribes. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Robert Jager. I'm the superintendent for the Bureau of Indian Affairs Great Lakes Agency located in Ashland, Wisconsin. On October 12, 1993, three Wisconsin Indian tribes submitted a request to the Bureau of Indian Affairs Minneapolis Area Office to 
take land known as the St. Croix Meadows Greyhound Racing Park, located in Hudson, Wisconsin, into trust for Class Three gaming purposes. <coughs> the three tribes were the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians, the Lacoudere Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians of Wisconsin, and the Sakagan Chippewa Community of Wisconsin. By letter dated October 13, 1993, to the tribes, the acting Minneapolis area director acknowledged receipt of their request for approval of off-reservation land for gaming purposes. The tribes were advised of the requirements of Section 20 of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, which required the Secretary of Interior to consult with nearby tribes and the governor of Wisconsin. The secretary was required to determine if gaming was in the best interest of the tribes and not a detriment to the surrounding community. The letter concluded by stating that the Minneapolis Area Office would begin the consultation process with other tribes. In a follow-up letter on December 30, 1993, the area director wrote to the tribes stating that prior to taking off-reservation land into trust for gaming purposes, the secretary must complete the two-part determination required by the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. Part one, will a gaming establish, establishment on newly acquired land be in the best interest of the tribes? Part two, will a gaming establishment on newly acquired land be detrimental to the surrounding community? The area director requested that the tribes furnish additional information, including findings and supporting data on a variety of questions and issues. The tribes were to address whether the proposed gaming establishment would be in the best interest of the tribes and if it would be detrimental to the surrounding community. The tribes were also advised that the Minneapolis Area Office would be responsible for contacting the appropriate state and local officials, including officials of other nearby Indian tribes, for their opinions on the same questions and issues. The responses would be used by the area director to develop a f findings of fact and a recommendation to the Assistant Secretary, Indian Affairs of the Department of the Interior. As the superintendent of the Bureau of Indian Affairs Great Lakes Agency, I was formally requested by the area director on June 3, 1994, to begin the environmental compliance review for the trust acquisition of and addition of Class Three gaming to the existing St. Croix Meadows Greyhound Racing Park. It was my understanding that the Minneapolis Area Office would continue to be the lead office for all facets called for by the two-part determination. The agency's only role would be to determine compliance with the National Historic Preservation Act and the National Environmental Policy Act. Following this request, the agency complied with Secretarial Order 3127, which is a hazardous materials inspection of the property. We also coordinated with the State Historic Preservation Officer to determine compliance with the requirements of the, of the National Historic Preservation Act. And to comply with NEPA, the agency staff reviewed a comprehensive environmental assessment and supporting documents. We placed a public notice of availability for the environmental documents and allowed a 30-day public review so that all interested parties could comment. When the comment period ended, the agency was to prepare either a finding of no significant impact or recommend the completion of an environmental impact statement. At that point, it was the responsibility of the Minneapolis Area Director to make the decision either to accept the FONSI or to request an environmental impact statement. The agency performed the actions necessary to consider the environmental consequences of the proposed project. Our review indicated there would be no significant negative environmental impacts caused by adding Class Three gaming to a facility already engaged in a gaming operation. <clears throat> this review resulted in the issuance of a FONSI dated September 14, 1994. The FONSI was submitted to the Minneapolis Area Office and was included as part of the Area Director's review and analysis of the tribe's application. The Area Director's findings and recommendation concerning the application was subsequently sent on for consideration to the Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs on November 15, 1994. In April of 1995, the area director sent to the assistant secretary a recommendation to take the land into trust under 25 CFR Part 151 land acquisitions. Generally, the agency, the Great Lakes Agency, is not involved with the two-part determination process on an application to take off-reservation land into trust for gaming purposes. That process is the responsibility of the area director. In the case of the tribe's Hudson application, the agency was asked to share a portion of the area office's workload and conduct the environmental compliance review. This was because agency staff were familiar with the review, the, the review process due to their routine involvement with a variety of non-gaming projects which required NEPA compliance also. 
It was felt that this assistance would enable the Minneapolis Area Office to complete the overall review of the application in a more timely manner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we'll yield to our council for 30 minutes and I will take a brief part of that. Uh, Mr. Yeager, uh, is it, am I pronouncing your name right? Jager. Jager, pardon me, Mr. Jager. Uh, it's my understanding from your testimony that, uh, that they didn't see any environmental problems because you already had a dog track there, is that correct? Uh, that's correct. So there was no impediment. As far as my office is concerned. As far as yes. your office is concerned. And on up the chain, uh, they didn't find any problems from an environmental standpoint. Is that correct? Um, uh, I believe there is a, uh, a mention of some concern in Mr. Anderson's letter, his decision letter. Mr. Uh, Anderson uh, showed, uh, mentioned some concerns about the environmental problems? Uh, relating to the St. Croix Sink Riverway. Uh, that was part of the... But, but, but your office found no problems. Uh, that's right. Okay. Mr. Anderson, what problems did you find? The major effect uh, that we found was the environmental assist assessment didn't measure the impact of the St. Croix uh, National Scenic Riverway, which is a half mile from the casino. That uh, information came from the Indian Gaming Management staff, and I believe in the record is a uh, memorandum from Ned Slagle, who's the environmental protection specialist in that office, who made that conclusion. Well, um, if, if I could cite just one sentence. Sure. His, uh, fact, he says, the fact that, there were, that the nearby riverway has received a spe special designation was not revealed in the environmental document which had been submitted in connection with other documents in support of the proposed casino. Mm -hmm. So basically he found that, that that had not been identified as a problem. Well, I guess you have the environmental experts at the local level saying it met the criterion that they thought it should. And then when it went up to the level you're talking about, it was turned down. But you already had a dog track there with a big parking lot with a lot of people coming in and out. They already had a gambling facility there. What, what is the difference between the environmental impact of a dog track with a big parking lot and a casino with a big parking lot? Because you still have a lot of people going in and out. The information that, that was reviewed at the area office was from, I think, 1988. So they, had, they measured the impacts of the casino, or the, actually the dog track at that point. But this casino was going to lead to a lot more traffic, maybe four or 5,000 cars per day in the area. So the volume alone would uh, be a different impact. This was, of course, as you know, was a failing dog track, so attendance was low, mm -hmm. and this new impacts would cause much greater environmental concern. But it had been approved at the lower level. Yeah, the recommendation had Rec been, and the FONSI had been prepared at the local level, level that's correct. Now It was reversed at, at the upper level. Yes. Frequently, um, expertise, whether it's in the financial area or the environmental area, is not as strong at the local levels as it is in Washington. That's why Secretary Lujan put forward his policy that it be reviewed by the Indian Gaming Management staff in Washington, particularly where they were used to reviewing other applications that came well, forward. It, it's interesting to me that at the lower level, the gambling casino project appeared to be approved and on its way. At the lower level, the environmental concerns didn't seem to be a problem. But as they moved up the chain, all kinds of problems started occurring. And uh, th that just concerns me. I'm just well, thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm making an observation. I'm not asking a question. Let me ask you another, another question that nobody's asked so far. You had a gambling facility there. There was a gambling facility there. And everybody keeps talking about the impact on the community who didn't want gambling. But they had gambling. The gambling was already there with the dog track. Now, understandably, the casino would draw more people there. There would be more traffic. There would be more jobs, more money. But the fact is, if the gambling was a concern, they already had it. Did anybody ever ask that question? Oh, sure. It was reviewed extensively. The increased traffic was is very significant in finding lo local detriment to a community. So traffic, which you mentioned, would be increased is certainly a reason that we would look in and assessing the evidence for detriment. So um, a failing dog track versus something that would lead to mega uh, attendance from all over the various counties is a, is well, a true... Mr. Anderson, when we had the, the people here yesterday who were from Hudson, for instance, they, to my knowledge, didn't mention anything about the traffic problems. They were concerned about the moral problems and the gambling problems and the crime problems that were going to be created by having a gambling casino there. I don't remember anybody saying anything about infrastructure problems or about... Mr. Chairman, if I, if I may, just we only had the county supervisor. The, the other well, individuals that Mr. Lantos read, I think one of them did talk about her husband driving past there, so maybe we could check that. But we only had one person who Well, actually, right, the resolutions right. and questions and answers from the community itself discussed traffic problems, uh, wastewater treatment problems, uh, the fact that the environmental uh, well, issues... Well, no, let's address that. You, did, did, did not the, the 
tribes in question, negotiate with uh, the cities in question about uh, uh, giving uh, funds from the uh, enterprise to the city uh, in lieu of property taxes so that there would be enough money to take care of the additional uh, infrastructure and uh, other problems such as sewage and so forth? Yes, a year prior to, uh, uh, I believe it was the spring of 1994, the city and the tribe had basically entered an agreement for offset of, of uh, at least costs that the, the city would incur. Um, that was while the committee, uh, the council supported the application. A year later when the council reversed itself and decided to oppose this application, there was a real question as to whether that effect was binding or not. The city attorney looked at that issue but uh, notwithstanding that, the council still opposed it. There was a real question as to whether that was a void or not or whether that would be challenged. Well, I know the political, there's, there, the political issue is a muddy one because there was a, there was a referendum that passed very slightly, 52 and a half to 48, 47 and a half or something like that, 51 and a half. And, uh, uh, and then the council was forwarded to the other way and the mayor was recalled. So there was a lot of... It was not that muddy to us, but yeah. I can understand the confusion. It was not that muddy to you? No, I think that we... But were... the lower levels, though, it had been approved, hadn't it? Or recommended for, for approval? Of the BIA? Or of yeah. the... Uh, yes, certainly they had created and, a bond. And at the lower levels, the environmental people saw no problem. That's correct. As Mr. Slagle said, though, those environmental problems and assessment of St. Croix were not addressed. And that's the but, central but there was problem. no political reason for that. I mean, it was just, there was no, no. no political pressure whatsoever. It was all... Right. Simple. Mr. Slagle is a career professional who does these kind of environmental assessments regularly. And, well, the uh, gentleman we just had before us was a career professional as well. He, he was at the local level, though, and that was at the superintendent level. Council? Mr. Hartman and Mr. Jager, we uh, again meet under less than optimal circumstances. Hopefully uh, this afternoon will not be terribly long. Mr. Anderson, I recognize you were deposed before the committee last week, and again, thank you very much for being here. Um, I'll, I'll try and shorten my questions as much as possible by getting to one of the central points here. Mr. Anderson, um, my understanding is that this um, proposal to take land into trust was not an adversarial process, was it? I think it was a contentious process. It wasn't uh, an adjudicatory process, but it certainly had, there are certainly strong feelings on both sides of the issue. C certainly am amongst um, supporters and opponents, but between the applicants and the Department of the Interior, was this designed to be an adversarial process? No, this was designed to be a cooperative process. Okay. Where in the record can we look to find a communication with the applicants telling them that if they didn't cure a certain problem by a certain time, the application would be denied. The central point of consultations at the end appeared to me to be from, as Mr. Skabeen testified, from Mr. Moody, Mr. Havnick, Mr. Eckstein. That is where uh, I would expect, and don't have knowledge because I wasn't in those meetings, where the consultation process would have occurred and where clearly it would have been expressed, you've got to get the local support of the community. Um, it would be naive for the applicant tribes to assume that they didn't need local support of the community. They clearly needed that, and they also needed to show that there was not a finding of detriment. But, Mr. Anderson, you come here today as the ultimate decision maker. You've testified that you signed the July 14 letter that rejected the application. And what we're really trying to get to here is some tangible representation or some tangible evidence of the Department of the Interior telling, consulting in a meaningful fashion with the applicants and telling them there is a serious problem and if you don't make an attempt to cure this particular problem, then we will not be able to accept your application. Is there such a communication in the record? Uh, I believe the, the meetings would be the substance of the communication. I would accept um, uh, in the statement that there can always be more consultation or better consultation. Uh, clearly in any of our processes there can always be more done. but. Uh, I, I can accept that the applicant tribes did not know they needed the local support of the community, uh, particularly as to the evidence of detriment and to, to minimize that, when that was in the standard. That was in the standard that was, uh, that was passed in IGRA. No, I, I recognize your, your contention that um, the support of the local community must be given. I, I wanted to return to something you said in your opening statement. You said if the application were to have been approved it would have caused detriment to Hudson. 
what detriment are you referring to? The detriment is complained in the letter that I signed on July 14th, and it's particularly geared to the potential growth in traffic, congestion, and the adverse effect on the community's future residential, industrial, and commercial development plans. Now, that was the core of the problem. Are those problems that can be cured? Uh, they can uh, not be cured, but they can be paid for. I mean, uh, now traffic I'm, I'm, missing, I'm missing a distinction there. You're, you're telling me they cannot be cured, but they can be paid for? Right. I mean, let's, let's as an example, traffic congestion. You can't cure that because there's going to be traffic coming into the community. Which, can, well, can the no. offsets be paid for where there's more police? Yes. But I, I guess the point that we would like to illuminate is, did you discuss with the tribes in question who are applying for the the ability to build a casino, did you talk to them about these problems uh, before, before the denial? No, I didn't. The department well, was in the, communication, but as a, an I individual, know. I did not. Did, did, was there, were there any meetings uh, or any correspondence that was sent them? Were there, was there correspondence enumerating the problems that had to be met? I would have to examine the record. I believe that um, the You signed the final denial. Did you not check that out? Um, I relied on the, the career staff to provide a, a record for the decision. I was briefed on the record, but I don't know the details. Who in the career staff made that recommendation to you? That you sign, I mean, that you go ahead and sign it because you said you didn't check everything out. Well, we had meetings, and I said I was briefed on the, the documents and the and the issues involved. Um, the but 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 to, to, from 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 what I've been able to discern at these meetings, the tribes that were applying for the license and to put the land in trust, they were not notified in writing of the problems. Uh, and the tribes that opposed it, the very wealthy tribes, had a meeting with department officials and others, including their lobbyists, before this decision was made. And they were not uh, notified uh, in writing about the problems. Uh, until I guess after the decision was made. Oh, that that's not correct. They they, they, they were, were notified. They were notified of that the uh, consultation period had been extended. They were notified late, but they were notified that information would be coming in. So that, and they also had. Was this after the was this after the meeting with the larger tribes, the tribes that had uh, had the uh, yes. most to gain by stopping them financially? As I understand the the record, um, the after the meeting with the tribes who were opposing the application, and there was time allowed to have more commentary. Uh, on the application, uh, they were notified, the applicant tribes were notified six weeks later, so they did know that there was new information being considered. Is it common practice, to your knowledge, when there is a, a, a difference of opinion on whether or not there should be a casino, that the tribes that are trying to get the license and get the land in trust, like the ones we're talking about, that they not be notified of a meeting that's going to take place involving the opponents, particularly the other tribes that were making a lot of money and didn't want the competition. I mean, it seems to me kind of unfair that they weren't even notified about that meeting until after it took place. Well, typically. Um, typically, in a, in a consultation process, and we have a government-to-government -government relationship with each tribe, uh, we don't invite or even sometimes notify the other tribes that we're having meetings. We don't know what the meetings are about. In this particular case, I believe the Minnesota uh, delegation arranged the meeting, at least that I, that's what I understand from the Mr. record. Mr. O'Connor. Mr. O'Connor. Well, I think the invitation today. was actually held I understand. in Congress. But, uh, well, it just seems strange. Uh, go ahead, I, Council. I mean, I, obviously we can speak about problems right now for quite a long period of time, but they're not... Uh, germane to the application process unless they're communicated to the applicants. I'd like to try and cut through some of the sophistry here and, and deal directly with one of the things you mentioned in your opening statement. You talked about the environmental assessment not being adequate. Uh, the question simply put then is, if the environmental assessment wasn't adequate, why didn't you send uh, your career employees back to adequately compete the, complete the environmental assessment? Well, that's a fair question, and perhaps uh, that, that should have been done. I think well, no, given, well, so given, given the other um, compelling reasons for denial of the application, uh, which were the congestion and the local community's opposition, 
there was certainly time, af even after the decision was made and denied, for them to come forward and to cure those problems, or at least to make the attempt to cure those problems. No, I, I mean, I understand I'm going to be, it's, uh, there's a shell game going on here, and I'm going to be moving, uh, going at a moving target all afternoon, but you mentioned one of the reasons for denying the application as being uh, an environmental assessment uh, not being adequate, and, and simply, uh, I mean, for us to try and understand this process, it's very important for, for us to understand why, if you're going to identify that as a fatal problem with this application, that you wouldn't simply go back and do, that's actually your part of the work, correct? That was just one of the many f uh, fatal problems with this application. Well, again, you're, you're defining them as fatal problems now, but I, it goes back to the beginning when we were talking about whether this was an adversarial process. If it was a cooperative process between the Department of the Interior and Indian tribes, with Interior and the tribes working for presumably a common goal, then common fairness suggests that you would have at least gone back and said, if you can't fix problem X by date Y, we will not be able to cure or to approve your application. Let, let me just ask, was there not uh, information on the record that indicated to the applicants that they were proceeding in the right direction with their application? I believe there, the indications clearly from the area level was that it was moving along just fine. Right. Is it correct to say that there was a, num a November 15, 1994 uh, communication from the area office in Minneapolis that indicated that the application was not deficient? Yeah, that's correct. And is it correct to say that on April 30th of 1995 there was another communication from the area office indicating that the application was not deficient? I, I'm not familiar with April 30th. By that time, though, the central office in the Indian Gaming Management staff, pursuant to the policy that Secretary Lujan had adopted, had assumed jurisdiction of this area, just as they have for all the gaming um, acquisitions off the reservation. So uh, I'm not sure how current the area office's information was. Um, certainly by that time, uh, the information about the council's opposition, the town's opposition, is something that's not reflected in that later document. So okay. I'm not sure how up to date they were at that point. I understand. Uh, um, council, uh, 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 when you say April 30th uh, communication from the area office, are you referring to an April 20th communication? I stand corrected. I, I don't want to spend too much time sort of shooting at moving targets here, but, but one of the other things you mentioned was the traffic. Um, and you mentioned that it, you were working on information obtained in 1988. Is that correct? The, as I understand, the area office and the superintendent's office was looking at environmental issues from 1988 when they made their FONSI determination from the dog track at that point. Mr. Anderson, do you know when the dog track was built? Well, the dog track was built in 1990, but they had to do an environmental assessment in advance of that. So I believe 88 was the time when they actually did the. And how many how many cars was the uh, uh, dog track built to accommodate with its traffic patterns? Uh, I believe I, I don't know the answer to that. I just know that the dog track at that time was failing in '94, so I'm not sure of the scope. And in the materials that you had submitted to you, how many cars was it anticipated that would? Uh, Go into the casino. The figures I've seen are around 4,000 a day, um, and that's probably on you know the initial which, opening, and they build a market. They would be more. Which is less than half of the number that the dog track was built to accommodate. Correct. I'm not sure of the facts of uh, how much they accommodate. Well, you can understand our problem when you're giving us reasons for the de denial of the application, and then you're not certain of yeah, the underlying I, rationale. I could certainly provide those in the record. But I mean, th this is very significant because uh, I would have presumed that you would have sent a letter enumerating all the problems, environmental, traffic, and everything else, to the applicants so that they could uh, see if they could solve those problems. Uh, that wasn't done in, in, in a timely fashion. Uh, and, and the dog track would accommodate 8,000 cars. At the time it was built in 1990, there was no environmental problem. The people at the local level didn't see any environmental problem. Now you're talking about a casino that's going to usually have half that number of cars there, not 8,000, but 4,000, and you find an environmental problem. The amount of traffic is cut in half. The amount of people that you anticipated was going to be gambling there at the dog track or the casino was cut in half in all probability. And yet now you see an environmental problem that wasn't there when it was double that number. I don't understand that. Well, you the, town, that to the town certainly saw an environmental problem and was communicated to us. Uh, moreover, they cited other reasons like a wastewater facility that was closed, which should uh, cause more 
problems in that environmental uh, in that area as well. They may have to construct a new facility to accommodate the casino. Didn't the local people who were examining this from an environmental standpoint uh, know anything about that? They provided us the information that they had a problem with the congestion in the wastewater facilities. The, the local environmental people? Not the, the local towns did. Local no, but towns the local did. environmental people didn't see any problem. Uh, yes, they did. The uh, Isaac Walton League sent us a letter no, 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 on, the, on the scene. Walton people. I'm talking about the people that made the recommendation. At the oh, local you mean the local people here? Right. No, they didn't. They, they reached a fund. And they're supposed to have some environmental common sense because they work for the government and they work in the area of the environment. Well, they're very valuable employees and they're, they have a lot of expertise, but they would even acknowledge, and I think Mr. Jager would acknowledge, that Washington is a place that sometimes in other areas has more expertise. Mr. Slagle has reviewed many of these. But the question is, for what reason is there more expertise? Well, I, I, you know, I, I, I've been very calm about the comments about the shell game and, and everything else, which I think are, are out of line, but... Uh, to suggest that Mr. Slagle again has now joined this massive conspiracy of career people no, no. opposing that nobody really a massive conspiracy. beyond the beyond the, beyond the well, pale. Well, well, well I'm referring to Mr. Mr. Uh, the council's comments. We're wondering if proper procedures were followed according to the law. And you said this was supposed to be a cooperative procedure. These people who had made the application weren't notified of all the problems in a timely manner. There wasn't any meeting. There wasn't, there wasn't any, uh, uh, any letter enumerating the problems. There were meetings, and I don't... I just refer again to Mr. Scabine says that there were meetings. I don't know the context of those meetings. I, didn't, I don't know if you've asked uh, Mr. Scabine about the nature of the opposition or the nature of the evidence that was needed there, I expect the problems were communicated in those meetings. Mr. Anderson, did Mr. Slagle ever go to Hudson, Wisconsin to look at the environmental situation? You would have to ask Mr. Um, Skabeen, who's his staff director. I don't know whether he did or not. I, I've asked this question in depositions, and my understanding thus far is that you did not bother to send or you did not I won't characterize it in any way, but you did not send anybody to Hudson to do any analysis of uh, the environmental situation. Is that correct? I'm not sure what the career staff did in terms of their um, examination of the site or not. I just wouldn't know the answer to that. Mr. Anderson, one of the things that troubles me is that uh, you signed the letter, but uh, and 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 the letter had had the conclusions drawn, but as far as the background information and a lot of the things that are necessary to draw that conclusion, I've asked you about some documents. You said that those were handled by people below you like Mr. Skabeen and so forth. You, you didn't see those. Don't you find it troubling that you were signing a letter of declination without having reviewed all the relevant materials so that you could make that determination? No, and you're the man that's, going to be, that's held accountable. Your name was on the letter. Yes, it is. And I, I think in those situations, one does have to invest in the government, career people, and the people with expertise to make those decisions. To give you an example, uh, from t sometimes we'll have people write in about their genealogy, that they want to become a member of a tribe or that their tribe itself should be recognized. I don't go back in those decisions and examine the, uh, the genealogical records myself or examine uh, all the evidence is submitted by historians and anthropologists. We have a career staff that, that looks at those issues, and I basically invest in them to give me proper advice, which I think was done in this case. What if the career staff was influenced by political considerations other than, you know, the, uh, the normal uh, procedures? I, I'm not aware of that case. I know, but what if it was? If, if it was improper political influence? Well, clearly their, their credibility. Have, I mean, you would have just gone ahead and signed the letter based no. upon the recommendation anyhow. No, I don't think anybody would. I mean, if, if there was evidence that someone had improperly, uh, because of political influence or, or bribes or some violation of the federal criminal law, was making a re recommendation, as a public official myself, I certainly couldn't sign well, off. How would you know? Well, I think you have to look at the evidence they're presented. I know, but you didn't have all the evidence. You said I, you I was were, you said you, you said you were on these relying, You were relying upon the career people. We've well, asked you about some questions here today that you simply didn't have the answers for. You said you relied upon Mr. Scabine and others. I, I've heard it both ways today. Now, one, don't rely on the career people, and now that you should rely on the career people. So, I mean, I invest in them to give me proper information. Uh, do I know whether it's... Um, that they've been somehow improperly influenced, I don't know that in every case. I don't expect that happened here. You don't expect it, but you're not sure. I, I have a high degree of confidence in the gentleman sitting here and elsewhere. Uh, 
Mr. Hartman, we don't want to leave you out of the mix here. Um, if you could, I, I think you have your um, deposition testimony here. Um, the document is marked Exhibit 346A. And if you could just, if you would, please refer to um, page 37 of the deposition. And I, just I don't. Oh. Council may have it. I don't currently have it. Page 346A. It's, it's Exhibit 346A. And I'm sorry, which page? And it's page number 37. And let me just read to this and then I'll ask. I'm sorry, I go from page 36. Oh, page, sorry, 37, page 37, yes, and I'll, I'll just read. There's a question. Uh, <clears throat> do you know under IGRA uh, if, there is, if there was a policy with regard to competing tribes in the area? And your answer was, the only policy I was aware of, and it was articulated verbally by the Deputy Commissioner of Indian Affairs, was that economic con competition was not detrimental that we couldn't pick one tribe out over another. And even from a business standpoint, the reason you have a McDonald's on one corner and a Burger King on another and a Wendy's on the third corner is because there are syner synergies in a lot of these. So you can't, it's very difficult from an econometric standpoint to say when you add another casino that ruins everybody else's business. If that was the case, then the second person moving into Las Vegas would have ruined it for everybody. And I think we know that is not the case. Do you remember making that statement in the deposition? Yes. And did you provide advice um, during the uh, decision-making period about the um, economic impact on competing tribes? Uh, I did. We had uh, two original studies that were done for the applicant tribes. And uh, in the spring of 1995, we received studies from the St. Croix Chippewa and the Minnesota Indian Gaming Association. Is it fair to say that you were not convinced that the Hudson Casino would necessarily have had an adverse impact on surrounding casinos? Uh, I didn't believe there was one, though. And uh, did anybody above you in the uh, Department of Interior uh, decision-making process discuss their objections with your viewpoint? No, there was an assertion made in one of the studies, and I've forgotten if it was the uh, MIGA study or the St. Croix study, uh, but they s pointed out that the language says not detrimental to the surrounding community, uh, as opposed to a standard of not devastating to the local community, which, it, which included the nearby Indian tribes. And we did, we did discuss whether or not uh, the standard was devastation or detrimental and what criteria we uh, should use. And I, my recollection is that we adopted the, uh, that, we, that we didn't say that the, uh, a small amount of detriment from competition would be the standard, that we were looking at something more than pure economic competition between two Indian tribes. But it is fair to say you were not advising those above you in the decision-making process that um, there was necessarily detriment um, <coughs> to the uh, surrounding uh, Indian casinos. Is that correct? Correct. Just one, one last thing. I'm, I'm coming down to the uh, end of my time here. If you could turn to page 54 of your deposition, please. Uh, you made a statement, and I'll, I'll read the statement in full. Uh, you stated, in the meetings I had been in, the negatives of taking land into trust had certainly been discussed. A concept that had been tossed out was that in a Democrat administration and a Republican governor, to ignore the local input and impose a casino on an unwilling community and then have the Republican governor say, well, look at those ridiculous Democrats doing this again, was not viewed as being the best position to be in. Now, that appears to me that there was some consideration of a, a political factor, is that correct? Yes. And is it correct to say that 
that factor is not found in either the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act or the Indian Reorganization Act? Uh, no, I don't think that's fair characterization because I think the turmoil that you create with any decision you make to take land in the trust, especially for gaming, is uh, certainly a basis to be considered in exercising secretarial discretion under Part 151. Right, I, I understand that, but that seems to be inconsistent with the statement you've made, which is that uh, there was a concern that the Democrat administration might approve the casino and the Republican governor then, in his legitimate veto authority, uh, through the statute would reject the casino and thus there would be political points to be obtained from that. It was a, a, a concept that uh, was, was the situation and the reality at the time. We uh, did not have any kind of definitive statement from the governor of Wisconsin that he would concur, as a matter of fact, probably the bulk of the indications we had were that the governor would not concur in a determination. And I think it's quite valid to examine how the federal government then becomes regarded by a local community if the end result is imposing a Indian gaming facility on a community, community that's not willing to have it. I think, Mr. Mr. Hartman, my time is up. And uh, Mr. Kinjorski, I presume you're going to control the time on your side? You're recognized for 30 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Anderson, you testified in your opening statement that you're an American Indian. Is that correct? That's correct. I'm very proud of that. And you worked uh, in the American Indian movement over a number of years prior to becoming a an official of the United States government? Yes, but not the official American Indian <laughs> movement. <laughs> not AIM. Uh, and you've been with the government since 1993, is that, that correct? That's right. I, I also worked with the government in the, on the Senate side as well. And you obviously left the private law practice because of the tremendous salary boost going into <laughs> the government, is that correct? Well, that would be <clears throat> psychic value, I think. And as we all know, uh, particularly those members of Congress, that uh, this 500 or 1,000 letters a day that we send out to our constituents in response to particular inquiries that we do all the investigation, we make all the studies ourselves, and we just use our staffs to do the typing of this material. And that uh, uh, we produce these 1,000 letters a day uh, because we're so brilliant and capable of making that analysis in about one minute, I think it would be, or something. Uh, less than that. The your fact your, your standard is, is one we should emulate. In this case, the, the record was 14 volumes. That's right. The fact of the matter is that uh, there's a hierarchy in the system for filtering processes. And then when it gets <laughs> up to your level of decision, you, you call in your staff, you get briefed, and you accept that they have made the analysis, or in the meantime, someone has checked that the analysis hasn't been made. That's called the attention, and then there's a reexamination. And the best possible scenario under this process is the, the proper analysis is made. You rely on the honesty and truthfulness and integrity of your staff. Is that correct? Yes, and I thought that was well understood until today. Uh, well, sometimes members of Congress don't operate that way, and so they don't understand uh, how that process works in government. Uh, but I just want to make it a point, to, may, maybe not only to you, but not only for the chairman, but for the audience, that uh, the many issues that all of us in government have to handle does not mean that we individually search out any fact, every analysis, that that's the reason we have the involved staffs that we have, and we could not possibly respond to all these questions if we personally handled all the investigative work and all the analysis and all the conclusions. Yes, yeah, so Congress, when we have 11,000 employees in the, the Bureau, so to review each of the work would be very yeah. difficult. Right, we, we could really get rid of uh, 10,999, just keep Abbott, and he could do everything. <laughs> It's a very hard worker, but I don't think he could do it all. all right. Now, uh, I, I take it then you, you, you have some strong feelings on trying to provide benefits for the American Indian uh, and to increase their economic viability in our system so that you are rather sympathetic to the gaming laws and the uh, allowing gaming on reservations and in some instances on trust land off reservations. Is that correct? Yes, I'm personally sympathetic to these tribes as well. 
I, I, matter of fact, on that issue, uh, did anyone in your office or any of the uh, members of the panel could examine this? I, I was struck yesterday that the original uh, uh, partnership that was going to be put together with, with, was with another tribe. And they ultimately were dropped, and it's the San uh, or the Saint uh, Croix uh, Chippewa tribe. That's correct. Uh, w was there any examination made as to why they were dropped as a partner, or did you get involved in that? I was uh, involved in that. Uh, they are. They do handle other gaming operations, however, or they have a license for a casino. Yes, right? they they operate, and I believe they took over the management of their own operation around that time period as well. Uh, the owner of the racetrack seemed to indicate yesterday that they had a uh, questionable reputation, and that's why he did not partnership with them. And uh, is there any uh, information that you know about this tribe uh, uh, that would lend itself to uh, be disqualified as a legitimate partner, since they're only 50 miles away from this location compared to 200 miles from the other tribes? No, that, that was certainly a surprise to me. Has there any been any complaint made? To the game, I, to the I would have commission to, uh, in regard to that by this uh, track owner. I, I'm not aware of any. Now, as an interior official, you had the final say on this application. You you were the party that was charged. Is that yes. Correct? Uh, and uh, you, you signed the letter of rejection. But as I understand it, uh, what happened is that originally this would be uh, the assistant. Uh, 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 there, the secretary would have the authority in the law. The secretary delegates that authority to the assistant director of Indian Affairs, and uh, and that's Ada Deer. But apparently, she recused herself because uh, she has associations in Wisconsin and knows the parties involved. And that's how it came down to your level of decision making. Is that correct? That's correct. And in in your capacity, you are what now, deputy? Uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs. So you're right under her, and she was blanked out of the picture and, and passed over. Right, and when she's out of town, I at that time when she was Assistant Secretary, I would serve as Acting Assistant Secretary when she was gone. Did you did you follow the gaming staff analysis in, in your process? Were you briefed on their analysis, and is that the basis for your rejection letter? Yes. Um, to clarify some of the discussion this morning, I found the 151 analysis. Um, by uh, the career staff wholly supportable. I thought it was a good analysis. I was briefed on it. Um, I found that the evidence that supported uh, the findings under 151 would also basically apply in whole part to Section 20 as well. Um, so in making a policy choice as to uh, the evidence that was presented by the gaming management staff, I felt that we could use the basis for 20 as well. And are you aware of uh, the concerns in the Secretary's office about the effect of this decision would have on the future of Indian gaming? Did that, uh, was there a question raised here, that w what impact this would have on future gaming? Yes, there are certainly policy concerns expressed. In, in my actual decision letter, I did not rely on that as a, as a rationale that Congress might take action in this area, but those factors were discussed extensively. Now, you're in the position to know then whether or not there was any political influence involved. Was there? And if so, what kind? Or how should this committee respond if there was not? How could you explain mm -hmm. that there wasn't political influence there? I have absolutely no knowledge of any improper political influence or even, uh, for that matter, from, uh, from the DNC, any rumors or suggestions that there was political corruption going on in this decision. Uh, clearly, the Minnesota delegation expressed a view uh, on the application. As I understand now, uh, Congressman Gunderson did as well, but uh, I wouldn't consider that improper political influence. Certainly, members of Congress can write in and, and ask for the views of the department on these issues, but with regard to improper political influence, none whatsoever. But it was rather uniform of all the elected public officials, the members of Congress, the United States Senator, the Governor, the town council, they were all opposed to this. Is that correct? My understanding from the record is uh, that they were almost uniformly opposed. I understand that perhaps the congressman from the area where the tribes came from, at least uh, adjoining to the area, may have supported this. And uh, the governor's position in my mind was not clear. Uh, of course, I'm not from Wisconsin, so I, I don't know what kind of impact that would be, that uniformality of, of uh, opposition. But in Pennsylvania, uh, that would be pretty clear that something wasn't going to happen. 
uh, because it, it's the, uh, the political representatives of the people certainly understand the feelings of the people. They don't very often run in opposition to them. Why, why should the owner of the track be so surprised that uh, uh, this was on the wrong track and wasn't going anywhere? That, that, that's what strikes me. It would seem to me, if I were in his position, I would have said, wow, we got the towns against us, we have the uh, legislators against us, we have the congressmen against us, we have the governor against us. Uh, this is a dead tootsie unless I can turn this around. I, I think it was naive to think that this was smooth sailing all the way because there was extensive um, local governmental opposition. And I wouldn't rely so much on the individuals at, at all, but as far as the towns, that was really critical. They provided information and evidence that this, was an, that this would cause a detriment to their community. Now, to your knowledge, was Secretary Babbitt directly involved in this application in any way? No, I wasn't aware that Secretary Babbitt had a view on this at all. Uh, it certainly didn't direct me in any way to make a decision. The Secretary did attend one meeting that I'm aware of in Wisconsin where the tribes basically discussed and disagreed on this issue. Uh, I don't know what his views were expressed, if any, there, but certainly as, as far as someone or anyone directing uh, me to say this is what the Secretary wants or this is how you should decide, that never happened. There has been statements made, and I'm not aware of the exact amounts, but obviously a political contribution was made by opposing tribes, by the Democratic National Committee of the Clinton Gore campaign, in a sizable amount, several hundreds of thousands of dollars. And in some analysis heard on, from the other side, they would like both this committee and the Congress and the American people to believe, therefore, by virtue of the fact that this political contribution occurred uh, somewhat, almost uh, within a very short period of time after the decision was constructed, that that was a, a payment or a driving force for the decision. And the only thing I would say is that, uh, that type of logic somewhat is frightening because it means you're damned if you do or damned if you don't if you're in politics. And all I would say is that we could look at the record on this dog track and shortly after the State Racing Commission granted this dog track in, in, the, uh, in the middle part of 89, immediately uh, in the 1990 election, uh, the governor's campaign received a trifecta. In two days, received from the track owner a political contribution from both he and his wife of something like $13,500. Uh, using the type of logic that's being used on the other side, we would have to say it's a therefore, uh, or because, uh, because of the decision of issuing the license, this is some sort of a political payback in the contribution. And that wouldn't be reasonable, would it? No. The fact of the matter is that Governor Thompson uh, entertains a rather uh, progressive reputation of being, being a rather forceful governor, a successful governor. And the dog track owner said he was impressed with him. He's a businessman. He deals in Wisconsin, knows the governor, and he, he wanted to support a governor that he felt was uh, doing something progressive for the state of Wisconsin. And we shouldn't attribute to that contribution something uh, venial. Right, I've heard the, the, the chairman's theory on that, and with all due respect, I think there's just giant holes in it. The idea that there was some type of politically uh, driven decision based on corrupt money given by tribes when in, in fact, as I understand from the, the press reports, those were given six months or a year later that uh, Mr. Scabine and, and others in our department, Mr. Slagle now uh, as our environmental specialist, somehow got this uh, sign or direction maybe from osmosis that lobbyists were meeting with others and that somehow that would affect our decision. So I, I frankly am offended by that, that notion or the suggestion. Um, and I don't know what we can do about it in this type of uh, investigation. The, the investigations I'm familiar with, and I worked in the, the Senate where uh, maybe it was a different time, but we had a, a chairman, uh, Dennis DeConcini, and a vice chairman, John McCain, where the committees worked together. They even prepared joint questions together as, as staff counsel. Our committee led to referrals to the Justice Department to prosecution and, and incarceration of people involved in that. Um, from this perspective, I've seen nothing to suggest that that's the kind of uh, evidence or suggestion we have in proper influence. So I'm just astounded by this whole situation. Yes. I, I have to weigh in on this at this time too. Um, I frankly don't like the fact um, that there's this money floating around. I just, I'm uncomfortable with it. 
Uh, and if I had my preference, everybody would be running like Bill Proxmire from the state of Wisconsin, and they wouldn't be raising any money. Um, the reality is we're in a system where, where people are raising money. Um, and I understand how the chairman can say, well, look, in the year after this decision was made, um, the Democratic National Committee raised three hundred dollars to $400,000. But if anybody is making that statement, I think, at least in the state of Wisconsin, they have to make the identical statement about Mr. Havnick and his relationship with the governor. Because in 1989, the State Racing Commission permitted Mr. Havnick to build the racetrack, a nice monopoly in, in western Wisconsin. On July 6, 1990, he gave $3,500, his wife gave $5,000, his mother-in-law gave $5,000 to Governor Thompson's election re-election campaign. $13,500 in one day. And that doesn't count probably two or 3,000 that came in a little bit before, a little bit after. So if we're going to be critical of this system, and some can be critical of this system, they better be critical of Governor Thompson. But what we have here is, frankly, the very same individual an organization who, who, who could have written the, the book on this in 1989 and 1990, and I'm not accusing any quid pro quo here. A decision was made where he received the dog track license. 13 months later, he gave $13,500 to Governor Thompson. Now, that may not sound like a lot of money in Washington, but in the state of Wisconsin, $13,000, $13,500 in one day, as Mr. Kanjorski said, that's like hitting the trifecta. Um, that's a lot of money. And, and so if we're going to be throwing the, this mud back and forth, then there's plenty of mud to go around here. The only difference is the people who did not get that license in Wisconsin didn't file a lawsuit. That's, that's the difference. So I, as we sit here today, yes, the system is bad. We should not have this money in the system. Democrats shouldn't receive this type of money. Republicans shouldn't receive this type of money. And any attempt, though, to change this system would never, in a zillion years, move through this committee. Okay. It would never move through this committee. We would be, you'd have to be on, this, on the planet Mars to think that this committee would try to clean the system up. And so when I hear people, and I heard Mr. Sauter earlier today, who said that he was against gambling and that was okay. Then there's others of us who are against gambling and we came out against it, but somehow we were tainted because we came out of it. I don't buy this. I don't buy this for a second. Um, and, and the hypocrisy of this committee boggles my mind because I hear member after member saying how bad this is, but there has not been a single member from that side of the aisle who has said publicly, we should look into the biggest embarrassment that has happened in this Congress in the last decade, and that is that unbelievable provision that was inserted in the, in the budget last summer that gave the tobacco industry a $50 billion, not $50 million, not $500,000, not $500, $50 billion tax break. And, and that was done, coincidentally, for the same group where you have the three largest contributors to the Republican Party who are in favor of that. Now, people can say, well, those things happen. What's even more amazing is that when the provision came out in the United States Senate, I think there was a recorded vote. Not a single person voted against that. In the House of Representatives, they didn't even want to vote. It came out on a voice vote. So you have a $50 billion tax break that was inserted into a budget bill, and there was not a single, not a single member of Congress who would stand up and say that that was a good deal. Now, I think that that's a scandal. And I would think that there would be many self-righteous Republicans who would say, wait a minute, we want to look at this. Not a one. Not a one. So I think we are correct in holding these hearings. And in some ways, I disagree with, with, with my colleagues and my colleagues on this side, because I think there is a legitimate question. I think there's a legitimate question as to, as to whether Mr. Babbitt gave 
truthful testimony. That question has been raised. That's something that the special prosecutor <coughs> will consider. Uh, and so it's important that we, we flush this out. But, but I've looked through this testimony, um, and I've looked through this, and yeah, I think that there are some questions, maybe even some problems with the procedure. But what I've heard from the testimony of, of the career people, and I find it ironic that the chairman was asking you whether you trusted the career people, and then he's asking the career people whether they trust you. I can't think of a, a more paranoid situation if you can't have people trust each other. Uh, but we're sitting here with a situation where we were playing this, and I said this yesterday, you had big guns fighting big guns. And when that happens, someone's going to get shot with a big gun. And, and that's exactly what happened here. Now, I'd like to go on a little bit, if I could, and look at <coughs> Exhibit 302A. This is a letter from La Couture, Red Cliff, and I'm going to, and I think the mole, I, I, I would mispronounce the Sakagan, I think is perhaps I, to, to Bruce Babbitt. Do you have a copy of that letter? Yes, I do. And it starts out, dear Secretary Babbitt, we have now had an opportunity to review the comments submitted through May 17th, 1995 on our application to have the St. Croix Meadow site placed in trust for gaming purposes. Um, there are two points that we feel it is necessary to address in response to objections by other tribes to this project. We have heard now for, for two days the argument that that there was sort of a blindsided, this, that the aggrieved tribes felt blindsided by the decision. Can you tell me what this letter refers to? Can, let me make sure I've got the right document. It's 302A-3. I'm sorry, 302A-7. I apologize. It's a letter dated June 7th, 1995 to Bruce Babbitt. Yes, it looks like they're communicating to uh, the secretary, at least the secretary's office, um, their uh, disagreement with the tribes who have opposed their, their application. So they did, they did comment, obviously. I mean, this is a letter commenting on on the application, is that, is that correct? Yes. Okay, I just, again, I, I, I want to make sure that we understand that, that there was a response filed through. Now, it may not have been to the community response, and I don't know exactly if they had the opportunity to do that, but it appears that there was something here. May I continue, Mr. Chairman? I also, Mr. Ann, staying with uh, you, and Mr. I, and, and Mr. Uh, Congressman, I don't think this was the, only, the first time they became aware. I think they knew of the St. Croix's opposition throughout this process, so this probably more memorialized their analysis disagreement, but they certainly knew about it throughout. Okay. Uh, you had been questioned earlier about consultation with you and the department. Um, and the allegations, of course, have been that there was some sort of unfair access here. Um, let's, let's sort of review that for a second. Who was the only lobbyist to meet with Mr. Babbitt? The only one I'm aware of was, was Mr. Eckstein, hired by the applicant tribes. Actually, not by the tribes, by Galaxy Gaming Company, I believe, was the, his actual employer. So no lobbyist, as far as you know, met for for the for the anti casino tribes met with him yes that's my understanding are you aware that they also had several phone i think two con phone conversations between mr babbitt and mr Eckstein on this matter i've heard secretary testify to that fact do you know whether mr Eckstein also had the opportunity to meet with um, mr duffy or mr scabine my understanding is he did meet with both as well okay once twice uh, i believe it was twice with Mr. Duffy, maybe once with Mr. Scabine. Mr. Havnick, did he get an opportunity to meet with them? Uh, yes, he's met with both Mr. Duffy and Mr. Scabine, okay. and Mr. Hartman, I believe, too. And, and, the, and the sides that were opposing it, did they also get a chance to meet with Mr. Duffy and Mr. Scabine? Yes, they met okay. with them. Okay, so that there's a, uh, it would, is it fair to say that there was a level playing field there in terms of both the opponents and the proponents of this got to meet with Mr. Scabine and Mr. Duffy? Yes, I mean, I suppose one could even argue, given the last meeting there with Mr. Eckstein, they even had a, a greater advantage in trying to persuade the top person to, to change his mind. Although, you know, as I've started to say, that he didn't have a role in this decision. Okay. I, I want to turn now to you, Mr. Hartman, if I mo may for a moment, because one of the more intriguing parts of this hearing for me as a resident of the state of Wisconsin has been the governor's role and the governor's position on this. Bef before this hearing began, I was under the impression um, 
that that there was no question the governor was opposed to this. Um, and I quoted yesterday from a letter that he sent out in June of 1995. I, at the end of the hearing yesterday, looked over at the board. As I was reading the board, I saw uh, a letter dated December 1994 with the, essentially the identical language to another resident. Uh, in both instances, the residents were residents of Hudson, Wisconsin. Um, so in, in my mind, and maybe I should go back to the letter here, there was no question as to what the governor's position was. Uh, just take a moment here if I could. The June 9, 1995 letter was written to a gentleman in Hudson, Wisconsin. Thank you for your recent letter regarding the expansion of Indian gaming to off-reservation sites in Wisconsin. I appreciate the time you took to write. My, con my position continues to be clear. I do not support an expansion of Indian gaming in Wisconsin. Um, I take the governor at his word. Um, he says that his position is clear. Um, the people here yesterday from Hudson felt that his position was clear. Um, again, he states his position is clear. Um, ironically, the, the people who were saying his position wasn't clear were the Republicans uh, and, and the proponents for the dog track um, questioning my, my governor. Um, which is, <laughs> but I, I look at that, and then I look at your comments during your deposition. Um, when you were concerned, you were concerned about what would happen if, well, you tell me. You tell me what that concern was, please. I don't remember every page of the administrative record, but I think there were some newspaper articles submitted that had quotations in them from Governor Thompson that indicated he would uh, concur in a positive two-part determination. Certainly the major body of the written materials that we had indicated uh, were like that. Or he doesn't say I won't concur in the determination. He says I'm opposed to the expansion of gaming in Wisconsin. I, uh, uh, if you're a skeptical staffer trying to analyze the actual facts, I think there's wiggle room in there uh, from a political standpoint. He didn't say no. Uh, not till hell freezes over will I ever concur in the determination. So I uh, basically had to look at, I personally looked at all the information that was in the record and I uh, couldn't see a clear indication on what the governor would do. The Minneapolis area office in sending out consultation letters under section 20 to appropriate local government officials nearby Indian tribes had not sent a letter to the governor uh, asking for state comment on the factors that are in that letter. So we did not have a response back uh, from the governor of the uh, state of Wisconsin in the consultation process that might have clarified it. Although experience has told us that lots of times governors simply don't respond to that consultation letter that they save the remarks for later on. Um, but what was your concern if you had come out one way or the other? A, a political concern, frankly. There, there was not. that The tribes were also telling us that don't worry about what he says in public because there are so many voters in Wisconsin that he has to maintain the support of. Uh, but we've been assured through private channels that he's in favor of this and will approve it, which, of course, you also have to take with a grain of salt, maintain a little bit of skepticism about. Uh, I, to this day, I think it's quite unclear uh, what the governor would have done. Certainly the written record indicated he would not concur. In Do you know if anyone recently has asked the governor his position on this issue? Have there been any public pronouncements from Governor Thompson? I, I don't know. I can't, I can't recall uh, any recent ones. Okay. Uh, I will yield back to Mr. Kandorski at this time. No. I'll, I'll, I'll pursue a, a few questions and I might then go on my uh, own five-minute round. Let me ask uh, each of the three of you, uh, the uh, name Terry McAuliffe was raised yesterday uh, by Mr. Havenick. Do any of you know of any interaction with Mr. McAuliffe and any of you or anybody else at the Department of Interior, and did he influence the decision? Mr. Anderson. Uh, no, I, I do know Terry McAuliffe. He was a classmate of mine at Georgetown, but he had no contact with me throughout this process. And do you know whether he had contact with anybody else? No. Yeah. Mr. Hartman? I don't recognize the name, and I've never had any contact that I know of 
uh, with Mr. McCullough. Mr. Jager? No, I don't know him. Okay. Now, uh, uh, we had testimony uh, by uh, Mr. Uh, Scabine, who said flat out the decision was based on the merits and not due to any political influence. Do you concur in that statement, Mr. Anderson? Yes, emphatically. Mr. Hartland? Yes, I concur. And Mr. Jager? I'm not able to concur with that because I was not involved with the, uh, with the review at the central office level, so I don't have the access to the, to the rationale of that, that decision being made. Okay. You don't know whether it's incorrect. You just don't know whether it's correct one way or the other because you right. haven't been involved. That's right. Uh, Mr. Hartman, there's been some discussion about the two memos, really different versions of the same memo that address the subject of detriment to the surrounding community. The first is purportedly from the gaming, Indian Gaming Management staff to Mr. George Scabine, and the second is purportedly from Mr. Scabine to the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs. Did you write those memos? I did additional writing and did the printout on both of those memos. And did anyone else write those memos? The uh, basic work for both of those memos was done uh, by several members of the staff at the Lakewood office that the Indian Gaming Management staff had at the time. So uh, early editions of that particular memorandum on both the issue of best interests and not detrimental uh, had contributions from most of the staff members. And they were labeled draft. I'm wondering why they were so labeled. Does the draft labeling in also indicate that the memos were not yet the views of either the entire staff or Mr. Scabine? Uh, that's correct. And even in that June 8th memorandum, which is, uh, for lack of a better word, a final draft of a draft, uh, careful reading of it, there are open issues which a final findings of fact would not have had in it. Uh, the one that, <coughs> excuse me, springs to mind is on problem gambling. Uh, we had identified that the mitigation was inadequate. Uh, we had strong reason to believe that it could have been made adequate with a little bit of work, but it would certainly not come out of draft form until it was polished up. And one just last mind. question to pin something down, Mr. Anderson, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I might. Uh, Mr. McAuliffe was a classmate of yours. This is the first time I've learned this. But notwithstanding the fact that he was a classmate of yours, your, your testimony is he never contacted you, even though you were the official uh, decision maker on the Hudson application. That's correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Anderson, uh, you made some comments that indicated that you it was incredulous, or words to that effect, that we would be impugning the integrity of anybody in this department. I've heard that regularly through the last two days. Let, so. me, let me just tell you that one of the reasons why we have that concern mm -hmm. is that of the tribes that benefited from this decision, in the 94 to 96 cycle, only one gave any kind of a contribution. And that was the Lower Sioux Tribal Council. They gave $500 to the DNC, Minnesota Democratic Party, none to the National Democratic Party. They gave $500. After this decision was made, there was $356,000. Now, I understand that you may not think that means anything, but it does raise some questions. Up until that time, they only gave minimal amounts of money politically, almost none. And then after the decision was made, after all these meetings took place and everything, they gave $356,000. That does cause some consternation. Now, I want to also read into the record. <coughs> this is a memo that stated one year, one year after the decision was made. It's from Mr. Scabine, and I wish I wish I had known of this memo before. We had so such a volume of documents that I didn't have a chance to go through all of them along with my counsel before. Do you have a copy of it? But this is on. Uh, Do you August. have a copy of that, Mr. Chairman? Uh, I'd be glad to give you a copy. Can you uh, get him a copy? Mr. Chairman, could you identify it, it for it's our exhibit, site? Uh, exhibit 337. You should have it there, Exhibit 337. But on August 5th, 1996, the year after this decision was made, in Section 4 on page 24, or page, uh, page, on page 26, Mr. Scabine says, it is true that extensive factual findings supporting the local community's objections are nowhere to be found. 
And then he refers, uh, uh, he says, DOI's position is that extensive factual findings are not required under Section 20 of IGRA. And then he says, see comments under number three above. Then you go up to number three, and he says, the point here, and a very crucial one, is that the department has to rely on the record, and the opposition of local communities in the record is the evidence relied upon. The department, and then he puts in parentheses, Duffy, made a decision that the opposition of the local communities was evidence per se of detriment, and that the department was not going to require the communities for detailed evidence to back up their position. Duffy's position, as I recall, was that the department should not interpret Section 20 of IGRA to require local communities to do more than have general objections to the gaming establishment. If that is insufficient, he thought we should have the courts tell us so. But Mr. Duffy, Mr. Duffy was the one who was making that decision. Now, Mr. Duffy is the one who benefited from this decision when he left the Department of the Interior. Now, I don't know how high up this goes, but Mr. Duffy, Mr. 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 Scabine says very clearly there is no, he says it is true that extensive factual findings supporting the local community's objections are nowhere to be found. Then he refers to Mr. Duffy's uh, evidence per se of detriment, but it was Mr. Duffy's decision or, or interpretation. It's, it's there in his memo. You may read it if you like. Now, Mr. Duffy then goes to work for a law firm and starts working representing uh, the Indian tribes that, uh, that he helped while he was at the Department of Interior. Now, this may all be circumstantial. It may all be hyperbole. But the fact is, these tribes gave no money, $500, in the 1994 to 1996 cycle. After the decision was made, they made $350,000 in contributions. Uh, after the decision was made, both Mr. Duffy, the account, uh, counsel to uh, Mr. Babbitt, and Mr. Collier, the chief counsel, leave and go to work for a law firm, and now they represent the Shakopee tribe and those other tribes. Now, you know, you can interpret that any way you want. And you may say that this is all baloney, but uh, I don't agree with that, and I think that the people who might be paying attention to this might have some questions themselves. Uh, and with that, I'll be happy to yield the balance of my time to my colleague. Mr. Chairman, I, I want to register an objection. You may register the objection, but you're not under oath, and you're only here as counsel. I understand that, but I'm asserting a privilege on the part of the United States in its litigation position. All right. You may. This is a document from client to, to counsel relating to that litigation. It was done after the decision was made. The document and this is a privilege was we've given to us by the uh, department, uh, and uh, it, as uh, such, we, we have felt that it was part of a, uh, could be put in part of the congressional record and referred to in testimony, and we have so done. I understand that, sir, but every... You, you've every raised your objection. I yield the balance of my time to my colleague. Uh, just real quickly, uh, Mr. Chairman, as I understand, I'd have five minutes later on. Uh, okay. I, I want to uh, ask uh, Mr. Anderson some questions here because it, it concerns me a little, some, some discrepancies here. You indicated in your testimony, or under questioning, that uh, you signed the uh, J July 14th letter uh, frankly, based on review of, of career staff and, and their determinations that you didn't go through and make a separate determination of your own. Is that a fair no, statement? That's not a fair statement. Okay. I mean, I, I basically relied on the evidence they provided to support both the findings under uh, Section 5 of the Indian Reorganization Act and also Section 20 of, of IGRA. Uh, in deferring to their factual determinations of whether there's um, uh, impacts on local communities and uh, traffic problems, I don't surrender my policy review as to, you know, how I'm going to apply those facts. And in this case, I thought it was proper to apply it to Section 20. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think the time has expired. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, you'll get your five minutes just a minute. Mr. Konjorski. Yes. Uh, <coughs> yesterday, when Mr. Havernick uh, testified, I was rather harsh on the uh, agreement. And I, I, and I still am harsh on the agreement. And, it wasn't directed necessarily at him. It could be directed at the department, however, or the Congress and how we structured this. It seems to me the only reason why the Indian tribes who have a necessity for this money, and I think that's conceded, uh, are dealing with non-tribal 
uh, gambling interests, whether they be from Florida, Las Vegas, Atlantic City, but very professional gaming people. Uh, contrary to what I think was the intent of Congress when we wanted to help the Indian tribes out, earn money here, we have these people that come in and put these deals together. Why hasn't the department uh, been a little stricter in looking at uh, the contracts and the arrangements, the fees to be made, the sale prices, the rental prices? And uh, uh, I heard the comment earlier made that uh, uh, the reason these uh, non-Indian tribe participants are out there is the Indian tribes don't have the equity. Well, why don't they establish uh, or ask the Congress to establish mechanisms by which they can get the equity, whether it be a small business investment corporation or other type entities that exist under federal law. If we're really trying to help the Indians earn money, why are we subjecting them to uh, 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 rather uh, Ukrainian uh, negotiations with very experienced, one-sided experienced gaming people? Well, initially, the, those were the only sources available to tribes to for, for funds, but many tribes now, when they get the initial startup funds, have taken on the management themselves, and I think that's definitely preferable so the tribe gets all of the funding. Uh, the department, in its resources, can do a better job in examining these leases. There has been criticism, uh, in I think it was referred to yesterday, in a IG report that we need to scrutinize these leases more carefully, and we've been attempting to do that and review them, but um, but certainly the tribes uh, not having a lot of money have sometimes had to go to these operations and that's why the National Indian Gaming Commission regulates this so so carefully. Well, we wouldn't have this problem here of, uh, of people contributing money and trying to work. I mean, it would be a straight arm's length deal that either the three tribes involved here would have come in and tried to buy a losing weight ra racetrack or some other off-site opportunity where 100 percent of the profits and proceeds would have gone to the tribe instead of these convoluted agreements of purchasing part of the property, leasing the parking lot, and doing things that are, appear to me to be uh, with the intention of, uh, of gaining uh, an ultimately higher profit by individuals who were never intended to be helped by Congress. And, and, and I, I, it's sort of a criticism on my part uh, uh, that it just seems to me that we can find mechanisms to help finance. I know for a fact that the, uh, the Eskimo tribes in Alaska, there are at least three successful multi-billion dollar investment corporations up there. Why do they have to go to Florida gambling interest or Las Vegas gambling interest or, or, or Atlantic City gambling interest to put a casino together? Uh, it, unless, are casinos losers? I mean, maybe, maybe I haven't, but I've been traveling around the country and you, in the middle of deserts. You see these thousands of cars and very successful casinos. So, I mean, it's almost a, 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 a God-given uh, determination. If I get a license for a casino, I've got gold. Now, why are we encouraging such an inordinate amount of the share of those profits to go to non-Indians when the intent of this act was to help some of these economically distressed American, Native American tribes? Well, the idea of some kind of development fund is certainly an interesting one. Congress did, uh, in IGRA, though, say that ga management companies could receive up to 40 percent of the proceeds of the net revenue. So they did cut on that issue in, in 1988. Well, well, and if the management uh, 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 company is owned by the tribes, that's okay. But I, I quite frankly don't sympathize with when you got gold why you're handling it away to the professional gambling interests of this country. In, in some cases, it's been to the advantage of the tribe to go to reputable companies like Harris or uh, other large companies and use their expertise. The tribe, frankly, doesn't have the experience to, to run it, and then eventually the idea is to have them take it over directly. And there are no Native American entrepreneurs that have the capacity to uh, run casinos profitably? Uh, there are very few. There are very few. Maybe, maybe the... Uh, reason why to have more of them uh, sent off to the schools that would equip them or to the business places that would equip them. It just seems to me that this is almost a license to uh, gain an inordinate amount of wealth. 30% uh, uh, of a gambling casino is quite a profit, quite a profit. I yield back to Mr. Waxman. Jim yields back the balance of his time, uh, Mr. Snowbarger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And rather than go through this in questioning, I, 
the concern I have, Mr. Anderson, is your statement, both in your testimony and in the final determination letter, that uh, indicates the application, if granted, would have caused detriment to the surrounding community. And we've got at least uh, three exhibits, maybe, or four exhibits, maybe more, uh, in uh, the information pr provided to us that indicate from staff, from a staff level, there is not enough evidence to say that there's detriment to the community under a Section 20 analysis. We have at least four different places where it says that. Uh, Mr. Hartman, if I could uh, could, ask could, I a few could I address that or do you want It was not a question. Okay. Thank you. Um, if, Mr. Hartman, if I could <coughs> ask you a question. Um, you know, I've, I've looked at your June 8th memo and, you know, what was your opinion, having reviewed the, the application, what was your opinion about whether or not this was going to be detrimental to the community? Well, throughout this process and all similar processes, I see strongly held opinion. And part of my job as a staffer is to try to penetrate through that opinion and look at objective factors that might lie behind it, such as a gridlock. And, you, and your ultimate conclusion of that process was what? Uh, what? I, I, couldn't, I couldn't find identifiable detriment uh, on which these objections were based. Okay, and is my understanding that you were, you may have been the final author of that memo, but you were not the only author of that memo. Would that be correct? That's correct. Well, I was final author of portions of that memo. Okay. And sole author of portions of that memo. All right. And also involved in that, though, were, I believe, Emily Ramirez and Ramirez and Ned Schlegel. And Ned Schlegel is the environmental uh, person on staff. Is that accurate? That's correct. Okay. Um, You also had an opportunity, I think, to review the area director's memo. It was about a 32-page memo uh, that uh, addressed a lot of these questions uh, at, that, at that level. Um, did, well, first of all, did you have an opportunity to review that? Yes, I did. And, and were you satisfied that uh, they had done everything they needed to substantiate uh, their recommendation in favor of the uh, track application? It, the, the analysis as we approached it was a little different than that we decided that we would do, in effect, a de novo review going back to the source documents that they had attached to the Can I call your effect. attention to page 67 of your deposition, where basically, here, let me just read it for you real quickly. And did you have the opportunity to review the 32-page recommendation from the area director? Yes. In your opinion, did the area office address the necessary areas for a recommendation of this sort? Yes. So I presume your answer would be the same today? It is. They, they addressed all the areas. Okay. Had you been advised prior to finishing this June 8th memo that the decision had already been made based on other grounds, based on Part 51, 151? I don't believe I had been advised that a decision is, had been made, but the discussions in the, uh, certainly the June time period, possibly the May time period, uh, indicated that the application was not being looked at positively from the fact that nobody came around and said, well, let's finalize this not detrimental and get on to the best interest of the tribe is an implicit uh, indication that we weren't headed towards approval. Do you think anybody paid attention to your memo about not detrimental in the discussions about how we justify uh, our final decision? Yes. Do you know that for a fact? I believe George Scabine testified here earlier that it was based upon my memo that he made the recommendation that the decision be based on Part 151 as opposed to uh, a Section 20 determination. And yet the, the final decision was based on Section 20 and not on Part 151, is that? It referred to Section 20. It wasn't based upon that. It was okay. the same ultimate decision, but uh, words were crafted to include uh, additional references. Did, um, in another document that we have, it indicates that uh, some of the discussion that was going on within the department was actually the work of one of the um, career staff members playing devil's advocate. Uh, it doesn't identify that devil's advocate. Are you that devil's advocate? That is me. And June 8th is a devil's advocate memo? Yes, I was... Uh trying to make as a, a, as
strong a case as I could in analyzing, not detrimental to the surrounding community, looking at and, all the and factors. And you were, you were joined as devil's uh, advocate, though, then, by Emily Ramirez and Ned Schlegel as well. No, this, they didn't this participate. This was not your professional opinion, but just sort of a devil's advocate kind of position, saying, here's what, what uh, we think if you really analyze this, uh, someone's able, someone else is going to be able to show. The early parts of that memo were written by those other two staffers in part, but the changes from a draft that existed in the February, March time framework uh, that were written by those was added to by me and the new additions were entirely mine. And uh, did uh, Ms. Ramirez or Mr. Schlegel uh, indicate to you their dissatisfaction with your changing of their portions? Uh, no, because I didn't change their portions. I believe uh, Mrs. Ramirez had retired, and the portions that Ned had worked on had remained unchanged. He reviewed. So really, you were only changing your portions of the memo anyway? That's correct. Um, did Mr. Anderson, prior to July 14th, ever consult you about that analysis and about your conclusion that there was no detriment to the community? I really don't recall. I, I have a vague memory of a meeting I was in that he was in where we discussed it, uh, but I, I just can't tell you for sure. Well, his conclusion in the, in the letter and in his testimony today is 180 degrees away from what your decision was, as well as that decision uh, joined in by uh, Emily Ramirez and, and Ned Schlegel. And you don't remember a conversation with Mr. Anderson saying that uh, despite what you had to say, he was going to rule a different way? No, on, if, on the Section 20 analysis here. I mean, if, if we met together, obviously I didn't convince him. Mr. Chairman, my time's expired. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Barrett? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to stay with that document if I could, Mr. Hartman. Is it, a, I, I frankly have never heard of a, a devil advocate, devil's advocate draft. Is that something that's done on occasion, or was this unusual to do a devil's advocate? Oh, I think it was probably just a vernacular that we tossed in at that time. Okay, and what was going to be the purpose of this? To see whether or not, or not the additional information that had been supplied up to that April 30th date uh, brought forth new information that indicated detriment. It seems throughout this entire process that the assumption that the department was making was that this matter was going to end up in litigation. Is that is that correct, Mr. Anderson? Maybe I I'll ask know. you. That. I say I don't. Well, actually, know. at that time, they had the option of filing a motion to to re to reconsider. If we had relied strictly on 151, though, they would have been barred from filing any litigation at all. But it does seem, as I look through the, the memos, that, th that that was a concern, if nothing else, that sure. that you wanted to bolster your case. Is that something that's unusual, or is that something that's having a good administrative record is something we do try to to do. Okay. Did you anticipate, and maybe this is a moot question, had the, other, had the decision gone the other way, do you anticipate there would have been litigation from the other tribes, for example? Yes, I, mean, I frankly couldn't have signed a, a, a report that went the other way. I don't think there are any facts justified that, uh, that, that there's no detriment and also that there was something in the best interest of the community that clearly given the parking lot lease was something that we couldn't sign off on. Okay. But yes, there would have been litigation, I think, that way. Okay. As a safe bet. The lawyers were going to win in this one. So, uh. <laughs> As they usually do. Okay. Um, I'm a lawyer, you're a lawyer, I understand it. Uh, Mr. Hartman, going back to you, I actually, it makes me feel a little better knowing that you were the devil's advocate in this, in this memo because there were a couple things in there that I looked at and I thought, holy moly, um, we're looking at a different document here. And I'd just like to go over a couple of those. One, perhaps a minor one. Yesterday we had Sandra Berg testify here. Um, and one of the statements in here is that she um, asserted, I think, that the opposition was receiving money from the, uh, the tribes in opposition to this, and uh, the county supervisor who was here yesterday said that wasn't true, and in, in fact, um, Ms. Berg indicated that she has in the past, and, and may even currently, and I hope I'm not misstating this, um, that, that she has done work with the, the track. Were you aware of that when you put that in here? Uh, not that specific fact, no. Okay. One of the other things that, that surprised me as I looked through it was your reference to the April 1993 constitutional amendment. Um, as a resident of the state of Wisconsin, um, I didn't view that as a, as a technical constitutional change. Um, that was a pretty big deal. In, in fact, I don't know if you were here yesterday, um, but when we saw the video yesterday, Governor Thompson in the video 
um, boasted that he and Attorney General Doyle were the ones responsible for having that referendum, that constitutional amendment and subsequent referendum placed on the, on, on the, uh, on the ballot. What was your basis for thinking it was just a, a technical amendment? I, I don't remember exact specifics, but uh, we, in the record, there's a description of the process that was being conducted at the time, and apparently the, there was some doubt as to whether the Wisconsin State Lottery actually complied with the uh, Constitution of Wisconsin back in the, I think, the late 80s. Uh, so the Constitution was changed. I think there was a constitution. There was a constitutional prohibition against gambling, and there had been some uh, controversial rulings by attorneys general that uh, tried to slip the state lottery in there. But it was pretty unclear, so that the state of Wisconsin went back out and changed its constitution. And I've forgotten even who it was I talked to about the '93 ballot, but the. Uh, most of the issues on a 93 ballot were advisory, mm -hmm. and it's my recollection that the one on the constitutional issue was the one to bring the Constitution into con conformance with the actual public policy of allowing gambling by the state in the form of a state lottery. Okay, just in, in, in case... But I'm not an attorney. In case you, you meet this issue again, and for some reason I think it's possible that you do, um, I, I, I should point out that what happened in the 1980s was that there were two constitutional amendments, one to permit um, paramutual betting, the other to permit the lottery. Subsequent to those decisions was the time when you had decisions made essentially by, by the, district, the federal district court and, and perhaps the state attorney general played a role too that, that opened the door to the Indian casino gambling. And I don't think that that's disputed. Um, and my perception of this was this was an attempt by the legislature and the public to assert that what they meant in the 1980s was not uh, all types of gambling, but to limit it to lottery and casino. And I realize that under the interpretations of, of uh, IGRA and other federal court rulings that the state may not have the authority to do so, but that was the intention, that lottery, as you define it, was a, was a lottery, as I think we use a, a common description of it, and not lottery in terms of a, a broad definition of gambling. So just for your benefit. I also just want to state for the record, as we all know, there are several different uh, proceedings go on. There are this proceeding, there is a, the civil litigation in the Western District of the State of Wisconsin, and there is the pending um, decision by the Attorney General. I, earlier I made reference to that, and I, I want to clarify for the record that I recognize that that decision has not been made at this point. Thank you. Mr. Cummins. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, to uh, the witnesses, I want to thank you for being here. So very impressed with your testimony. I want to go to you, Mr. Anderson, uh, just to clarify some things. Uh, a little bit earlier in the testimony, uh, the chairman, I think, was asking you about um, your statements with regard to environmental impact. And uh, it may have been, I can't remember whether it's council or, or the chairman, but uh, they said that uh, when this, uh, when the racetrack was approved, uh, apparently uh, it was, they had anticipated uh, a certain amount of cars uh, coming into the area. And then when you uh, looked at it, uh, or your staff looked at it, uh, one of the, your concerns were uh, was the number of cars that would be coming in. Now, first of all, let's clarify, when the dog track was established, you all had nothing to do with that, is that right? That's right, that was a state assessment. That's a state assessment, so you have nothing to do with that. And when, I mean, would, would you go back, is, would it be your normal course in looking at the environmental impact to go back and see I look at records from when they approved the dog track to determine how many cars they anticipated and then make any kind of comparisons or contrasts. Would that be your normal, or, or is this such a unique kind of case that you don't have a precedent? Well, typically you'd use that as, as baseline data and then try to update the information that came forward. Do you know whether that was done in this case? I believe most of the information relied upon was from 88 as to the effects, and that was one of the problems here. 
Uh, what, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, uh, particularly with regard to the St. Croix Scenic Riverway, yes. um, the effects the dog, would, dog track would have that there was uh, actually dog waste that was going to go into the river, uh, the status of what facilities were able to uh, treat wastewater at that time was different than it occurred uh, in 1995. So the environmental analysts had to look at a different situation in 95 versus um, uh, 88, I think, when the first assessment was, was done. So did you, would you go back and talk about the number of cars that you were concerned about? The chairman said that there would be still a, um, the implication was that there would be less cars now, I mean, with, with regard to the casino as opposed to the dog track. And I'm just wondering what was your feelings on that? I know you had talked a little bit earlier about the fact that the dog track was not doing well, so therefore the traffic was not uh, as high as maybe it was anticipated from the beginning. But can you elaborate on that? Because it did not come through very clearly. I think the, the car traffic would be higher uh, for the casino than the current dog track. Whether the 88 assessment analyzed um, 8,000 cars, I don't know. I haven't studied the record that but far. But certainly it could be expected given the, the traffic of this casino would be greater than what the dog, dog track had currently enjoyed. So you, and you had no doubt about that. What was, what was that based upon? Well, there were facts and impacts on the infrastructure in the record uh, at the time. Now, uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, I was briefed on the record and did not read the 14 volumes. This is basically information that was in uh, with the career people. Now, it's interesting that so often uh, here on the Hill, we hear the other side talking about uh, big government interfering and the fact that the uh, decision should be, uh, we should give local government more say. And, you know, as I listen to your testimony, it sounds like uh, that's basically what you did. You gave a lot of credence to uh, what the local people were saying. Was there, uh, is that, is there anything unusual about that? No, that is actually what Section 20 of IGRA requires, that you give credence. I think the, the big debate was how much, and that's the disagreement that some of us had within the office, and in fact that Tom and I had about can um, a bare assertion of opposition be enough? And I, and I didn't agree with that either. I agreed with some of the solicitor's office, but that's not what our letter said. It did have evidence uh, based on community objections, based on traffic, based on the jurisdictional conflicts with their land use plans. So, but certainly you try to invest in the local governments when they express their opinion. Now, let me ask you, do you, do you know uh, uh, a Troy W. Woodward, uh, who is an attorney advisor in the office of the solicitor? Yes, I do. And do you know a Paula Hart, uh, who is a paralegal specialist? Yes. All right. Um, you testified a little bit earlier about the staff. I think when the chairman asked you uh, some questions and you said that you felt very comfortable with the staff that prepared all the documents for you with regard to their honesty and integrity, uh, do you feel that way about Paula Hart and uh, Troy uh, M. Woodward? Yes, I do. All right, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, ask that uh, unanimous consent that we submit, uh, make a part of the record, the affidavits of Paula Hart and Troy M. Woodward, wherein they uh, uh, state that uh, I, am a, I am unaware of any improper interference by any political appointee in the decision-making process with respect to the application, referring to all of the things that we've been talking about today, Mr. Chairman. No objection. Thank you very much. Let me... Uh End up by uh, thanking you for being here. Yes, we have someone else that uh, wants to speak. <laughs> oh, Henry, of course. The gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the long day it's been for all of us, your testimony. But let me recap what we've learned the last two days. Yesterday, uh, we had the accusations that uh, this decision was based on political pressure that there were campaign contributions, lobbyists, and that the victims were a poor tribe. Yet we also found out that one of the so-called victims was Mr. Havanick, uh, who stood to gain financially a lot because he was the one behind the whole dog track and then the casino uh, and very much wanted this approval He's hired as many lobbyists and lawyers as anyone else. As a matter of fact, Mr. Havanek has been here all day with three of his lawyers. It's been a long day. 
and he was here yesterday as well. He's now in, uh, in litigation, and he's trying to overturn this decision. Um, but the members all agree, Democrats and Republicans, that the decision to deny the application for a casino was the right one. The local community didn't want it. The Republican governor didn't want it. The Republican congressman didn't want it. There is nobody in the delegation in the House that wanted it. Uh, the people in Minnesota were screaming about it. And uh, it didn't make sense to have another source of gambling, another casino, so far away from the, tri so far away from the tribes uh, and uh, so close to population centers and other, uh, other gambling uh, sites. So that so, so that then the issue was not whether the decision was right, because everybody seemed to think the decision was right. The question then shifted to, is, is there, was there proper, improper political pressure? Today we have had four people at the Department of Interior testify under oath that they made the decision on the merits without political interference, that nobody w was uh, telling them to reach th this uh, decision. The affidavits in support of uh, Mr. Sabine that he did not mention political pressure in his meetings with Havenick have already been into, entered into the record. So we have those who didn't have a financial interest, were public servants, and were at that meeting ass asserting that Mr. Sabine did not say there were political pressures. The only ones who are asserting that there were political pressures are those who have a financial interest in getting this casino approved. Uh, I, I think that is an accurate summary of where we are to date. Uh, there was suggestion by Mr. Havenick for the first time about Mr. McAuliffe, and uh, we have uh, no one to verify it. It came out of uh, left field. It never had been mentioned before. And you would think, Mr. Anderson, you were a classmate of his. Mr. McAuliffe would have contacted you if he really wanted to do something uh, to affect the decision on this, uh, on this uh, casino proposal. He did, evidently, if he said anything at all, what a lot of lobbyists do, what a lot of fundraisers do. They try to puff up their role and take credit for something, think he was scoring points with Mr. Havnick as a, as a contributor, and then he found out that he stepped in it and he was mistaken. And in fact, he was taking credit for something that Mr. Havenick was very unhappy about. So uh, lo and behold, uh, he, um, his, as Mr. Havenick described, his face dropped if this all took place. We're hoping to hear from Mr. McAuliffe directly, and I think he may either ought to be allowed to testify or at least submit an affidavit. So I use my five minutes to, to make clear to people what has happened in these last two days. Uh, a decision on the merits that everyone agrees was right, uh, reached, I, I, Chairman laughs, I, I assume he's not arguing the decision should have been made contrary, that they should have enforced a casino on the local population that didn't want it. So a, casino, a decision on the merits that no one's argued it was a wrong decision, and uh, those who made it, those people who actually made it, have told us they made it on the merits without political interference. Let me ask you again, is there anything different that you know about than what I've just said, Mr. Anderson? No, there, absolutely not. And I, I've been waiting here patiently as a decision maker for the mystery witness or the, the smoking memo or the affidavit, and, and I've seen certainly none over the course of uh, these last two days. I, I did want to say in, in closing, I talked to my mother last night about these hearings, and she saw your chart about the $50 billion. She's asked, when are we going to get to that issue? That seems to be That's the important issue. That's a very good issue. question. When are we going to talk about real corruption? the way the tobacco industry got the uh, Republican leadership to put in a $50 billion, sneak in a $50 billion tax break for them after they've given so much money. Any of the other, Mr. Harper? I'm aware of no influence. Nobody ever asked me to modify what I think we can agree are fairly strong comments and opinions. Um, I, I saw and know of no undue influence anywhere in the process. And Mr. Jager, you don't know one way or the other, but if you <laughs> Which is usually the best place to be. <laughs> no, sir, I'm not aware of any undue political pressure. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to back the balance of my time. You have no more time. Mr. Uh, Waxman, uh, 
That was a great summary to the jury. Unfortunately, the jury has not yet reached a decision, and I'm sure that they will at some point in the future. Let me just say my conclusions don't jive with yours, and I think that uh, we'll, we'll see how this all turns out. If you look at uh, the uh, memo one year after the decision was made by Mr. Scabine, and you look at the tremendous amount of campaign contributions and the benefits that were derived by people who were high up in the Interior Department when they went to work uh, lobbying for the tribes that won, uh, questions still remain. I will thank our witnesses for being here with us today. Uh, we stand in recess till 10 a.m. Wednesday next. I think they might have been left over from George. Thank you, Robin. Good Hello. to see you. Thank you. We've got to go talk to the lawyers. Thank you, Tom. Yep. The second session of the 105th Congress convenes next Tuesday.